Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Smoke, starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. got in the boy, Mr. Dillon. When I come for you, he was offering to shoot his initials into the mirror behind the bar. Is he drunk, Chester? Yes, sir. But mostly it seems like he just plain wants to howl. Well, he can howl all he likes as long as he keeps his gun quiet. Oh, there he goes. Yeah. I hope that's the mirror and not some man he's shooting at. Yeah, so do I. Old Doff would hate to lose that boy. All right, watch it now. Look. He's laying on the floor, Mr. Dillon. He's been killed. Look what he done to my mirror, Marshal. You shoot him, Sam? No, I hit him with a bung starter. He ain't dead. But I'm about to have to shoot his friend here. Go ahead and try it. Maybe I will. Easy, Sam. All right, what's your name, mister? My name's Blades. I work for Tom. You mean you work for his father, don't you? Well, sure, the old man owns the ranch, but... Me and Tom, we work together. Oh, my. Pick up his gun before he comes to, Chester. Yes, sir. All right, Blades. Tom's going to sleep it off in jail. You want to be locked up with him, or you're going to go home quietly? I ain't done nothing. There's that girl over there got him started. No, what girl? That one sitting at the table in the red dress. What? Kitty? Yeah, that's her name. Wait till old Dolph hears you through his son in jail. I'll tell him myself. Now, you get out of here. I'm going. He's at the Dodge house right now, Marshal. I'd like to hear you tell him. Can you get Tom over to the jail, Chester? Yes, sir, I sure can. All right, lock him up. I'll be back later. Oh. Yes, sir. All right, come on now, Tom. Oh, you ain't hurt me. You gonna let Chester put him to bed, Matt? Yeah. <clears throat> Sam knocked all the fight out of him, Kitty. I know. I saw it. Blade said that, uh... You made him mad. That's one way of putting it. Oh, what do you mean? You made me mad. I don't like fresh kids, Matt. Tom Vickers must be 20. Well, he's been acting like a kid. You know, Matt, he's changed lately. He used to be a gentleman like his father. I don't know what's come over him, but if he were mine, I wouldn't allow him off the ranch. Well, maybe you've just forgotten what it's like to be young, Kitty. I'm young enough to pour this glass of beer over your head. <laughs> you know what I mean. Sure. Well, that fellow Blades is older, though. Maybe he's responsible for Tom's jump in the fence. I don't like him at all. I'm sure he isn't a good influence on Tom. Yeah, Tom's too easily led. Yeah, he isn't the man his father is. He sure isn't. Anyways, he better leave me alone. Yeah, I'll tell him to. Well, I've got to go see Dolph now. He isn't going to like you throwing his son in jail. Yeah, maybe not. But a stranger was shot and killed on his range yesterday. And I don't like that. Oh, I hadn't heard. Well, they haven't been talking much about it. Well, looks like you and Dolph are in for a pleasant little talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, so long, Kitty. Goodbye, Matt. <laughs> Marshal, come in. How are you, Dolph? Fine, Marshal. 
I've been sitting here smoking a cigar before I went to bed. Have one? Uh, no, 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 thanks. Dolph, uh, I got some bad news for you. Tell me. Tom tried to shoot up the Texas Trail a while ago. Sam laid him out, and all right now he's in jail. Anybody hurt? Oh, the boy's got a bump on his head, that's all. I don't like the idea of Vickers being in jail. I'm sorry, Dolph. How do I get him out? Well, I'll turn him loose in the morning. No Vickers was ever in jail before, Marshal. Well, it's not that important to me, Dolph. If you want him out now, you can come and get him. No. No, he's done wrong. He's got to pay for it. I thank you for coming to tell me, Marshal. Sure, Dolph, sure. But uh, there's something else I want to talk to you about. What's that? Well, I heard that a man was shot and killed on your range yesterday. It's true. Who did it? He was rustling cattle, Marshal. Oh. Well, were you there? No, but I've been losing a lot of stock lately. That fella got caught by my men, put up a fight. So there's one less thief around. You know who this man was? Never saw him before. But there's nothing wrong with shooting thieves, is there? Well, not if I try to shoot you first. I'm going to hire me some gunmen, Marshal. I'll show with them. No, that no, can't... that'll just cause trouble, Dolph. Gunmen will shoot anybody that happens along and then claim that they put up a fight. You know what they're like. Well, then everybody better stay away. Everybody won't know about it, Dolph. You don't want innocent men killed, do you? Well, of course I don't. But I don't want my cattle stole either. Dolph, uh... You mind if I ride back out to your place with you tomorrow and have a look around? I got business in Dodge tomorrow, but I'm going out the day after. Be glad to have you. Oh, good. Well, I'll meet you here, then. Okay, Marshal. men branding cattle up ahead, Dolph. That'll be Tom and Blades. They got a camp near here. I put Tom in charge of this whole section. They left Dodge yesterday morning early, Dolph. I know. I saw them leave. Oh, you did? They didn't see me. I was sitting across the street. Oh. Yeah, that's Tom, all right. Coming to meet us. He shouldn't stop work just because we ride by. We'll wait here. Who now? Who? 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 Hello. Howdy, Tom. Tom. What calves are those, Tom? Oh, it's a bunch of men gathered day before yesterday, sir. Where are the other men? How come just you and Blades are working them? Oh, we got all but about uh, 20 of them branded yesterday. I figured me and Blades could finish them alone. Two men ain't enough with a bunch like that. You'd have saved time if you'd kept more men to help. Well, let's ride over there. I want to look at them. Come on. Maybe I better stay and help you. Oh, no, sir. We're doing fine. We'll be all through by evening. And your herd's getting scattered now. We'll handle them. Sure, don't you worry none, Mr. Vickers. I ain't worried none, Blades. Tom, next time you keep at least three more men with you when you got a bunch this size. No, okay, sir, I'll do it. In case you're wondering about the marshal here in Chester... They're going to look things over for a day or so. Marshal thinks maybe he can cut the trail of them cattle thieves. I sure hope so. We ain't had much luck, except for that one. Now go on back to work. I'll ride out here next week sometime. All right. Uh, get that iron ready for another one, Blake. It's red hot now. Come on, Marshal. I'm late enough. <laughs> Sure is a nice evening, Mr. Dillon, ain't it? 
Don't you think so? What? Oh, I was just wondering what kind of an evening it is in Dodge, Chester. Oh, if there was any real trouble, somebody would have rode out and told you. Yeah, I suppose so. That's been two days now. Oh, we better get back tomorrow. That'll suit me fine. I swear we've rode a thousand miles over this ranch, and all for nothing, as far as I can tell. Yeah, maybe. Why don't you come set in the porch, you two? Oh, we're just walking our supper off a little bit, Dolph. Yeah, I've been in the saddle so much the last few days, I need to stand. Mm. Suit yourselves. Uh, Dolph, from what the men tell me, you've lost only about a hundred head of calves altogether. I had the impression that it was a lot more than that. I won't put up with one calf being stolen from me, Marshal. I'm an honest man, and I work hard. And if a neighbor or a stranger needs help, I'll give it to him gladly. But I'll kill the man that steals. Well, I wish you'd do one thing for me, Dolph. What's that? The next time you lose any stock, send word to me before you turn this outfit into one arm camp. Well, Marshal... If it was anybody else, I'd tell him to mind his own business. But, uh, I'll do it. Thank you, Doc. Oh, by the way, uh, we're going to be riding back to Dodge tomorrow. All right. But I won't give you more in a couple of days next time. <laughs> well, that's better than nothing, Doc. <laughs> get to Dodge if we stop and tally ever heard of cows we come across. Uh, this is a bunch I wanted to see, Chester. We'll travel as a crow flies from here in. Come on. Why was you so interested in that herd? We must have rode through it ten times. I was sort of interested in proving something to myself, Chester. Yes, sir. Now look up ahead there. Oh, a couple of dogs, men, I reckon. Yeah, probably. Or say, it's Tom and that fellow Blades. Yeah. Where's my old man, Marshal? We left him at the ranch, Tom. We're going back to Dodge. Empty-handed, huh? Not quite. What do you mean, not quite? Oh, well, Blades, I'll tell you. I just looked over that bunch of stock back there. Sure. We gathered them yesterday. Now we're going to do a little branding. You better. We'd better? You ain't bossing us, Marshal. Just get them branded, Tom. All of them. Of course we'll get them branded. Say that you do. Come on, Chester. Yes, sir. I don't understand what you was driving at, Mr. Dillon. That's the same herd those two were working the day we rode by here with Dolph, Chester. Well, see, now, I didn't notice that. And you probably didn't notice about 20 calves in there that are still unbranded. What do you mean? Tom Vickers and his friend Blades are thieves, Chester. And probably murderers to boot. <laughs> Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, today, good engineers are needed in hundreds of varied fields. You can build a fine career as a trained engineer and at the same time help maintain America's scientific and engineering superiority. For information, write Box 40, Midtown Station, New York, 18, New York. That's Box 40, Midtown Station, New York, 18, New York. Now the second act of Gunsmoke.
Oh, Chester, there you are, my boy. Where's Matt? Oh, he'll be back in a minute, Doc. Come down. No, don't mind me. Say, he told me about Dolph Vickers' son last night. No, the only thing I can't figure, Doc, is why he don't tell Dolph. Oh, he's got his reasons, I expect. But, uh, I didn't come here to gossip. Did either of you had supper yet? Uh, I had early tonight. But Mr. Dillon probably go with you. Good yeah. oh, evening, Doc. Ah, you look hungry. You look worried. The golf Vickers boy? Yeah. Uh, sooner or later, I'm going to have to arrest him, Doc. I've been trying to figure some way to do it without breaking the old man's heart. Oh, I don't suppose there is any other way, Matt. Huh? Well, if there is, I haven't thought of it. Uh, somebody out back, Mr. Dillon. No, stay where you are, Chester. I'll see who it is. I'll be right with you, Doc. Sure. Sure, Matt. You're going to starve to death waiting for somebody to eat with around here, Doc. Oh, why, fasting's good for Manchester. <laughs> and a little of it wouldn't hurt you. Oh. Seems to me I spent my entire youth fasting, Doc. I won't never make up for it. Oh, oh, oh. What's that? I don't know, but I better go see. Mr. Dillon? Get down, sir. Somebody shooting at you? Quiet. It's okay, Chester. They've gone. Somebody was shooting at you. Yeah. After they knocked on the door, they ran up behind that far shed there. Plenty poor shooting. Well, ain't we going after them? Now, they had horses hidden there. I heard them right off. Well, I'll go buy a couple from the rail. No. Huh? No, let them go, Chester. Hey, but Mr. Dillon, they tried to ambush you. I know. But I'd prefer not to shoot him. Especially Tom Vickers. Tom? We'll ride out to the ranch tomorrow, Chester. Maybe we can bring him in without a fight. Anyway, it's worth a try. For Dolph's sake. Somebody. There. Oh. Hello, Marshal. Hello, Doc. Chester. Hello, Doc. Morning. Morning. Thank you. Where are you going, Tom? Ain't you going to say hello? I got work to do. What kind of manners is that? There's no use running away, Tom. You wouldn't get far. What? Now, come on back and sit down, huh? You do a lot of ordering around, don't you, Marshal? Sometimes I do. What's the matter between you, anyway? Be better if you told him, Tom. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. Did you brand those calves the other day? What calves? Wait a minute, Tom. Did you, Tom? Of course we did. You willing to ride out there with us and prove it? I ain't riding nowhere. I've had enough of this. You tell me what you're talking about. Tom? Maybe you better tell me, Marshal. Well, Dolph, you remember the herd Tom and Blades were working the day we rode out here with you? Of course I do. Well, I saw that same herd on the way back to Dodge. Uh, still about 20 unbranded calves in it. Say it out, Marshal. I ran into Tom and Blades just beyond, and I told them to be sure and brand those calves. Go on. So they knew I was on to them. On to what? Dolph, I'm willing to bet everything I got that if we find that herd, those calves are either still unbranded or missing. What makes you so sure? Tom refuses to ride out there with us. What you're saying is mighty serious, Marshal. I hope you won't regret it. Come on, Tom. We'll go see them calves. No. We're going out there, I said. I ain't going. 
You'll do what I tell you. But not this time. We're going if I have to knock you down and tie you onto your horse. And you know I'll do it. Yeah, you would. Them calves ain't there. Then where are they? Twenty calves ain't hard to track, Tom. Blades got them. Got them where? Up a little spring. You don't have to say it. I know a little spring ain't on this ranch. Go on. And there are three other men up there. You don't know them. They're holding over a hundred head by now. Come on. You gonna charge your own son for stealing from you? Are you? Tom, you and Blades killed that stranger to help you cover up all this, didn't you? It's too bad we didn't kill you, Marshal. What's that? They tried to ambush me in Dodge last night, Doc. My own son. A murderer. And a thief. Tom, come into the other room with me. You'll excuse us, gentlemen. He's going to help him get away, Mr. Dillon. Not if I know Dolph, he isn't. I expect he just wants to talk to him alone before we take him to jail. Mm. Yes, sir. You know, I feel a whole lot sorrier for Dolph than I do for the boy. I guess you should. Mr. Dillon. Uh, it's all right, Marshal. Where's Tom? I killed him. Here's my gun, Marshal. I'm sorry you did it, Doc. I had to. Marshal, I'd like to bury him now. Uh, we'll help you. Nope. I'll bury my own dead. Then I'll ride into jail with you. All right. You'll get my calves back? I'll pick up a posse when we get to Dodge. The boy was my responsibility, Marshal. You understand that. What you did was wrong, Duff. You can wait here in the cool of the house. I'll be back. We'll wait. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, Paul Dubov, Charles A. Baston, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow, don't miss The High Mountain, a hard-hitting documentary report on the progress and problems of 15 million Negro Americans. Tomorrow in the daytime on most of these same stations. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows in a few minutes over most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. Saturday night, Herb Schreiner shells out on Two for the Money over the CBS radio network. The great chief of the Sioux Indians is Sitting Bull. He is a rather difficult chap to meet.
especially when he's planning for war. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual accounts. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. <laughs> The distance from South Sunday to Rosebud in Montana Territory is about 30 miles. Due to a heavy rainstorm and my lack of funds, it had taken me a week to reach Rosebud. Luckily, when I arrived, my remittance from England, $250, had already been forwarded and I was once again solvent. After posting off my weekly report to the London Times, I went to the most likely place in Rosebud to get local color and information. Except for the bartender polishing his glasses and a cat on the bar... The place was quite empty. I ordered a drink. Two bits. Thank you. It's all right. Oh, hush up, cat. Where are you from, mister? London. London, England? That's right. Well, if that don't beat all, my great-grandpa come from there. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jackson Beeson's the name. J.B. Kendall. Well, howdy. How do you do, sir? Uh, tell me, Mr. Beeson... What's the situation with the Indians these days? Well, now you come to the right place for that bit of news. Oh, get away, cat. Yes, sir, we're going to have trouble. You can thank your stars that we got General Gibbon here keeping an eye out. I hear tell Custer's on his way, too. Oh, bad as that, huh? Worse. Well, just yesterday, correspondence fellow like you, he come in, works on the Montana Telegraph News. Uh, Jackson, he says, them Sioux is working up to a boil. Oh, it's going to be wicked. Mighty wicked. Do you think it'll mean war? I don't have to think. I know. I get... You cat. Get out of here. Go on. Get out. Get out. Get out. <laughs> Darn cat's a regular drunkard. Uh, uh, this correspondent chap, is he still here? Charlie Meeker? Oh, sure. He's around somewhere. I'd like to meet him. Right nice fella. Uh, now, let's see. You might try up to Dolly's place. Cross the street there. Second house on the right. Can't miss it. Just ask for Charlie. He rooms at Dolly's. Thanks very much. Mm hmm And uh, look, if he ain't there, I'll tell him you're looking for him when he comes back. Uh, you stop by tonight. Right. Well, hello, early bird. Uh, good afternoon, uh, madam. <laughs> uh, this this is, is Dolly's place? Why, sure it is. You come on in. Uh, it's nice and warm inside, honey. Uh, yeah, I I'm looking for a gentleman named Charles, Charles Mika. Charlie? What do you want with him? Oh, well, I was told I could find him here. The bartender... Oh, Jack oh. Beeson sent you. Yes. Well, yes. all right. Well, step inside. I'm freezing my... Mary! Go wake up, Charlie. There's a fella here to see him. I guess you better wait in the parlor. Say, now, I hope you'll forgive the looks of this room. Some of the boys got a little rowdy last night. <laughs> uh, we haven't cleaned it up yet. Not at all. Charming. You're new in Rosebud, ain't you? Yes. Well, that's nice. That's real nice. I can see you're a gentleman. It's always nice to meet a gentleman. Uh, sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Mr... Uh, Kendall. Well, Mr. Kendall. You're a friend of Charlie's, huh? No. No, we've never met. Well, he's a nice boy. He's real nice. He sure never forgets me. Anytime he's in these parts, he brings old Dolly a present. Uh, can I get you a drink? No, thanks just the same. Hey, uh, you ain't a dominie, are you? Uh, dom? A preacher? Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I sure do admire to hear you talk. I wish you'd say something else. Somebody um, looking for me, darling? Oh, this here is Mr. Kendall, Charlie boy. All right. How do you do, sir? 
Well, you've got business to talk, so make yourselves at home. It's sure been a pleasure, Mr. Kendall. Maybe you'll call again. Thank you very much. You know, I have to excuse me, Kendall. I just woke up. Big night. Oh. And a big head. What can I do for you? I understand you write for a newspaper, Mr. Meeker. Charlie. Yeah, Virginia City, Montana Telegraph now. I know. I do some correspondence myself for the London Times. Hey, I'm proud to meet you. May I return the compliment? Uh, look here. Is it true what I've been hearing, these rumors about a Sioux uprising? Yeah, more than rumors. It's coming. Well, this chief, Sitting Bull, have you ever seen him? Once. A few years back. Big council between one of our government commissions and the Indian. Oh, I'd like to meet him. See him, you know? No, not a chance. Not anymore. A while ago, maybe, but those Indians don't trust the white man now. I tell you, they're getting ready for war. Is there any way to make contact with him? Probably. There are plenty of Indian scouts, interpreters hereabouts who could, but for a white man, it'd be worth his scalp. How would one go about it? Are you serious? Completely. Do you know where I could find him? Uh, I got a pretty good idea. You want a drink? No, thank you. There's talk of a whole lot of Indians moving off the reservations, going up Tongue River country. Might be headed for Sitting Bull's camp. How far would that be? Thirty miles, maybe. <laughs> Now, listen, mister. When the Sioux go on the warpath, the best place for you and me is someplace else. Well, do you think you could find me one of those Indian scouts? Someone to guide me to Sitting Bull's camp? You mean it, don't you? Absolutely. What a story. Interview with Chief Sitting Bull? Oh, it's crazy. They'd kill us, sure. No, Kendall, the best thing for you is to talk to some of the old-timers. They'll tell you about him, and then you can send your report in on that. It's a whole lot safer. That evening in Beeson's saloon, Charlie Meeker found a half-breed interpreter, Johnny Duchel. He was a big man, dark, with handsome features, and when he smiled, which he did constantly, there was something at odds in his eyes, veiled, a coldness. He was playing a game of solitaire, and as he dealt his cards, I noticed that inside his sleeve was a wrist holster, strapped to it a derringer. You want to talk with Sitting Bull? That's right, Johnny. Him too? Me too. Suppose he don't want any talk with you. Suppose he want to take your scalp. <laughs> that would be rather awkward. Johnny, how well do you know the chief? How well does any man know another? Charlie says you've done scouting work for General Crook. Well, doesn't that make you Sitting Bull's enemy? Yesterday I scout for the soldier. Tomorrow maybe I fight with the Indian. Who knows? Yes. Well, the point would seem to be whose side are you on if you do guide us? If I do this thing, you put your trust in me. I see. Well, what do you say, Johnny? Can you take us to him? Uh, black ace on the red two. Yeah. You got fifty dollars, silver? Kind of high, isn't it? Sitting bull, one big chief. You want me to take you to Red Cloud, crazy horse? Maybe cost less. What do you think, Ken? I'm not sure. Maybe you find somebody, do it for less. He'd take you to India and cut out your heart, huh? Now Johnny's all right. Twenty-five apiece would be worth it. All right. When, Johnny? Tomorrow. Fine. Take no guns. Hey, wait the a Indians minute. Indians see you with guns, they say you're coming for no good. Without guns, in peace. No guns. It's sort of risky, isn't it, Johnny? Not with me, along with you. What time? We meet outside the state station. Six o'clock. See you then. Well, you still want to go? I'm not sure about that, fellow. That's a chance you take these days. We can back out. No. But to be on the safe side, Charlie, I think two guns and shoulder holsters would make me feel a bit better. Sure. You got them? Never use a gun myself. Oh. oh, yes, yes, I've got them. Look here, Charlie. Now, this is my idea. No need for you to come along, you know. What's the matter? You want the story for yourself? Oh, no, no, not that at all. I'm sorry. I only thought... Forget that... it. We'll go together. Hey, how about coming over to Dolly's with me for nightcap? Uh, no, thanks. Not tonight. Sleep for me. Oh. Well, see you in the morning. We can pick up horses at the livery stable. So long. 
I watched him walk away, a rather short, thin man, shoulders a little rounded. And then he was lost in the shadows, and I had that odd sensation of having lived this moment before. It had been in Peshawar, in northern India. I remembered a good friend who had walked away from me in the night. The next morning, his head was thrown through the barracks window. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Laugh and the world laughs with you. Cry and say, where'd everybody go? Chances are they've taken off in the direction of CBS Radio's Peter and Mary show. Peter Lind Hayes and Mary Healy have a magic way of banishing the blues. Their amusing notions about practically everything, the easy way they sing their songs, and the exciting personalities who visit them all make CBS Radio's Peter and Mary show a cure for the blues. Listen for them on most of these same stations tomorrow. And now we return you to Anthony Ellis' production of Frontier Gentlemen. The morning was gray, a bit windy. We left Rosebud at six o'clock and rode steadily toward the southeast. I could see no sign of a gun on our guy, Johnny Duchelle, but his bulky jacket could have hidden an arsenal. For well, perhaps over an hour, we didn't speak. Charlie, red-eyed from want of sleep and too much whiskey, nodded in his saddle. The half-breed traveled a little ahead of us, cautious, watchful. Hey, Kendall. Yes? Never drink Dolly's rot gut. <laughs> I will. I can take the pepper, even the tobacco juice she puts in it. But that whiskey... You know, we had a cure for your complaint in India. Oh? Curry powder, ginger, a snake's head, preferably a cobra, a big spoon of sugar, stew the whole thing in a pot of strong tea, and then drink it down. <laughs> exactly. It's a miraculous cure. You'll probably end up chucking the whole mess out the window, but you forgot your headache. What were you doing in India? Army, mostly. Officer? At one time, Captain... See much fighting? Enough. Oh, you with? Uh, the cavalry regiment. You don't like to talk about it much, do you? <laughs> no, not much. Hey, better hold up. Johnny's seen something. In timber. Cayenne, I think. You stay. I talk to them. How many? Can you see? Five or six. Might be others in the woods. You know something funny? I'm scared. I think about your headache. No, thanks. Too close to my hair. You ever see a scalp man? No. But I shouldn't worry. The tribesmen do much nastier things to get their trophies in India. Jenny must know them. Look. <laughs> All very friendly. Hello. They must have given their blessings. You think so? Either that or Johnny has made an arrangement with them to cut our throats. He looks happy enough. That tall wolf and his brave. They will ride to the council. Tell of our coming. Glad to hear it. We go on now. Johnny smiled, turned away, and we rode on. I had the distinct feeling that he knew exactly what he was doing, and we didn't. Another hour passed. If there were more Indians about, we didn't see them. The terrain was becoming more rugged, and when we reached a narrow stream, Johnny called a halt. We rest the horses. All right. I think I'll get myself a drink. Water, that is. Funny we haven't seen any more Indians, Johnny. They all had great counsel. Mm. You seem pretty sure we won't be attacked. I told Tall Wolf you come in peace. And possibly there are others beside Tall Wolf who won't feel as he does. Possibly. We see at the council. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not worried, though. I am not worried. You're smiling. Good for a man to smile. <laughs> Depends on his reason. I smile because... You paid me 50 silver dollars to bring you here. Ah. Uh, tell me, Johnny, what will it cost to take us back? 
The cost to you will not matter. I think you will not be going back. He made a slight movement with his hand, and a derringer appeared in it. For a moment, I had forgotten his wrist holster. He was standing no more than four feet from me, and I didn't move. If you've ever seen what a 41 derringer can do to a man, you'd understand. Then he brought out a revolver from his jacket and backed away a few steps. That was when I saw Charlie at the stream. He had a rock in his hand, his arm cocked back. At the moment he threw it, the half-breed turned and saw him. Uh, Where are you hit, Charlie? Chest. Boy, that feels worse than Dolly's rock got. He's not dead? No, I'm not dead, you stinking breed. You, Kendall, take off your jacket. Ah. Uh. Now, untie those shoulder holsters. Let them fall to the ground. Uh. Move back. Uh. Stop. Uh. Uh. You both got more silver. Give uh. it to me. I'll spit in your eye first. I told Tall Wolf, I take you to Sitting Bull as my prisoner, alive. He will think well of me, give uh, me place of trust. Uh, Your own mother wouldn't trust you, Johnny. Uh, With much silver, two horses, even a stinking breed will be important man. Uh, give it to me. You'll find a bag in my jacket. Uh, Good. Now, you both, you walk. I ride behind you. Can you get up, Charlie? Sure. Yeah, I'll help you. Uh, ah! Oh, it's my fault. I should have done something sooner. I wasn't sure about him. Uh, Walk! Uh, Cross the stream. Follow the trail. Come on. Lean on me. Ah! Uh, I can't go on anymore. <laughs> he is dead. Let me put him on a horse. He called me stinking breed. Let him walk. He can't. He's done in. Then you carry him. Let him rest for a minute. A minute. Charlie. Charlie, can you hear me? Uh-huh. Listen to me, Charlie. The trail uh-huh. narrows a few yards along. There's a slope on our left. Uh-huh. Do you hear me, Charlie? Yeah. I'm going to let you fall. If I can get him to take his eyes off me, there's a knife in my boot. All right. Good luck. All right, Charlie. Up you come. Ah. <laughs> Getting close, Charlie. Now, when you fall, keep your head down in case he starts shooting. What a way to die. I can... I can... Dolly's right now. If we get back alive, I'll join you. Uh, about <laughs> ten more steps, Charlie. Mm. Mm. Now, Charlie. Ah! For a moment, I had a glimpse of Charlie sliding, falling down the hill slope. Then he disappeared into the underbrush. I turned to face Johnny Duchel, the knife in my hand. Johnny was standing in his stirrups, craning his head to see over the trail's edge. He was no more than 15 feet from me. There must have been a horse shifting its weight to disturb my aim. I threw, and the knife struck high on his shoulder. He half fell from the saddle, and I ran for him. I felt one of the bullets from his gun burn my cheek. Then we were rolling down the hill. Somewhere on the way, he lost the gun, but the, the knife was stabbing. Ah, cut it, bitch. Charlie. Charlie. It's all right. It's all right, Charlie. He's finished. He's finished. Something tells me. We don't get to say sitting bull today. Better luck next time. Hey, Kendall. Whiskey's paid for. 
But I owe Dolly for room and board. It's only... Charlie. Charlie. I took Charlie back to Rosebud, to Dolly's place. She had me put the little man on the parlor couch. Then she knelt by his side, took his hand in hers. Charlie, boy, it's Dolly. This was my place, huh, mister? Like the one I never had. My good, bad boy. Dolly misses you, Charlie boy. Wake up, son. <laughs> Most of Rosebud attended the funeral of Charles Nika. I sent the story to his own newspaper, as well as to the London Times. And for Charlie... I decided to stay on in Rosebud to have another shot at a meeting with Sitting Bull. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, and Junius Matthews. Music was composed by Jerry Goldsmith and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Later today, you'll have five more engrossing dramas waiting for you on CBS Radio, starting with Suspense, which today stars Herbert Marshall. You can look forward to plenty of action and plenty of thrills with Yours Truly Johnny Dollar, The FBI in Peace and War, Indictment, and Gunsmoke. For good listening, keep listening to CBS Radio. Now, stay tuned for the Ford Road Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Johnny Jacobs speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Raymond Burr as Captain Lee Quince. Specially transcribed tales of the dark and tragic ground of the wild frontier, the saga of fighting men who rode the rim of empire, and the dramatic story of Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry. Um, how long would you say you've known him, Patchy? I had that proud honor, I guess, eight, ten years now. Of course, I ain't had the privilege of serving with him since the war. I still don't see why you just don't go right up to him and make yourself known. Well, I wouldn't intrude on the captain that way, Drury. He's a busy man, tracking engines, planning battles. Besides, just because I recollect him so well don't mean he'd remember me. 
but he's a kindly man. Oh, the time will come. The just right time. I'll acknowledge myself to Captain Lee Quince. I'll bet you he'll be proud knowing you asked special to serve under him again. Maybe surprised, even. Of course, I've only been with the company a week now, but it seems to me the men hold him right high in their thought. I ain't been here long myself, but there's not a man I know wouldn't lay down his life for Captain Quince, if need be. Well, now, that's nice. I declare that's real nice. Captain ever talk much about the war, any of his experiences? Well, like I say, I ain't been here long myself. But the men say he's not much for talk about anything. He never was. Even when he was younger, when most men talk free, he was more for action than words. <laughs> yeah. Funny, ain't it? How you can sense such so much good feeling in a man without him talking much? That's a funny thing, all right. I like to draw duty with the captain. I sure do. I always have the feeling that no matter what, he's been thinking ahead, planning for us. I feel safe riding with the captain. Of course, it's hard to tell what a man's thinking if you don't make his thoughts known. It don't matter to me much what he's thinking, so long as he's acting good. There's the big thing, how a man acts. Uh, oh, this sure is different country out here. Different kind of fighting country, too. How you mean? We fought closer in the war. Like, uh, like there'd be a stream here, you see? Yeah. See, it was a kind of clearing, you know. And on one side, the ribs would be cowering in the trees. We'd be standing firm on the other side. Now, sooner or later, somebody's got to make a move for that water. The horses and for themselves. I tell you, you get thirsty. You get so you care more about water than living. Anybody's living. Well, mostly, we're lucky out here. <laughs> Seems like there's more cricks and man's streams. man's got a right to a drink when he's dry. More than dry, your insides get to feeling like sand, dust. Like though it's going to crumble. Patchin? What's the matter with you, Patchin? Uh, you, you say something, Drury? Ask if something was wrong. Wrong, boy? No, no, nothing's wrong. I, I just get a thirst sometime. You talked yourself dry. It ain't hot. We got plenty of water. There's a stream not 50 yards from you. I know that. I know. You were saying about the fighting being different in the war. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, we fought closer. Man to man sometimes. A man to dismount, fix his saber to his carbine, and such a bloody slash in the way you never saw. I ain't seen nothing like that in the West. Out here, it seems like you do more chasing than anything else. We've been tracking engines how long? Two days now? I ain't drawing my sights on one. If you drew it. That ain't saying they ain't here. Somewheres. Captain Quince must think they're around. Well, you know I'm not saying that. Why, there ain't a man among you come less near to criticizing the captain's judgment. Are you forgetting, boy? I know better than any of you what a great man he is. Looks like their campsite ahead, Mr. Seibertz. Must have made camp here last night. Yes, sir. We've been just about a day behind them all the way, haven't we, Captain? And it looks like we're going to stay that way. And I'll say one thing for them. They pick good campsites. Captain, it's the end of the fourth day. Didn't Major Daggett say if we could catch him in four days, fine? If not, report back to Fort Laramie? Yeah. Those are the orders, Mr. Seibertz. Seems like a waste somehow. All this riding only to turn back. One thing, we don't lose many men this way. That's true, Captain. They won't be the first who slipped off the reservation, got away with it. 
Sergeant! Go! We'll make camp ahead at Bitter Creek. Yes, sir. I guess we lost him, sir. The zoo? We never had him to lose, Sergeant. No, sir. I declare, Captain. I'm real sorry about that. I don't know how I'm done. I... You better get on with your job, Trooper. Patchen's the name. That's if you don't remember. I remember. I kept hoping I'd bump into you, Captain, sir. Sure enough, I did. You been with B Company long? Just a week. I didn't want to bother you, seeing you was heading up this big engine chasing operation. I didn't see any engines myself, but the men keep telling me they must be somewhere around. The Captain Quince wouldn't be out chasing it. We're moving back to Fort Laramie starting tomorrow. When we get there, I'll see you get a transfer to another company. Now, I'm sorry to hear you say that, Captain. I've been looking forward to this reunion longer than I can tell. Tell the truth, I thought you'd hold a higher rank by now, seeing men like Custer and McKenzie are generals. And you're their equal, I could swear to that. I've been telling you them... You've got a job to do, Trooper. Better get on with it. Is that an order, Captain, sir? That's an order. Yes, sir. Oh, Captain. Well? I thought maybe you'd want to know. It didn't just happen my being in your company. I asked for this duty special. On account of us being such old friends. I guess you remembered them all right, Captain. When was that, Drury? Patchin, sir. He was worried for fear you might not remember who he was. That so? I told him. I knew you'd recollect. You're just not the kind of man to forget a friend. He's been talking to you a lot, Drury? I'll put it this way, sir. I know you a lot better since meeting up with Patchen. I wonder. I feel I do. The rest of the men, they feel like I do. <laughs> we wasn't surprised to hear it exactly, but we sure didn't know you map campaigns for General Sheridan. General Cook, too. And all them acts of bravery when you led the Trooper. charge. Trooper. Yes, sir. You got duty with the mess sergeant, right? That's right, sir. Move out. Yes, sir. Captain, sir? What is it, Gorse? The camp's most bedded down, Captain. The pickets are out. And... Who's on picket duty? It's our last night out, sir. Corporal Jenkins used the rest of the patrol. Who are they, Gorse? Well, sir, he put Vickers and Culp up by the band. Over the west, he's got Stevens and Holt. Then over south, Beale and Patchen. I told Corporal Jenkins no picket duty for Patchen, and I meant it. Captain. No picket duty for Patchen, that's an order. Yes, sir. Captain? Mind if I say something, sir? I mind if anybody says something, Mr. Seibitz. I just want to ask you why. I wouldn't bother asking, Mr. Seibitz. It's about the men, Captain. I have the right to speak out about the men. You've got the right. They're tired, sir. They've ridden four days out, three days back. We've been moving like someone was chasing us. 
Only no one is. Any other observations, Mr. Seibertz? Yes, sir. Everyone stood his turn at picket duty. Everyone but Patchen. You're getting awful close to asking why again, Mr. Seibert. I'm sure you have a reason, Captain. I hope it's a good one, because the men don't understand. I think we got a morale problem. We won't have it long. We'll be back at the fort tomorrow. Captain, if you'd like good to... Good night, Mr. Seibert's. have to say, Captain? It's clear I'm asking for Patchen's transfer. But you won't say why. If you're talking about those forms you fill out, Major, put down for the good of company morale. I'm interested in company morale. I've watched, I've listened to Lieutenant Seibert's, I've talked to Sergeant Gorse. Now I'm going to ask you, Captain. It's personal. We haven't got room for personal quarrels, Lee. Oh, this is so little like you, I don't even believe it. Nobody who knows you believes it. You don't let these things happen. We're going to talk about that transfer? No, we're going to talk about morale. Well, suppose I transfer this man. What good would that do? You've got a company out there. They're going to be here whether Patchen's transferred or not. They've watched this man get to you. As nearly as I can tell, he's been killing you with kindness. That's what he's trying to do. Why? Why? He hates my guts. Goes way back. No picket duty for Patchen. Why? I like my camp safe when I'm in hostile territory, Major. It'll be a lot of trouble to get his army record clear back to the war. But I'll go to that trouble, Lee, if you don't tell me. I saved his life once. He's never forgiven me. That's an odd thing to say. It's the truth. I saved a lousy, gutless life. He knows it is. He lives with it. He served under you? I served under him. Patchen was an officer? Captain Joseph Patchen, New York Cavalry. Before I knew you, Major, remember the little wars... Us on one side of a stream, them on the other. And both of you needing the water in between? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, five days and nights we sat there looking across at him, waiting. Just waiting. We had a little water. We could have held out. The men were doing fine. He ordered a charge? He didn't order anything. He just split wide open crazy. Took off after that stream before anyone knew what hit. The men thought it was a charge, him being in command. We lost half a company. You hate his guts, too, don't you? I... Every good man's got fear in him. I don't mind honest fear. I hate a coward, Major. You were commissioned on the field, Lee. Was it there? Yeah. He can't forget that either. Surely he was relieved of his command. Major Daggett, sir. Sergeant Gorse. Corporal of the Guard reports two deserters, sir. It's Patchen and Drury. Pick your men, Sergeant. Stand out around the house, check the barn. Yes, sir. Holt, Vickers, cover the barn. You, Beal, Cup, the corral. Stevens and Fredericks, you, Stewart, you come with me. Afternoon to you, mister. They trample that young wheat, the army will owe me. Uh, we didn't come here to trample your crop. We're looking for deserters. New kind of grain, supposed to be special for the high plains. I put a lot of money in that grain. I wanted to come up. Two men. One just turned 20, the other older. My age or better. I thought the army was for fighting Indians. Give that up, didn't they? You need men to fight Indians, mister. Don't look at me. I got enough trouble trying to prove up land like this. Didn't intend to write off. I meant to stay with horses. Thought I could raise them. Good enough grazing land. 
Well, the Indians run the horses off. I'd get them grown strong on the grass. About that time, here they'd come. Indians. You don't keep horses now? A couple. They're not extra. I'm going to have to look in your house, mister. Well, I suppose you are. How many did you say you was looking for? Two. Brought quite a few soldiers along looking for two men. There's some kind of penalty for hiding soldiers who take a notion to run. The army don't take kindly to it, mister. Couldn't shoot a body, though, could you? You've seen them? You don't see many folks out this way. You and your soldiers are more nice seen in months. How long since you've been in Laramie Village? Oh, a long time. I stay pretty close here. I knew you wouldn't find him here. Thought you'd want to see for yourself, though. Captain, found this in the shed by the barn. You prefer a cavalry saddle, mister? I'm gonna have to find that out. Ain't used to it yet. Did it help if we knew which way they headed when they left? To tell you the truth, it's hard for me to think they was here at all. Ah, oh, let's go, Gorse. Hey, Captain. His boots. Sure, he's wearing cavalry boots, owns a cavalry saddle. But he hasn't seen anyone. You trample that young wheat, I'll send the army a bill. You going up to the house at all, Captain? Talk to him? Yeah, talking to him didn't do any good. Kind of a sniveling one. Kept wanting to know why the captain himself didn't come to him, ask the questions. He took it real personal, like. The captain himself's about through talking. I come up against any more crawly settlers, Gorse, I'm apt to start breaking a few necks. I'm feeling a little mean myself. Three plates of warm grub sitting on his table. Him all alone in the house. He never heard of two deserters. We'll find him. The men want to awful bad. For you, captain. That'd be some comfort. That'd be some comfort, Gorse. I sure feel bad about Drury. He was going to make a good trooper. Yeah, I know. I thought sure Patchen would be out here near the stream. He gets an awful thirst sometimes. Let's check that barn again. Yes, sir. There's only about two hours of daylight left. I hate to give him a night start in this country. We're not going to. Oh, Captain. You, uh, are the Captain. Speak your mind, mister. We're busy. I'd, uh, like to talk to you alone. I'll check the barn, sir. All right, talk. I've been uh, sitting up in the house trying to remember. I ain't sure, but seems to me I read somewhere as once that there was a reward for turning in deserters. Now, did I just dream There's that? There's a or... $20 reward, mister. Only $20? $20. Oh, ain't very much, is it? I, uh, I don't suppose uh, you're prepared to go any higher. I'm not prepared to go that high, mister. But the army figures it's worth $20. $20 a uh, piece? That's it. Hmm. Eight men looking for two men. And the total price on their heads is $40. Ain't no bargain, Captain. It sure isn't. Total pay for the eight men looking is $4 a day. 
Fifty cents apiece. Is that all? And the price isn't just for their heads, mister. We'd have to insist on the rest of them, In too. In here, Captain. He was in the loft. He called down to me, then he come down himself. Patching up there, too, boy? No, sir. No, sir, you run. I don't know how far. I don't know how long ago. Captain, I don't know nothing. You stay with him, Gorse. I'm going to find Patchin'. Yes, sir. No, Captain. Don't you leave yet. You hear me out, will you, please? Sergeant Gorse will hear you out. P- P- Patchin's got everything, Captain. He- he's got himself every kind of gun you ever saw. His and mine. All we could buy is steel. He's going to be waiting for you, Captain. I hope he is. You got to know my shame. It don't seem now it could have happened to me. It worked on me so slow, I I didn't even know it was happening. But I know now. I feel all the ugly shame of it. Talking's not much good now, Drury. I I ain't talking to save myself, Captain. I know that ain't right. I know it can't be. I'm talking to understand. And for you to know, I'm, I'm crawling with the shame of it. The crawling's uglier than the shame, boy. Patchin? That'd be your way, wouldn't it? Big, brave, alone. You must be the bravest man there is, Quince. Come on down, Patchin. I ain't coming down. I waited too long for this. I'm staying right here, and you're staying right there. You got plenty of water? Understand I ain't aiming for you, Quince. I'm just trying out my arsenal. That was my pistol. You're never going to last without water, Patchin. I've got two canteens, mine and Drury's. You could hit me if you tried good. You got a reason for not killing me, Patchin? That last was my rifle. I got me a buffalo gun off the settler, blow you clean away. You wouldn't even leave no spot, Quince. Come on down. We're gonna do this slow, Captain. Just you and me. Maybe my shots will get a little closer to you from time to time. We'll keep it slow, one. I want you to die a long time, Quince. Five days and five nights of dying. Remember, Quince? I remember. You want me to die, all right. Long time of dying. But you aren't the man to kill me, Patchen. You ain't coming after me. You ain't that brave, Quince. Don't take a brave man to come after you, Patron. Just takes a man. I hated you a long time. If I have to do, I could hate you dead. You hate yourself, Patron. Wouldn't feel good killing me. You'd still have yourself. You're going to kill me? That what you coming to do? Kill me. <laughs> please. Please don't kill me. <laughs> I'm not gonna kill you, Patchen. <laughs> Wouldn't feel good. Killing a coward. Get up. (laughs) 
Fort Laramie is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars Raymond Burr as Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry, with Vic Perrin as Sergeant Gorse. The script was specially written for Fort Laramie by Kathleen Height, with sound patterns by Bill James and Ray Kemper. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, Paul Duboff, James Nusser, and Herb Vigran. Jack Moyles is Major Daggett, and Harry Bartell is Lieutenant Seibertz. Company tension. Dismiss. Next week, another transcribed story of the Northwest Frontier and the troopers who fought under Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry. Each year, new automobiles come equipped with new and better devices for safety and comfort. But there's one device for comfort and safety that you'll have to manufacture for yourself, no matter how advanced our technology becomes. And that device is a smile. A sense of humor and a friendly attitude toward other drivers on the highway is sure to earn courtesy and consideration in return. And courtesy and consideration are big safety factors on the highway. Check the gas, the oil, and make sure you've brought along your smile. adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and untamed from Cheyenne to Calgary, from Dodge City to Poker Flat. These are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for, teeming crucibles of freedom. Frontier Town! That's what most folks would call Dos Rios. A frontier town. Loud and lusty. Tough and tumbling like a score of other frontier towns. El Paso, Cheyenne, Tombstone. The only difference probably is the name of the town. Dos Rios, in Spanish for two rivers. My name is Remington. Chad Remington. Born in Dos Rios 20-odd years ago. And reared there until I went upstate to school to study law. I wouldn't have come back, I guess, if I hadn't gotten word that my father was found murdered. Murdered in cold blood. So I threw a few things into a carpet bag. 
Took the first stagecoach out of Denver. And then stretched my long legs by walking the familiar rutted street past the stores with false fronts. And a half dozen saloons. Over to the white Dolby house that belongs to Judge Fillmore and his daughter Libby. I thought Father should have written you a letter, Chad. Still think it would have been easier on you since there was nothing you could do about it anymore. You always wanted to let me down easy, Libby. The judge was right telegraphing me. I was sure that's the way you'd feel about it, my boy. Uh, exactly what happened? They found your father face down in the corral with an arrow between his shoulder blades. Arrow? It was an arrow, all right, Chad. Regular engine arrow. The minute I heard, I rode right out to his ranch myself. No Indians around Dos Rios. No bad Indians. The folks around here don't think so. They blamed it on John Tallfeather, the Indian who used to work for your father. John Tallfeather was as fond of my father as... Well, as I am. What's more, John was a Choctaw. Choctaws haven't used arrows since the Mexican Wars. Where is John? I'm going out and tell him I don't believe all that loose mouth gossip. John Tallfeather's dead, Chad. They strung him up the same night your father was found. Strung him up? Who strung him up? A mob. A mob headed by your father's own neighbors, Rafe and Breck Kincaid. Kincaid, sir. Oh, I should have known. This is no backwoods we're living in any longer. It may be the frontier, but it's the frontier of civilization. I've heard you make that speech before, my boy. For all the good it does. This country will never be anything but a lawless wilderness until men learn to respect the due processes of law. Why do they think I left the ranch and went off to school? We know, Chad. We agree with you. But while there are people around like the Kincaids, what are you going to do? I'm going to do something, and you can bet on that. Now, don't go flying off the handle, young man. The Kincaids are gunfighters, both of them. A lot worse than that if they lynch poor John Tallfeather. And if there's any law in this country at all, they're going to pay for it. If you and Libby will excuse me, Judge, I'll leave my bags here. Of course, Chad, but where are you going? To start with, down to the livery stable. I'm renting myself a horse. Chad, not only can you have a horse and the best horse the livery stable provides... But you can have money in a bottle. What a shame. <laughs> and the shirt right off my back. <laughs> uh, Cherokee, you haven't changed one bit. You sound just the way you did when, when I met you for the first time, peddling genuine Cherokee rattlesnake oil off the back of that big wagon. Hell <laughs> yes, Chad. You remember, don't you? Yes, sir. Now, if you just gather around closer, friends, I want to call your attention to this little preparation I hold here in my hand. <laughs> this little bottle is sold regularly for three dollars everywhere. Now, you want to know what this little article does, and I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. It removes warts, blemishes, bunions, and freckles. Cures colds, rheumatism, Whoa, polar. whoa, there, you old horse thief. Horse thief? Hey, your Honor, I'll amend my complaint. I'll just make it Dr. Cherokee O'Bannon. Thank you, counsel. Objection sustained. <laughs> Come on, I'll get you a horse. Yes, indeed. One of the quietest, gentlest, broken-down hay burners have got for a fancy pants city lawyer. <laughs> if you know what's good for you, Bannon, you won't call me fancy pants. Don't worry, Chad. I've seen you ride. I've got a good nag for you. But do you mind, my boy, if, uh... Well, if, uh... If what? I'd like to ride along with you, if it's all right with you. Well, come along, Cherokee. I'd enjoy having your company. Now, if you'll just get the horses, I'd like to be on my way. Well, Chad, there's your ranch. You can see it right through them aspens. Hasn't changed much, has it? No, not a bit. There's the creek and the cottonwoods where I used to swim when I played hooky for... Oh, oh, I hold it. What's up? What's up? What's that for? Uh, unless I'm mistaken, and I don't think I am, someone's moved our wire. Our fence used to run along the other side of the creek up to that saddle rock. Sure, it used to. But it doesn't anymore. I thought you knew. Knew what? Well, last spring, there was a big rock slide right over there. Fill the old creek bottom with rocks and change it the course of the stream. So your father sold that little strip to Kim K. Are you sure, Cherokee? 
Because without water, there's a quarter of a section over here wouldn't raise gophers. Now, the way I heard it, on the count of you moving up state to be a lawyer, your father was selling off his cattle. Didn't care about the water. Selling off? What? Well, that's ridiculous. It wasn't a month ago he wrote me to go over to the stock show at the Capitol and see if I couldn't find him a new Hereford breeding bull. Why? Wow. Well, I'll be a scoring Jim Goffar. He sure wouldn't be burning any bull if he was giving up ranching now, would he? Don't think he would. Come on, Cherokee. Turn that pony around. We're riding over and paying a call on Rafe and Breck Kincaid. Get around there, you long-legged, loose-jointed shovel gussy. Come on, let's be off. Neither Rafe nor Breck seemed surprised to see me. But they did seem a little shocked when I started to ask questions about this strip of land Cherokee said my father had sold them. Well, maybe shocked isn't the right word at that. They were indignant. Indignant and downright hostile. You mean to say you think I'm lying, Remington? I'm not meaning to say anything, Rafe. I just asked you and Breck a very simple question. What do you mean, simple question? You asked us to show you the deed your old man signed when we bought that property from him. I know what I asked, Breck, but I still have to see the deed. Why, you... I got a good mind... If you really had a good mind, Rafe, you wouldn't go reaching for your gun. I'm not wearing one. Yeah, I forgot. You're the holier-than-thou gent who didn't like the way your neighbors ran your hometown. You went away to college. Sure, he was too good for us. (laughs) I can force you to produce that deed, you know. Oh, you can Well, you wouldn't like to try it, would you? I don't mean beat it out of you. Although I believe I still could. He believes he still could, Rafe. Whether you two realize it or not, we have a court in this county. And I could make you produce the deed in court. I just didn't think that would be a friendly thing to do. You're not getting no place trying to butter us up with that friendly talk. Ah, let it go, Breck. The deed's over in the table drawer. Get it and show it to Mr. High and Mighty. I'd appreciate it very much if you would. Your father would turn over in his grave. He knew what a duty he had for his son. The less you two have to say about my father, the better off we'll be. All of us. Here. Look for yourself. That's the deed. That's the deed, all right. Well, now are you satisfied? Yeah. I'm satisfied. This signature's a forgery. Why, you low down merely. Go on, Rafe. Squeeze trigger if you want to. I don't think even you would want to go into court for gunning down an unarmed man. Yeah? Well, who's to say you weren't packing a gun? Rafe's right. He's got me as a witness. (laughs) You're a lawyer. You know what witnesses are, don't you? Chad, you called me a liar. You said I forged that deed. Nobody calls me them names and goes on living. And I imagine you've killed men for a lot less, too. Well, if you got the salt to shoot while I'm standing in front of you... Hey, what's... Drop that gun, Rafe! Rafe, it's Cherokee. Chad must have left him outside. Yeah, I'd forgotten I had, but... Well, Rafe? You gonna let that shooting iron go or not? The next one won't be just a warning. And even my Cherokee Indian rattlesnake ever... Oh, he'll never cured one from five bullet holes. Go on, Rafe. Cherokee's got the drop on you. That's better. Come on, Chad. It's time you were leaving. You're right, Cherokee. Go on, Slope. And the next time you come up here, I'm shooting you for trespassing. Thanks for your advice, Rafe. And for your help, too. I'll be seeing you again. Sue. Remington, next time I see you, you better be packing a gun. Because I will... And I'll be looking for you. I intend to be looking for you, too. Both of you. Adios. Doggone it, Rafe. If he goes around town and shooting off that big mouth of his... Shut up, Brick. Huh? I ain't afraid of no man who's scared to pack a gun. He had his chance while he was here and he throwed it. Yes, sir. I always knew it. That one's yellow. Yellow clean through. We'll return to the dramatic climax of Frontier Town in just about one minute.
now, Frontier Town. Well, when we left the Kincaid's ranch, I was pretty firmly convinced that my father's signature had been forged on the deed under which the Kincaid's claimed title to the creek and that strip of land around it. Cherokee and I pounded leather and left a trail of dust all the way from the Kincaid's to Judge Fillmore's house in Dos Rios. But, Chad, are you sure? Why, Miss Libby, Chad, sure about this, and I am that my Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil is an absolute positive cure for 89 ailments of man. <laughs> all the way from double pneumonia to hangnails. I'm even sure than that. I'm as sure as anyone can be. Why, even seeing the deed for the few seconds I did, you couldn't miss the even pressure of the pen on the paper. And no one writing normally writes that way. You mean to say it was traced? And it was traced or copied or... I just know that my father didn't write it there himself. I hate to sound like a judge, my boy, but do you think you're going to be able to prove it? Well, judge, I hate to sound like a lawyer, but I've either got to prove that or leave town. Now, of course, I'm a doctor. Pardon expression. <laughs> Not a lawyer, but it seems reasonable and sensible to me, Chad. My boy, that we go down and have a little talk with the warden. I, I mean, the marshal. <laughs> it isn't often that I can agree with someone in Dr. O'Bannon's profession, but this time I think he's right. Well, Chad, if you'd like, we'll all go along with you. Chad, the marshal must be in. That's his horse tied off in front. Good, because I'm in no mood to waste any time. You know what he means by that, Miss Libby? He's aiming on getting back upstate, not staying here. Oh, Chad, not really. I'm afraid so, Libby. This lynching, these threats from the Kincaids, nothing's changed here. It's still the same boisterous, belligerent frontier town. Well, now, Chad, it's not as bad as all that. Here, let me open the door for you. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll wait for you here outside. I always feel a little strange when the door closes behind me in the marshal's office. <laughs> With what's on your conscience, I'm not surprised. After you, Libby. Well, Chad Remington, I was expecting you'd come back to Dos Rios, but I'm downright sorry that it had to be under these circumstances. Oh, howdy, Judge, Miss Libby. Hello, Marshal. Marshal, uh, Chad would like to ask you a few questions about his father's... Death. My father's murder? You're sure right about that, son. That low-code engine hit him smack between the shoulder blades, like a target was painted there. I suppose you know that Chuck Dawes gave up bow and arrow fighting years ago, Marshal. Of course they did. John Tallfeather reckoned that knowing it, we wouldn't blame it on him. But when I found that bow hidden under his bunk, I had him dead to rights. You found the bow? Well, I got it right here. That's the thing that done in your father? Oh, thanks. You know, it takes a mighty strong man to bend this bow. <laughs> John Tallfeather not only was old, but he'd been sick for years. Uh, well, he had enough strength left to pull it once. Marshal, how is it since you found this evidence you didn't arrest John and bring him in here? Uh, well, they... Uh... Well, there was uh, three or four boys with me when I rode out to your father's place, and then the Kincaid brother joined us. And, well, I reckon there's no reason with a bunch of angry men, especially when right's on their side. In other words, you just stood aside, let him take your suspect and string him up? Suspect nothing. I tell you, we had him dead to right. Well, you wouldn't have had him dead to rights in my court without more proof than that. Oh, no use getting excited about it now, Judge. Did you find anything else that day, Marshal? No, I can't say that. By sinners, I did bring something else in that you probably want. Your dad's belt, holster, and gun. I got him right here in the desk. Yes, Marshal. I'd like to have his gun. Well, here you are, son. And I hope you understand. Yes, I'm starting to understand. A lot. I'll see you again soon, Marshal. Come on, Libby. I almost went in to get you. Guess who just rolled into town? Never mind, I'll tell you. Rafe and Pat Kincaid. Were they looking for me? Could be, could be. That's good. Very good. Chad, you don't mean that you're going down. Make a target of myself for him, Libby? No. But I am going to strap this on. Oh, 
Don't look at me as though your eyes were going to pop out of your head, Libby. I'm fully grown now. I'm reasonably able to take care of myself. Chad, you'll be careful. I'm being doubly careful. I'm taking a bodyguard with me. If Cherokee and I find what I hope we'll find, you can get out your law books, Judge. Because we'll be having a case for you to try in your court mighty soon. <laughs> the Kincaid brothers in town, it certainly seemed safe to go back out to their ranch. When we got there, I headed straight for the desk where the so-called deed was kept while Cherokee started to ransack the rest of the house. Suddenly, I could hear Cherokee's heavy boots come pounding toward me from another room. Chad! Hey, Chad, you certainly played the right hunch. Look here! Where'd you find those, Cherokee? In a bedroll in the back room. This is only a few of them. There must be 20, 30 arrowheads back there. So John Tallfeather murdered my father, huh? Those filthy, cold-blooded swine. Sure, the Kincaid's done. Hey, what's that you got there? That paper. Enough with those arrowheads to put the noose around the Kincaid's necks. Here, see, they bought some land from my father, all right, but not the piece down by the creek. Here's the deed for ten acres up on the north side next to their grove of jack pines. All they did was to copy his signature off this deed and trace it on the other. Yeah. Even I could see the difference when they're side by side. Well, Chad, I suppose now you're going back into town and call them out, eh? No, Cherokee, I'm not. I'm taking this evidence into the marshal and swearing out a warrant for their arrest. Huh? You sound like you've been drinking rattlesnake oil. Why, them two would never let themselves be arrested? Oh, if they got everybody bluffed around here... Come on, Cherokee. We're getting back to town. Come on, Cherokee. There are only two places we haven't been to, and... Well, there are the Kincaid's horses tied up in front of the Lucky Seven Casino. You see the brands, K. Barrow? You're darn right I do. Why, the bushwhacking buzzards? Go fetch the marshal. I'm waiting here to make sure they don't get away. You can see them both from here, marshal, at the faro table. Oh, doggone it, Chad. This ain't no time to try to haul them to jail. They've been drinking. Well, them two is only enough cold sober. I'm sorry you don't like your job, marshal. But maybe if you liked it a little better, it wouldn't be necessary to do things like this here in Dos Rios. Now, you see here, Chad Remington, I don't take lip like that from no man. You'll be taking a lot more than that if you don't get busy. Now, come on, we're going inside. Well, but mark my words, we're not having no shooting scrapes. Marshal, if I were you, I'd start moving. Come on. Just keep walking, Marshal. <laughs> I'll bet another hundred. And if the house will take off the limit, I'll... Sorry to interrupt your game, Rafe. But your luck's just run out anyhow. Remember what I told you this morning? I said next time I saw you, I was going to... Rafe, I'm warning you. Don't try scratching leather. Well, look who's here. The dude brought the law with him. You want something, Marshal? Well, uh, Chad here sent for me. Says he's got some kind of proof. You killed his father. <laughs> so he thinks I killed his father, does he? Well, if I thought someone shot my father, I wouldn't need any lawman to take care of him. <laughs> We've got laws to handle things like that. They're plenty good enough for me. Marshal? I got an idea. I just bet he has. I just bet he has. Since Chad wants us arrested, why don't you deputize him? Then being the law he thinks so high of, he can take us down to the calaboose. If he thinks he can. Rafe, now, I didn't come in here looking for trouble, and you being on the prod ain't helping me none. Marshal, are you going to arrest the Kincaids? Uh, sure, sure. But if... Uh, they ain't going to come peaceful, then, well, I'm going back and get me a couple of deputies. 
All right, Marshal. I don't intend to tell you how to run your job. Go on. I'm going to stay here and wait for you. Okay, Chad, but don't you go stirring up no trouble while I'm gone. Him stir up trouble? <laughs> don't make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that Marshal's a card, ain't he? Real brave hombre. Couldn't wait to run out. I didn't run out. Remington, this morning you called me a liar and a crook. Now you come in here calling me a murderer. That's right, Rafe. I called you a liar, a crook, and a murderer. And we haven't even started, Jad. Mister, I got only one thing to tell you. Go for your gun. Sorry. That's one piece of advice I can't take. You're right, Rafe. This Jasper's yellow. Sure he is. Yellow. Clean through. You're going to find out, Rafe, if I am or not. Yeah? How? You, you gonna hit me with a wet handkerchief or something? You ain't got the salt to clear your holster. The only time I draw a gun is in self-defense. I don't know why you don't fill your hand. Why should I? Well, because I called you a liar. I've called you a crook, and I'm calling you a cold-blooded, sneaking murderer. Well, even I wouldn't let a man call me that to my face. Go on. You got quite a reputation for slinging guns. What's stopping you now? I ask you, get out of here before I blow you out. To blow me out, you'll have to draw. And I'm waiting. Rafe, I knew you were everything miserable a man could be, but I never thought you were spineless as a gutless coward. Why, you dirty... <laughs> All right, Brack. Now we don't need the marshal. The one Kincaid that's left is going to jail anyhow. Well, Chad? Well, Libby. It's just that... Well, I hate saying goodbye. I hate saying goodbye to, uh, everyone? Well, you were all right, won't you? Well, I might. Not that it'll do much good, I'm afraid, Libby. Not that it'll do... Jack, what do you mean? I always heard women knew everything by intuition. You mean that... That there's someone else upstate? Someone you're going to marry? Upstate? Now, who mentioned upstate? Now, with Rafe dead and... That Kincaid sentence, you're leaving town again, aren't you? Well, yes. I'm going about 12 miles out of town, Libby. I'm moving into my father's ranch. Oh, Chad, you're not. I sure am. And I guess there's enough trouble around those fields for another good lawyer. Yep, Libby, I, I've come home. Oh. Well, he ain't never going to get home if he don't get started, you say, <laughs> Romeo. How about inviting me for dinner tomorrow night? Huh? Oh, Chad. Chad, of course. Well, then, we'll, we'll be seeing you, Libby. Hey, get started, Cherokee. we got miles to cover. Up there, boy. Big tracks. And don't forget, Libby, my weakness is apple pie. Frontier Town starring Tex Chandler came to you from Hollywood. The series is directed by Paul Franklin and supervised by Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Bob Mitchell. Be sure to be with us again this time one week from today for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. Frontier Town is a Bruce Ells production. Tom Mix Ralston Straight Shooters are on the air from coast to coast. So let's get going. Up, Tony. Up, boy. Up. The mystery of the border smugglers. 
Tom Mix is working with the Texas Rangers to smash a powerful gang of smugglers. Right now, this gang, led by a mysterious person known as the Mask, is holding Wrangler captive in an abandoned ranch house ten miles outside of the town of Havana. As Tom and Pecos search for the Wrangler, Tom notices a light in the old ranch house, and he and Pecos wheel their horses and ride in its direction. Meanwhile, unknown to them... They are being watched and are riding straight into the guns of the smugglers. In a moment, we'll learn what happens. But first, here's Pecos Williams. Howdy, everybody. Say, these here are days when it's up to you and me and all of us to keep in the top of condition. And the best way I know to do this is to saddle up every morning with a hot dish of good old Ralston. Now, Ralston ain't just an ordinary cereal. Shucking, no. It's an extra special kind of cereal that packs a heap of nourishment and quick energy. Cowboy energy. Ralston, you see, is made a whole wheat. And it's enriched with vitamin B1. The vitamin that gives you pizzazz. Has Ralston got a flavor that's a Lulu? You just asked any straight shooter you know. Now, why not tell your ma tonight to get you a red and white checkerboard package of good old Ralston tomorrow. And now, come on out to the Rio Grande country. In the light of a full moon, Tom and Pecos are galloping toward the old abandoned ranch house, not realizing they are about to step into a dangerous trap. Come on, Tom. Get him come on. on. Come on. Stretch out there, boy. Come on. Come on. Jim Nintley, Tom. Yeah? If you did see a light in that old house, it's probably nothing but a drifter who's holed up there for the night. Well, you may be right, Pegas. We're not taking any chances. Shuckins, I hope we ain't wasting time. We know something's happened to Wrangler, at least the way we suspect it has. It seems to me we ought to get to Havana's and try to pick up his trail pronto. We'll only be a few minutes, Pegas. We may find something important. That old ranch house would make a pretty good hideout. Sure would. Here. Oh, easy, easy, easy. What is it, Tony? What is it, boy, huh? He's sure acting mighty peculiar, Tom. Yeah. yeah. He must be trying to tell us something. What is it, Tony, huh? What is it, fella? Now, what in the name of bald-faced eagle... Yeah, he wants me to give him his head so he can show us what's wrong. All right. All right. There you are. Go ahead. There you are. Well, that horse has got more sense than a whole bunch of people put together. Look at him, Tom. Yeah. He's slowing down. He's swerving away from the ranch house, mm-hmm. Tom. Mm-hmm. He must know there's someone in that house. Someone we got to be careful of. Yeah. What do we do now, Tom? Uh, instead of riding up to the ranch, we leave the horses here and walk. Right. That way we can... Oh, stop, quick! Yeah, just as I thought. There is somebody there. And I'll send these horses on their way. Get them out of range. All right, All right get going. Don't get up, come Get up. Come on, come on. Now what do we do, Tom? Well, there's only one thing we can do. Jim, I mean, Tom, that bullet burned my finger. Yeah, they're using high-powered rifles, Davis. Yeah, and that means we got to get closer. Now, luck, before we can use our six-shooters. He's jumping. Things are all beginning to heat up, Tom. Yeah, head for that brush, Pegasus. we got to get undercover. Come on. Right. Who's ever shooting that rifle sure knows what he's doing? Hell. Doggone it, there went my hat. Just wait till I get my hands on the Stop point. Down, quick. Right. I'll tell you, Tom. Don't move, Pace. Don't move. Stop, Man handling that rifle's a good shot, all right. Yeah. I don't like the looks of this, Pegas. Well, the only thing to do is to smoke them skunks out of there, Tom. Yeah, maybe. Frank, there's a man house. He might... You mean, to make it too hot for him, they might... Right. Listen, Pegas. Huh? These men are sharpshooters, and there's a full moon. There's only a slim chance we can get up to that house without being hit. We've got to risk it. Well, what are you leading up to, Tom? Just this. Whoever gets close enough to help Wrangler has got to be a mighty good Indian fighter. I get you. All right, then. Come on, we'll try it together. Give me your knife. Here. Going to hack off one of them bushes, huh? That's right. We'll hold the bushes in front of us and creep up on the ranch house that way. Ah, there. Now, I'll hack off enough of these bushes. Meanwhile... As Tom hacks away at the bushes, preparing to approach the ranch house Indian style, within the ranch house, 
Wrangler is being held prisoner. Take these ropes off of me, you yellowback varmints. I just dare you to take them off. Save your breath, mister. All the shouting in the world won't do you no good where you're going. We got orders from the mess to put you out of the way, so get moving. Try and make me. Just try and make me. I'm giving you one more chance now. Are you coming quiet or do we have to persuade you? Listen to me, you sneaking polecat. I'm tired of looking at your ugly face. So if you're aiming on shooting me, you may as well do it right here and now. No, no. We ain't going to shoot you. We got other plans. (laughs) Yeah? Yeah. There's a cliff about six miles from here. We ride out to that cliff. When we get to it, we stop. But you keep going. Going to ride me off the cliff, eh? That's right. When the rangers find you, they'll think you've had an accident. You get it? Uh, what do you say? Do you come quiet or do we get rough? What do you think? I think we got to get rough. You're right. Okay, I've wasted enough time. Joe, Pete, grab him. Yeah. All right, partner. Yeah. You just come here. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Mr. Buggy, kick me. Yeah. Hey, yeah. orders or no orders, I got a mind to yeah. plug you for that. Get away from him, Joe. Hey, go ahead. I ain't scared of you, you yellow-livered coyote. You asked for it, now you're going to yeah. get it. Pete. You... Hey, what? what? The mask wants you. Quick. Hey, what's up? The place is being attacked. Okay, wait till I bed down this cow yeah. Oh, it ain't no time for that. You can take care of him later. Come on. Okay. I guess you'll be safe enough here, mister, till yeah. I get back. All right, boys. Come on. <laughs> Home. Yeah, but not before we're close enough to do a little shooting on our own. Here goes. Let them have it. Let's go. Right. We'll show them, Tom. Come on. Yeah, but we've got it. To... Ooh, Tom. Yeah, pull it, Grace. Yeah, just a stretch. Take it. What's in the flash of the rifle? Right. They'll give you an idea where to fire. That's what I'm doing, Tom. Okay. Come on. Let's start closing in, Pegas. We've got to get inside that house. Yeah. Hey, they stopped firing, Pegas. Yeah. Wait a minute. Listen. What is it, Tom? Yeah, I thought I heard hoofbeats. I don't hear nothing. Wait. No. Yeah, there they are. The whole gang heading away from the ranch. Well, what's it mean, Tom? That means they're afraid to stand and fight. What do we do? We're going after them. I'll whistle for Tony. Wrangler was in there. They've probably taken him with them. They wouldn't leave him behind. Well, maybe they would, no. Tom. You'll make too valuable a hostage if we get him cornered. All right, Tony. All right, boy. Come on. Let's go. Up, Tony. Up, Come on. Come on. Get up. Up. Come on. You sure was right, Tom. There they are up ahead. Yeah. Get moving, Tony. Come, Come on, Tony. Come, 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 Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. They're a chucking lead back this way, Tom. Yeah, I know it. I don't care about them getting me, but if they get my horse like they got my hat. We're getting out of Vegas. We're getting. Yeah. Can't take a chance on hitting Wrangler if he's with him. Fire over the heads. That may stop him. All right. Just like you say, Tom. It ain't stopping him, none. Maybe I'd better... No, we'll catch up with him soon. Come on, Tony. Come on. Keep low on the saddle, Pegasus. All right, Tom. Come on, come in. Now, we're almost on him now. Yeah. Their bullets are getting more and more uncomfortable close, Tom. What are you doing? I'm calling my rope. You mean you're going I think I can reach the last man in that gang. If I can pull him off his horse, there's just a chance that'll stop the rest of them. I'm going to try anyway. Okay. Good luck, Tom. Well, here goes. Oh, I better widen that loop. There. Now then. Here we go. You did it, Tom. Partner, that's rope. Hold on, Tony. Whoa. You yank him clean out of the saddle. Oh, come in. Oh, boy. Hold. 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 Hey, they're stopping up ahead, too. Yeah. Looks like a... Tom. What? Watch that varmint there on the ground that you roped. He's got a gun. Oh, no, you don't. No. My hand... Shut the gun out of my hands. Take that rope off him, Pegas, and keep him covered. All right, Tom. Come here, you. Hey, Pegas. Yeah? The gang's coming back. Get set for anything. All right, Tom. One of them's wearing a mask. Yeah. He must be the leader. All right, you. What do you want? Yeah. Pretty clever, Mix. Roping one of my men. I'll hand him over. You stay where you are. I'll turn this man over to you when you hand Wrangler over to me. Now, where is he? Bring the Wrangler forward, men. Here he is, Mix. Bound and gagged. All right. I'll trade this man for Wrangler. <laughs> oh, no, Mix. You don't think I came back to parley with you, do you? Oh, no. You're greased lightning on the draw. I know that. I suppose you take a look at this. Tom, what? he's got... That's all right, cowboy. Don't get excited. Yeah. I got the muzzle of this gun against Wrangler's head. 
And unless you two drop your guns and surrender, I'll pull the trigger. Holding his gun at the Wrangler's head, the mask calls upon Tom and Fakus to surrender. What will happen next? For fast action, mystery, and thrills, be sure to listen in tomorrow. Say, you know, Uncle Sam wants you to help build a stronger America by keeping physically fit and in the top of condition. Now, many wide-awake young Americans who are going places and doing things depend on good old Ralston to give them energy to help keep them fit. For Ralston puts the B1 in breakfast. And vitamin B1, as you know, is the cowboy energy vitamin. An amazing vitamin science tells us we must have every day if we want to have a keen, alert mind, good digestion, buoyant energy, and robust health. So if you want to be a leader and a winner, join the thousands of alert, wide-awake, straight shooters of America who start each morning off with Ralston, the hot whole wheat cereal that puts the B1 in B breakfast. Say, you go for Ralston, it tastes great. Ask Mother to get you a red and white checkerboard package tomorrow. Hold on there, Dawn. I'll be a gallop and go for a look at it. It's roundup time. So let's get going. <laughs> up, Tony. Up, boy. Up. This here is Pecos, reminding you to buy defense bonds and stamps to help Uncle Sam win the war. You can buy them at your bank, post office, or ask your newspaper carrier boy or a retailer for them. Don't forget to tune in Tom Mix tomorrow at 545. Good night. Enjoy delicious rye crisp as bread at every meal. At the recent National Nutrition Conference in Washington, D.C., America's foremost nutritionists felt that everyone should eat a whole grain bread regularly. And Rye Crisp is a whole grain bread, practically the only out-and-out -out whole grain bread available nationally. And is it good? Rye Crisp is whole rye baked into crisp, thin, golden brown wafers with a flavor that's downright thrilling. Now, Rye Crisp comes in the red and white checkerboard package. Be sure to ask for Rye Crisp. Spelled R-Y-K-R-I-S-P. Rye Crisp, tomorrow. Get the happy all-American habit of enjoying delicious Rye Crisp as bread at every meal. This is the National Broadcasting Company. It's Hop Along Cassidy. <laughs> With action and suspense, out of the Old West comes the most famous hero of them all, Hopalong Cassidy, starring William Boyd. The ring of the silver spurs heralds the most amazing man ever to ride the prairies of the early West, Hopalong Cassidy. This famous hero thrills his 60 million fans with action and dangerous adventure. In the role of Hopalong Cassidy is the popular star of the motion picture series, William Boyd. And appearing as that laughable old character, California, is Andy Clyde. Now to our story, Murder on the Trail. Some folks always seem to be right in the center of excitement. And that may be because some folks look for it. Of course, you'd never get Hopalong Cassidy to admit that, but his pal California strongly suspects it. And especially now that they interrupted a peaceful ride back to the Bar 20 to hitch over to Rapid River for the night. Well, there's the Rapid River Hotel up ahead on the right. Let's see if they have a couple of empty sacks. Uh, I'd sooner be out under the stars, and so would you, Hoppy. <laughs> you can't fool me why we come here. You decided awful sudden after you heard there was a little trouble. Me? Walk into trouble? Why, California, you hurt my feelings. Well, you're going to hurt my stomach if we don't get some grub pretty soon. As soon as we get a room lined up. Folks in the lobby seem pretty excited. Yeah, I guess they're talking about the killing. Who was it? Uh, Mr. Mills, he owned the stagecoach line. Robbery, I suppose? No, he was... Hey, you! Hey! You're Hopalong Cassidy, ain't you? That's right. 
You want it at the museum. Really? Well, I hadn't figured on being put on the glass quite so early in life. Ha, <laughs> ha! You tell him, Hoppy. Go on over, pal. You'll enjoy yourself in a museum. What makes you think so? Well, you seem to like keeping an old relic around. Huh? <laughs> what do you say? Why, 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 if, if, if they think they did... I, I, I order... Uh, of all the... Doggone you out. Mr. Cassidy. I had a message for somebody here at the yes, museum. Yes, yes, I sent the message. I saw you ride into town a little while ago, and I thought perhaps you could help me. Well, this is my partner, California Carlton. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. My name is Muncie. Harry. I judge you're upset because of the murder, Mr. Muncie. Oh, yes, indeed. I'm uh, I'm responsible for it. You're what? Well, just what I said. Mr. Mills would be alive now if it weren't for me. I deciphered a map showing the secret passage into Lost Canyon, and I showed it to Mr. Mills. He had always been so interested in the canyon, he started for there at sunup, and by noon a rider found him dead. Well, that doesn't make you responsible. Oh, but I knew it would happen to anyone who tried to go up into the canyon. I knew it when I showed him that map. This is getting kind of complicated, and uh, why is an old Ross Canyon so dangerous? Ah, oh, there's a legend about that canyon, California. A true legend, Mr. Cassidy, of the vow taken by the Jepson followers never to let anyone invade their canyon. It has been sealed up for 20 years. Disaster will overtake anyone who tries to enter Lost Canyon. But it doesn't seem like religious folk could uh, take the murder. Don't you understand, Mr. Cassidy? They're fanatics. They will stop at nothing. Look, look here in this cabinet. Now, these are dumb, dumb bullets. They have a hollow nose. They rip a man to pieces when they strike. The British developed them. And, and do you know Why? To stop fanatics who couldn't be down by an ordinary bullet. But you're speaking of savage frontiersmen, Mr. Muncy. Then you aren't afraid of these people in Lost Canyon? Uh, you don't know Hop Long Cassidy very well. Uh, or you know he ain't afraid of nothing. Then will you take the map? What? The map to Lost Canyon. I'm not a brave man, Mr. Cassidy. And now I'm terrified. I just want to live here among my treasures. I don't want any violence to befall me. I don't suppose any of us really wants violence. But you can cope with it. Please, will you take the map? Well... Go ahead, Hoppy. You're just itching to get into more adventure. Good, good. I have it hidden in this room. I'll be right back. I know something like this should happen, Hoppy. You head for danger like Chopper does to a field of wild oak. Oh, there's no danger in this. Mr. Muncie is just an excitable little man. <laughs> what in blazes? Mr. Muncie. Hoppy. Hoppy, look. This axe has split his skull. It's all from the wall or maybe... I know what you mean. Go get a doctor, quick. Cassidy. Hoppy rode into Rapid River because he was curious about one murder and now he's mixed up in another. The town is in a nasty mood. They want somebody to pay for the killing, all of which puts Hoppy in California in a pretty tough spot. The Dot Little Museum is now bristling with outraged townsfolk and the sheriff is not having much success keeping order. Get the two men who did it. Enough of this killing. Yeah, bring him up before somebody else gets it. Yeah. They were the only ones 
in the museum. Men, get back. I'm the law around here. This is my business. When our friends go getting killed, it's pretty much our business, I figure. Bring them two men out of the other room and let us tend to them. That's what we want. We'll give them just... Now, quiet. Quiet, all of you. I'm drawing my gun, and the first man that interferes with me is going to get it, you understand? Uh, It's mobs like you that hang innocent men. And there'll be none of that in Rapid River. Stop this murder. I will stop it. I will. In the right way. All right, deputy. Bring them two men out. Yeah. There's the police. Yeah. Shut up. Shut up. This gun's cocked, and I mean business. Stay back if you want to keep your head on straight. Thanks, Sheriff. They don't seem very friendly. I'm here to keep the law, and if you're guilty, you'll hang just as they want. Now, look here, Sheriff. You don't know who you're talking to. Oh, am I supposed to bow when I meet you? <laughs> no, but by golly, you'll take off in your hat when you meet my partner here. This is Hopalong Cassidy. Uh-huh. How do you do, Sheriff? You're, you're Hopalong? Oh, they trick you, Sheriff. Shut up! Nobody tricks Sheriff Richards. So you're supposed to be Hopalong Cassidy, huh? No, Sheriff, I'm not supposed to be. I am. Ain't you never seen these pictures? The only pictures I ever see are the ones with wanted on them. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't Hopalong. Ain't nobody here ever seen Hopalong? Huh? Oh, shut up, Jake. A lot of good you'll do it. Well, if the fellow knows me, bring him out, Sheriff. Nah, that's old Jake Peters, blind as a bat. I don't need eyes to know Hopalong Cassidy. Let me through here. How in tarnation you going to tell, Jake? I got way. Where, where is this fella? Here I am. You must be the Jake Peters that used to ride range in Cheyenne. Now, now don't confuse me with talk. There's one sure way I can tell Hopalong. Don't matter now if I don't have eyes to see him. I'll still know him if I can just hear him walk. Huh? Uh, oh, gone if this ain't something. Go ahead, you walk. Like this, Jake? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a little more. It's him, Sheriff. That's hop along. I'd know the ring of his spurs anywhere. You sure, Jake? Of course I am. Well, that's good enough yeah. for me. You're yeah, welcome to Rapid River, Hoppy. Thanks, Jake. Your friends were hard to convince. Well, I, I'm right sorry, Mr. Cassidy. But you know, a feller can't be too careful, especially when he's the law. Hoppy ain't used to treatment like this. I understand, Sheriff, and I'll be obliged now if I can help in any way to clean up this murder. Oh, thanks, but we don't need no help. We're used to handling our own affairs in Rapid River. Come on, men. Stay out of this museum. We ain't getting nothing done hanging around here. Oh, uh, Sheriff, yeah? would you mind if my friends and I stayed here for a while and looked over the displays? Seems to be quite a fine collection. Well, I don't know. Well, we rode quite a ways to see this museum. We'd be grateful if we could stay and look it over. Well, just because you're hop along, Cassidy, don't think you're privileged character around here. I'd do the same for any citizen. You can stay for ten minutes. Thanks, Sheriff. That'll be fine. Why, that insulting tin horn Sheriff. The idea of him talking to you the way he did. Oh, forget it. He was just trying to impress us. I don't know why you went to all that trouble to stay in this here museum anyway. Don't you know, California? Really? Oh, all right. Of course you know. You think you can find something that the sheriff didn't in his investigation? I'm sure of it. Mr. Muncy was a nice little fellow, and I'm pretty put out that somebody would go to the trouble to murder him. But there ain't nothing to prove it was a killing. There's axes all over the room he was in. It uh, could have been an accident. Do you think it was? Well, I don't know. Come on in here. I know there's something that may help you decide. Oh, this blood all over the floor is giving me indigestion. That's the impossible, California. You haven't eaten anything. The dog gone, that's right. That's what I'm feeling. No supper. Now, look here. See these axes? Go on, take one off the wall. Uh, then, 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 I'd rather just as well look at them from here. Don't you see something pretty obvious? Look at this one. And this row over here. See? I don't see nothing except a bunch of axes. But don't you realize that there's not one of them in here that is like the one that fell and killed Mr. Muncie? Well, sure there is. It was just like these red-handled ones. I don't mean the handle. I mean the other end. Uh... The blade. That's right. Every axe in here is to tell you couldn't cut summer butter with it. But the one that fell was sharp enough to slice a human skull. Oh, you're right, Hoppy. Gee, Willikins, what do you think of that? Shh, quiet. Huh? Howdy, boys. Howdy. Uh, mind if I go along on this little tour? My education has been kind of neglected. Come on in, mister, but don't hide behind doors. You might get into trouble. Oh, I never get in trouble. But you might, especially if I was to tell the sheriff 
that about an hour ago I delivered a message to you from Mr. Monty. And how is that going to cause trouble? Well, it depends on what the message was. If I was to say that Mr. Muncy wanted you to please leave him alone, and he couldn't possibly make the payoff that you demanded... Why, you California, dirty stop that. Fighting ain't the answer, cowpoke. Oh, I can see that. California, how much do you have with you? Uh, uh, what? Get out your pouch, California. What? <laughs> we understand each other, eh, Mr. Jackson? Yeah, we certainly do. I don't believe I know your name, though. Oh, the folks just call me Brick. Gold Brick, maybe. Now, listen, you old gold. Yeah, Brick. a crack like... Yeah, something to make you feel better. And don't go causing any trouble, will you? We just want to stay out of this. Better? You know, uh, I was watching through the window all the time. Oh, you were. Huh? Well, don't say anything about our taking the map, will you? We're, uh, we're just collecting curios for our ranch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, sucker. Thanks. Now I think fine. Poppy. Poppy. Are you stark raving mad? What do you mean by paying off that little chiseler? And why did you tell him about finding the map? But I didn't find it, California. I just thought it might be interesting to see what he would do if he thought I did. Come on now. Let's have our dinner and see what we can figure out. Uh, oh, now you're talking. Uh, I can just taste a big hunk of steak. I, I, uh, Poppy, I just thought her, sir. What? We can't buy no dinner. You gave that chiseler all the money we had. Oh, what do you think of that? Well, the bank will be open in the morning, so let's go dream of a hearty breakfast. Before we continue with this exciting story, here is a word from your announcer. Now back to Hop Along Cassidy and our story, Murder on the Trail. One of the leading citizens of Rapid River has been murdered because he started up into Lost Canyon. Then Mr. Munsey, curator of the museum, was killed by a fallen axe as he was about to give Hop Along Cassidy the map showing the secret passage into Lost Canyon. So now Hoppy and California are camped out on the edge of town, and they're trying to figure out two things. Who is doing the killings? And why? Ah, uh, doesn't add up, California. Just two men have been killed for no apparent reason. But uh, the little tour of the museum told you the reason. That they're religious group. No, California. I don't think that's the answer. It's very seldom that wars are fought or murders are committed because of religion. People generally kill for a very earthly possession. You, you mean, uh, money? Uh-huh. But in this instance, I can't figure out who will gain and who will lose because of this map showing the secret passage into Lost Canyon. I uh, sure wish you hadn't told that brick fellow that we have the map. But that may bring the murderer out into the open. Why, we may even have visitors before the night's over. Did it? Uh, you think so? Uh, say, maybe we should have gotten a hotel room after all. Why, California. You said you didn't want to ask for a room without having the money to pay in advance. 
You were afraid of being embarrassed. Well, I'd rather be embarrassed than dead. Do I detect a note of fear someplace? I just don't want to die on an empty stomach, that's all. If I hadn't... If I'd had had supper, I wouldn't have mind laying out here to be shot. But think how much you have to look forward to. As soon as the bank is open in the morning, I'll buy you the biggest breakfast in Rapid River. You will, Harvey? You bet. Buckwheat cake stacked a foot high. You dream about that. Mm -hmm. Swimming and shirping, golf, shabbat. That's right. And brown little sausages to spice them up. (sighs) Buckwheat cake. Sausages. And a pile of scrambled eggs. Mm -hmm. Scrambled eggs. Sausages. Sure. Sweet dreams, California. I'd better shut up and get to sleep myself. All this talk of food is killing me. California, wake up. Yeah, okay, yeah. Breakfast time already. Chopper and snakes, what's that? Let's find out. No time to saddle up. Come on. I'm coming, Hoppy. Come on, Chopper. Over towards these bushes. Hey, maybe it's a trap, Hop. We'll have to risk it. Look over here. Yeah, that's his horse. Easy, easy, boy. Uh, uh, Who is it? Uh, uh, is that you, Hopper? What, Jake? Uh, Jake Peter. He's hurt bad, Hoppy. Uh, uh, Take it easy, Jake. Uh, we'll get you to a doctor. Oh, uh, it ain't no use. He rode up behind me and put these slugs into me. Who did, Jake? Uh, the murderer. He knowed I was riding out here to warn you. He's after you now, Hoppy. If I'd had eyes, I, I could have found you. The fellow at the forge told me you camped out on this road. Oh. Jake, who put the slugs in you? Who was it? No use, Hoppy. He ain't hearing you now. Poor old Jake. California, we're dealing with someone who will shoot a blind man in the back. I'd sure like to get my hands on the barman, Doug. I've got a hunch Mrs. Mills may know something about these murders. You meet me there later. Where are you going now? To the bank as soon as it opens. If it's for breakfast money, Hoppy, forget it. I ain't hungry now. No, I'm going to try to find out who is the wealthiest man in this town. Taking such an interest, Mr. Cassidy. You didn't know my husband. No, Mrs. Mills, and I didn't know the man at the museum. And I'd only met Jake Peters, but it still winds me up inside to see cold blooded murder. The whole town knows that there are religious fanatics up in Lost Canyon. The whole town may know that. But what about you? Do you know it? I. Uh, you don't I... believe that story any more than I do, Mrs. Mills. There's someone right here in this town that's doing the killing. I only want to know the route into Lost Canyon so that I might be able to bring the murderer out into the open. Yes, I want that, too. I'll tell you what I'll do. I won't give you the route, but I will act as your guide and lead you up there. Oh, but that's too dangerous. There's no man in my family now, Mr. Cassidy. I've got to be father and mother both to my children, and their father would ride up and gain what Lost Canyon has to give us. All right, Mrs. Mills, a spirit like that. Come along with me, and we'll clean up this whole dirty mess. <laughs> Ah, uh, this is bad business. I'm sorry I agreed to let you come with me. Living is bad business, Mr. Cassidy. You have to have courage to take chances. Ah, uh, you trust me. We may both come out of this alive. What's the matter? Do you hear something? Yes. Someone's coming up the trail that we're taking it. Why, it's the sheriff. Hello, Mr. Richard. Hello, Mrs. Mills, and oh, it's you, Cassidy. That's right, Sheriff. Who did you expect? I expected you to have better sense, I'll tell you that. Or maybe you mean I shouldn't have had such good sense. You saw what I did with that mob back in the museum, Cassidy. I cocked my gun like this, and I threatened to use it on the first man that tried to take the law into his own hands. Oh, but, Sheriff, you don't understand. Mr. Cassidy if is... If a... this is Mr. Cassidy, the only man in Rapid River that vouched for him was blind Jake Peters. You mean dead Jake Peters. If he's dead, you're the only one that knows about it, Cassidy. Well, there's been enough talk. My deputy's right down the trail waiting for my whistle. So now I'm sending you back to town for safekeeping. And you? Mrs. Mills and I are going right on up this trail. Yes, Sheriff. I'm glad you came when you did, for we're approaching the passage now. Well, you ride on, Mrs. Mills. I'll catch up with you. All right, Sheriff. Howdy, Sheriff. 
Looks like I rode up just in time. Brick, you take Cassidy back to town and watch him. Okay, Sheriff. Well, so Brick here is your newly appointed deputy. Seems like only last night that he was a cheap blackmailer. Shut up, Cassidy. I got me a badge now. <laughs> and if the sheriff don't get out of Lost Canyon alive, I'll be head man. Don't say a thing like that. I'm coming back. What's the matter, Sheriff? You kind of superstitious? I'll send to you later, Cassidy. Right now, I'm going with Mrs. Mills after the murderer. Of course, it's mighty dangerous for a woman to be riding up into the canyon. No telling what might happen. You know, Sheriff, you sound just like a man who's trying to establish an alibi. Huh? Yeah, an alibi. In the event Mrs. Mills doesn't come back alive. You know, Mrs. Mills, it was a sad day that your husband found that map showing the secret passage into Los Angeles. Oh, it was a horrible day. But how did he know it would cost him his life? Eh? Yeah? Oh, well, I guess he didn't. That Mr. Munsey at the museum knew the danger. He wanted to get rid of the map. He wanted to give the map to Mr. Cassidy. Yeah, but he never did. Because I killed him and took the map myself. What? Yes, Mrs. Mills. I killed Mr. Munsey and I killed your husband. I thought they was the only two that knew the passage. Sheriff, what are you saying? That I can't let anybody living know the passage, Mrs. Mills. But I know it. That's right. I don't like doing this. In fact, I never enjoy killing. Take Peter, you killed him too. Oh, he was a worthless old coot, but he was nosy and got to suspecting things. He was on his way to blab to Cassidy, so I had to get rid of him. Sherry, this is incredible. How can you go on killing and killing? You're the last. Then I'll be safe. Everything I've got will be saved. What do you mean? I'm a rich man, Mrs. Mills. I ain't just a tin-horned sheriff like folks think. I got a barrel full of money. But I'd lose it all if this here secret passage is found. You... You're really going to kill me. Get off your horse, Mrs. Mills. No, no, no! Come on, I'll see that horse. Let's get this over quick. No. Sheriff, I have children. You can't... Maybe I'll adopt them, Mrs. Mills. Oh, but just a passage. I'll, I'll leave Rabbit River. I'll let me live. Take your prayers, oh. Mrs. Mills. This is it. What's that? Who's over there? Get up here, you. Take your hands off me. Uh, well, stay right here. There's a visitor out in the bushes. Let me go. You stay right in front of me. I'll come back after you, Sheriff. I thought it was you, Cassidy, hiding behind them bushes. You're wasting your bullet, Sheriff. I got you covered. Your little game is up. If you shoot me, Cassidy, you shoot Mrs. Mills first. Come on, behind these rocks. Oh, be careful, you're too close to the edge. Oh! I see you sneaking for the trail, sir, but I'm sitting up here to see you don't make it. Why, you sniveling skunks think you can trap me, do you? Ah, <laughs> oh, you Mr. Miles. Let me go, you're hurting me. Why, I order. I see your hat, Cassidy. You're out on the ledge, Sheriff. We got you covered both ways. You might as well drop your gun. Ah, uh, you think I'll give up, do you? I'm used to living hard, and I'll die the same way. You're not going to take me alive, and I'll die laughing. Because I'm taking Mrs. Mills with me. Stop it, Sheriff. You're pulling her over the left. Stop it. Oh, we're falling. Let me go. to hop along, Cassidy. Oh, gonna copy. That was the fanciest rope in I ever seen. Did I hurt your arm, Mrs. Mills? Oh, I, I don't think so. I don't know. I'm just so thankful to be alive. It was a mighty close call. If it hadn't been for Hoppy's rope, you'd be at the bottom of the ravine with a the sheriff there. And if you hadn't ridden up the trail, California, and helped me this arm brick. Well, I... Oh, it's so horrible. This sheriff must have been insane wanting to kill me for no reason. Oh, he had a reason, all right. But what? 
How could it matter to him that I knew the secret passage? Well, didn't you want to use it to build up your stagecoach business, Mrs. Mills? Well, yes, but no one knew that. Don't see how that mattered to the sheriff, Poppy. He was a very wealthy man, California. Yes, he told me that. But I just thought he was raving. Oh, no, I managed to find that out at the bank. He owned controlling interest in a railroad that runs from Rapid River to Dodge City. What? That's right. The railroad would almost run your stage line out of business. Now, if you were to root your stages through Lost Canyon, you could beat train time and get the business back again. Well, if that ain't the dag busted, this doggone... Why, it's incredible. He did all that killing to protect his railroad. Yes, but now you're free to root your stages through the canyon. Yes, I must do that. I've got to support the children. I guess the first thing is to find a good driver and try the canyon road. Poppy, do you, uh, do you suppose there really is a fanatical religious cult up here in this canyon? I get a feeling uh, we're kind of being watched. Well, I know one sure way of finding out. Uh, uh, how's that? You drive Mrs. Mills' stage through this canyon. And if there are any religious folks up here, you'll probably scale them right up into the hills. Poor <laughs> 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 Up in California, our heading back Bar 20 way, got a lot of things to take care of at the ranch. But it won't be long till Hoppy gets that feeling and they'll be heading out again for more excitement and adventure. We'd like mighty well to have you along. Hop Along Cassidy, starring William Boyd, is transcribed and produced in the West by Walter White, Jr. Murder on the Trail was written by John Barclay. All stories are based upon the characters created by Clarence E. Mulford. This is a Commodore production. Across the rugged Indian territory rides a tall young man on a mission of mercy. His medical bag strapped on one hip, his six-shooter on the other. This is Dr. Six-Gun. <laughs> National Broadcasting Company brings you another episode in the exciting adventure series, Dr. Six Gun. Gray Matson, M.D., was the gun-toting frontier doctor who roamed the length and breadth of the old Indian territory. Friend and physician to white man and Indian alike, the symbol of justice and mercy in the lawless west of the 1870s, this legendary figure was known to all as Dr. Six-Gun. There are many men who say that the history of the West is the history of guns. The Navy Colts of the James Gang, the Smith & Wesson 45, the Winchester Carbine, the Gambler's Tiny Derringer. Well, perhaps this is true in a country where almost all adult males carry firearms. All except me. And who am I? <laughs> Pablo, the gypsy peddler. <laughs> and this is my friend, Midnight. <laughs> Midnight. He is a raven. <laughs> Got you covered. Hey, you see, he talks. Reach for the feeling. But do not be alarmed. He never carries a gun either. Perhaps he has picked up that philosophy from me. For it is written, He who lives by the sword shall perish by the sword. And I imagine that would hold equally as well for a forty-five caliber pistol. But uh, this is not the philosophy adhered to by my friend Doc Sixgon. For he travels leaning slightly to the right from the weight of his gun. I remember once we were traveling together and we entered the cattle town of Rail End in the eastern part of the territory. <laughs> and Doc and I had both come off circuit. Doc dispensing medicines and good advice, while I tended to the spiritual requirements such as uh, needles and pins and ribbons. Town's grown since we were in last year, Pablo. Yes, yes, I see. 
Six saloons grow where but two grew before. <laughs> well, I suppose that is progress. Right. But uh, I was thinking of that freight depot and the cattle yards down by the railway. Oh. Got 300 miles off the northern end of the cattle trail from the south. Uh, which accounts for the saloons. <laughs> yeah, with all those wages being paid out to the cow hands, someone has to take charge of it. surveyed the street and picked out an imposing edifice with a gold-lettered sign across the entrance which read The Cattle Palace. And uh, compared to O'Shea's saloon, the town of Frenchman's Ford, it was indeed a palace. The bar seemed to stretch for miles. And there were half a dozen barkeeps stationed behind it. Their checkered vest resplendent and their hair parted neatly in the middle. What's your pleasure, gentlemen? Whiskey for my friend. I'll take a bottle of that uh, Arkansas Springs mineral water if you got it. Well, mister, I can serve the whiskey, but I can't serve you. Well, uh, if you don't have the mineral water... I ain't that. Settle. It's your gun. What about it? You ain't supposed to have it. What do you mean? Well, we got an ordinance here in Rail End. Can't nobody carry a gun except in the law. No. Well, now, when was that passed? Oh, last year. It was the marshal's idea. Oh, say, that sounds interesting. Uh, what do I do with my gun? You can check it down at the marshal's office, or at the Wells Fargo, or right here at the saloon. Except the boss charges two bits for checking fee. If I was you, I'd tote it down to the marshal's office and get it for free. <laughs> well, I don't mind the quarter, but uh, I'm, I'm interested. How's it worked out? Well, I'll tell you. First couple of weeks, it was a caution. Seemed like when you took a gun away from any one of them cowpokes traveling through, he felt like he was losing his pants. Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, anybody get hurt? Yep. One or two unidentified corpses got planted out on Boot Hill with bullets in their eyes. Marshal Anders is the right capable man with firearms. Does the marshal find it cut down on the gunplay? Better ask him, mister. He's right up there, leaning on the bar. The ball fella by the spittoon. Oh, oh yeah. Well, here's my gun. And here's my two bits. You can uh, bring our drinks up by the market. <laughs> you see, Doc? Many times I've spoken to you of the advantages of not carrying a gun. And now I am two bits ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pablo, the saloon will get it anyway, one way or another. Uh, that, uh, that must be the marshal. Excuse me. Marshal Anders? No. What is it, mister? I'm Dr. Matson from Frenchman's Ford. Yeah? And this is my friend Pablo. How do you do? Howdy. The uh, barkeep's just been telling me about your, your order. Oh? Well, now, there are two schools of thought about that. I got the idea of Wyatt Earp at the Dodge. I served under Emperor Spell at Ellenson, Kansas. He used to claim if you took them deadly weapons off a gang of cow punchers, no matter how drunk they got, they was no more dangerous than a gang of farmhands back east somewhere. I don't know as I go that far with them, but I can tell you, if I had my choice, when I got a haul of crazy drunk waddy into the pokey on a Saturday night, I just assume I was the only one toting a gun. I can see that. Uh, Barkeep said you had a little gunplay when you enforced the ordinance. Just enough to keep my hand there. I tell you, Doctor, there's nothing so comforting to a peace officer as to know he can walk down the street with a pretty good chance of getting to the end of it without a slug in his back. It was a little strange for one used to the lethal atmosphere of the bull run to see a whole row of men lined up at the bar with their pants on an even keel. Uh, not pulled to one side by the weight of a gun belt and pistol. It was about 11 o'clock in the evening when we saw a, a practical demonstration of the rail end ordinance at work. There was a crash and a clatter outside. The swinging doors burst open, and in the doorway stood a man wavering slightly on his high heel boots, his hat on the back of his head, and bulking large at each hip, a gun. 
I'm wild and I'm woolly and I'm full of fleas and I ain't been carried above the knees. And this here's my night to howl. Eddie. Yes, Mr. Fitzsimmons? Get out the back way and look for Marshal Landers. Well, where should I look, Mr. Fitzsimmons? You know where to look. Try the silver horn. Stockman's rest. Not Judge Pierce. If you can't find him anywhere else, go down to his office and see if he's there. Oh, what do you want? I should tell him, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Tell him we got a live one up here with two guns as big as life and twice as natural. Now go on, get out. Yes, sir. I'll get him. Expecting trouble, Barky? Yes, sir. In this business, I'm always expecting trouble. And here it comes. I'm half horse, half alligator. I can whoop my weight in Comanches and wrestle a longhorn steer with my bare hands till it calls uncle. And I'll lick the man that says it ain't so. Barkeep, whiskey. Sorry, mister. I can't serve you. Ah, what are you talking about? I got money. Here. I got paid off this morning. And I got $12 left. And I ain't to see it gone before dawn. Now, come on now, whiskey. And fill the glass up till he sparkles and twinkles like a pretty girl on a hayride. <laughs> Sorry, mister. I just can't. Huh? What do you mean? I just can't serve you. That's all. See as much as my job. Now, barkeep, you're getting downright and coffee. Now, keep your shirt on, Kelly. Now, listen here. I ain't no move for stalling around. You listen to me, you pot-bellied weasel with them two spit curls hanging down over your eyes. You get a glass of whiskey up here on the bar, or I'm liable to lay you out behind it. I'm fast losing my patience. It ain't nothing personal, cowboy. It's your gun. You gotta check him before you can get served a drink. Huh? What are you talking about? Are you local? That's the city ordinance. Ain't nobody can carry guns inside of town. Who says I can? You? Why, a line of bullets through each one of your ears. No, no, no. Take it easy. I told you it wasn't me. Then who is it? Who says I can't carry my own gun? I do. And who are you? What? Oh. I see you got the tin star on your vest. <laughs> you must be the marshal. That's right. Now, listen to me, cowboy. Huh? I'll give you just three to check your guns peaceable at the bar here. Or else I'll take them away from you myself. <laughs> like to see you do that. <laughs> you will. All right, cowboy. One. What? Hey, what kind of a crazy law is that? Man can't carry his own guns? Well, I pay for them myself. Two. Hey, what have you got here in this town? A saloon or, or a church social? Three. <laughs> All right, now, cowboy. Let's take your gun. Hey, what you hit me with, Marshal? Brass knuckles, cowboy. My hands ain't as hard as they used to be. On your feet and come with me. Uh, what do you mean? You got my guns, haven't you? What more do you want? Ten days of your time in the cooler. Ten days? For what? Resisting an officer. Now, on your feet. Let's keep going. And so the ordinance in the town of Rail End was enforced by Marshal Anders. Doc was very impressed. You know, Pablo, that ordinance, that must be the answer. Half the shootings in Frenchman's Ford are either from some kind of drunken horseplay or, or cowpoke with an exaggerated sense of humor. Huh? Why, it's like the Middle Ages when everybody wore a sword and fought all the time. Take the guns away and they won't be so quick to fight. Oh, you think not, eh? Why, sure. Man doesn't really expect to get hit with a bullet. But he knows darn well that if he gets into a fist fight, he's liable to get a mouthful of knuckles. But, Doc, do you think such an ordinance would work in Frenchman's Ford? I don't know, but I'd sure like to see it tried. I get awful tired of probing for bullets and sewing up wounds. I've got more important things to do. Doc tried to convince the town of Frenchman's Ford to endorse such an ordinance, but without notable success. O'Shea, the Bull Run Saloon, expressed the most frequent objection. Doc, you just can't change human nature. Now, a cowhand is just going to naturally carry a gun. I always have, and I always will. But I tell you, I've seen it work in Rail End. Well, now, it might work in a real city-fied eastern kind of place like Rail End. 
But out here in the territory, it's just flying in the face of nature. Now, don't you try to tell me about nature, O'Shea. I've delivered a good many infants in my time, and not one of them arrived packing a cartridge belt, holster, and forty-five <laughs> pistol. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got a point, Doc. But I'm telling you, it just won't work. Doc got no help in his campaign. The sheriff, who might be expected to approve such a move, he put it this way. Well, now, Doc, you got to figure it this way. If ain't a man gets himself in trouble with the law, it's the law gets itself in trouble with a man. Oh, now, that's ridiculous, Sheriff. The way I figure it, the less laws there are around here, the less fellas are going to be tempted to break them. Maybe you'd just be afraid to enforce an ordinance like that. Well, maybe you got something there, Doc. I ain't no Wyatt Earp. I ain't no Milton Anders either. I don't care if them crazy cow hands shoot each other full of holes. Just so long as they don't steal no horses or rustle no cows or get fancy ideas about the U.S. mail. Ain't gonna get nowhere around here trying to separate no man from his guns. But still, the bright picture of a revolverless town glimmered before Doc until the whole matter became a town joke and all serious possibility of putting it into effect disappeared. And so, the next spring, when Doc and I again rode into the town of Rail End, Doc was a little thoughtful and a little sad. Well, I suppose we might as well stop in at the marshal's office and check my gun. Mm -hmm. No point in paying two bits to the cattle parlors. <laughs> well, I'll meet you down there. I'll have your... Uh... What was it, the mineral water waiting for you? Well, just you make sure there's a head on it. Oh, I'll have it waiting. See you. Yes? What can I do for you? I'm, uh, I'm looking for the marshal. What do you want with him? Oh, just want to say hello and, and check my gun. I'll take your gun. You deputy? No. Well, uh, Where's Marshal Anders? Ain't no such animal. What do you mean? Anders ain't Marshal no more. I am. Oh, why? I hadn't heard that. Happened a month ago. What's your name, mister? Matson. Dr. Matson, Frenchman's Ford. All right, Doc. Just hand over your gun. What, uh, what happened to Anders? Nothing. He just ain't Marshal anymore. Well, here's my gun. If you see Anders, tell him I asked after him, will you? Sure, sure, will him. Just keep your nose clean in my town, Doc. Now, what do you mean by that? Just what it sounds like. You can pick your gun up on the way out of town. I was waiting for Doc at the cattle palace. It uh, hadn't changed in the year except for the addition of an oil painting. A nymph who would have, uh, had she been in three dimensions, uh, fallen over immediately on her face. Uh, there was a distinct difference in the quality of the liquid refreshment. And I was debating this fact with the barkeep when Doc came up. Now listen here, Peddler. You asked for whiskey and I served you a glass. All the whiskey I got. All comes out of one barrel. Excuse me, sir. Half of it may come out of a barrel. The other half undoubtedly comes out of a well. What's the trouble, Pablo? Doc, I have often drunk bad whiskey. I've sometimes drunk bad water. But I object to them being combined. Now listen, mister. Don't let your friend here make a fuss. It'll only get us all into trouble. Is that whiskey really watered? You may take my word for it, Doc. It's strange. It was not so last year. There are a lot of things changed since last year. You having any trouble, Fitzsimmons? No, no, Mr. Carson, no trouble at all. Just talking to a couple old friends, that's all. Yeah? Well, just call me if there's anything wrong. That's what I'm here for. Oh, sure, sure, sure I will. Ain't no trouble, none at all, none at all. When you get through, bring me a double over to my table. Sure, Mr. Carson. Glad to. Now, you see what you could have done? Now, if you don't want the whiskey, just get out quiet, will you? Don't make no trouble. Who was that? Gandy Carson. He's a deputy marshal. 
Does the marshal's office always take such a close interest in your clientele? There's a deputy in all the places up and down the street. Keeps order, you know. Uh huh. I uh, suppose you're bringing him his drink on the house. Why, sure. And all he does is keep order here in the saloon. Sure, he's a deputy, ain't he? Huh. I suppose so. Anyway, he has the star. Say, uh, you know if Milt Anders is still in town. Now listen, mister. Will you drink that poison mineral water or whatever you got and take your business across the street to the stockman's rest? I got enough trouble. Now listen, what happened to Anders? You'll excuse me, gentlemen. I gotta serve Mr. Carson. At about three o'clock in the morning, Doc and I were sleeping in our room at the hotel. Huh? Who's there? Doctor? What's the matter? Somebody sick? Let me in. Uh, just a minute. Uh, what? Doc, Doc, what is it? Uh, someone at the door. Oh, no. What's the matter? Come in, Doctor. Who is that? Milton Anders. Oh, Mr. Anders. Come on in. Anything wrong? Is somebody sick? No. Leastwise, not the way you mean. Well, wait a minute. I'll, I'll light the lamp. No, don't bother. I heard you was asking for me. That's right. Anything special? Why, no, no. I just thought I'd say hello. That isn't the impression you gave Cal Benson. You mean the new marshal? That's right. He gave orders to have you run out of town tomorrow morning. What? That's why I came to see you tonight. When you open that door tomorrow morning, there'll probably be a couple of his deputies waiting for you. What for? What charge could he have against me? Practicing medicine without proper qualifications. That's ridiculous. For one thing, I haven't even been practicing medicine in Rail End. And, and for another, I'm... Save pretty... your breath to cool your coffee, Doc. You've got a choice. You can either wait and get heaved out tomorrow morning... Well, ride out with me now. Hey, what is this? What's going on here? We came into this town last year and... Why, well, it was peaceful as a church. Yeah. Well, it was last year. Well, what happened? Who is this Benson? How did he get to be marshal? Oh, uh, let's hold her, Doc. I don't know as I can discuss Cal Benson without raising my voice. And I wouldn't want to get overheard right now. But how did he get to be marshal? That's the way it is with politics, Doc. In Washington... In the territorial capital, Republicans come and go, and so do the Democrats. They take care of their own. That's why I got appointed in the first place. Right now, Benson's in and I'm out. Look, Doc, I suggest you make up your mind whether you're going to leave town on your own steam or on request. Well, I suppose I might as well go with you. Pablo? Oh, I'm with you, Doc. You know, I have been asked to leave places several times in my career. And it is not always a pleasant sensation. Well, let's go then. I'll just poke the fire up. Not a bad place up here in the hills. And as cozy as the marshal's office. But it does. What happened in Rayland, Mr. Anders? Who is this Benson? He's the marshal. Only man in town that can carry a gun. I took care of that for him. But what's he doing? I'd say Cal Benson and his buddies are having a rare old time. They got all the saloons and places of entertainment lined up. They got a kick in a percentage of the take. For extra protection. Yes, we saw that in operation. Benson has a take on every head of cattle that goes through the railroad pens. He's got to deal with the roads for protection. I mean, the railroads are paying them off, too. Sure. Worth it to them. And that ain't the whole of it. You can walk down the streets of Rail End and see killers and rustlers from all over the territory. Looking like butter wouldn't melt in their mouths. And safe as in the church. How's that? Well, welcome, Doc. Just so long as they park their guns. And they agree to do that? Sure. With a marshal, the only one who can carry a shooting iron, they got nothing to be afraid of. Not so long as they pay them off. But can't you do something? Who? Me? There's a warrant out for my arrest. What for? You see, somehow or other, the telegram from the territorial capital replacing me with Benson got delivered to him. 
He stepped up to me at the bar in the stockman's rest and tried to arrest me for carrying a gun. He didn't mention the why until after I put a bullet through one of his deputies and tried to jump me from behind. I'm wanted for murder. But can't you fight it out? There's a lot of them. And only one me. I ain't that good with a gun. Nobody is. Well, suppose he gave yourself up. They'd have to ship you to the circuit court for trial. Your case would stand up. Doc, it's sure a caution how many prisoners Benson's holding in that jail that suddenly gets shot trying to escape. Oh. I really rigged myself a rabbit trap, Doc. And it's got me by the leg for fair. You mean the warden? I remember when I put it through... Boy, a hand of shot told me there was something in the Constitution about the right of the people to bear arms. I told him I wasn't interested in the Constitution. I had a hurl of wild animals to corral. And if I could dehorn them, I was going to. That's the way I looked at it, Doc. I wasn't stepping on nobody's toes but murderers and drunk, peace-breaking cowboys. Well, you couldn't have foreseen what Benson's doing. Nope, I couldn't. So I just went ahead, didn't I? Funny, ain't it? Ah, very. Who oh, I was right in the way, Doc. Sound like rail end ain't going to be worth much with shootings and law breaking. But I reckon I was trying the shortcut, huh? I sure made it easy for Cal Benson. Mr. Anders, what are you going to do? I figure on sneaking down through Texas and shipping out. We're starting in with cattle down in South America. I was to know something about punching cows. I reckon I could learn to do it in Spanish. There must be some way to, to clean Benson out. I reckon there is, Doc. But it ain't my way. I'll leave it a hand a shot to somebody like that. I messed it up enough. Who would figure just chipping a piece off a thing like a constitution would end me up chasing longhorns in Argentina? There is no heroic end of this tale. The town of Rail End is still under Marshal Benson. And there is some hope that after the next election there may be a change. But I doubt it. For one thing, the opposition candidate, a young lawyer named Hendershot, was killed by a deputy marshal who claimed he mistook him for a rustler. There was uh, one aftermath. We rode into Frenchman's Ford on the Saturday night and stopped at the Bull Run. There was a gay frolic on the way as we entered. <laughs> well, look out, boys! Don't throw it through the mirror! Now look out for them bars! Doc, my friend... I think that after tonight, you might convince O'Shea to uh, back your ordinance against guns. No. No, Pablo, I'm afraid I've lost enthusiasm for that ordinance. Let them carry their guns. Some Someday they'll put them aside. May not be as easy as taking them away now, but in the long run, that's a pretty sound document, that, uh, that constitution. It's worth sewing up a few bullet holes for <laughs> Six Gun is played by Carl Weber and Pablo by William Griffiths. Tonight's script was written by Ernest Kinoy. 
Heard in the cast were William Keene as O'Shea, Santos Ortega as Anders, Joe DeSantis as Matt, and Lon Clark as the barkeep. Starring Carl Weber as the frontier doctor, with William Griffiths as Pablo, the wandering gypsy, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. A fiery horse with a speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high o silver, the Lone Ranger. Danger rides the trail once again as the famous Lone Ranger urges his great horse, Silver, on to new adventure. Listen to those silver-shod hoofs racing over the hard-packed roadbeds of yesteryear. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver, old boy! The tin old fellow! Tell us waiting for us on the trail ahead! Hi, old Silver! The central figure in tonight's story is Andy Beecham, a hard-working prospector typical of the Old West. Andy had searched for gold in desert and mountain, in good times and bad under burning sun and freezing snow. Because of his courage, he had met the disappointments of the years, continuing his hunt for the precious metal in spite of all obstacles. When he was just about to give up hope of ever finding the yellow gold, he suddenly struck it rich. He uncovered what promised to be a profitable vein of ore, filed his claim, and built a small home on the property. As our story begins, we see Andy and his wife entertaining a guest, Rod Ramsey, the prospector has been telling the story of his good luck. And as we join them, we hear some of the details. So after years of knocking around, Ramsey, I located this place. It was just what I'd always been hunting for. They tell me that all this section is hard rock. How about that, Andy? That's right. Hard rock mining. That's the tough kind, ain't it? Yeah. Takes a lot of capital for tools and things. Gotta blast the ore out. You was lucky to have the capital to work with. Didn't have. You didn't? I don't know what we'd have done, Mr. Ramsey, if it hadn't been for Mark Nelson. Who? Mark Nelson. He lives down the valley. He loaned me the cash for the job. Well, how'd he come to do that? Well, that's his business. Oh. Andy, there's two kinds of men you can't trust. Horse traders and money lenders. What about gamblers? Mary, I... Uh, oh, I didn't uh, mean mm. Mr. Ramsey. He's an honest gambler. <laughs> Don't mind me, Andy. I quit the gambling game two years ago. You did? Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Ramsey. I always said you was far too fine a man to make a living gambling. I quit for good. But about this money lender, I'm kind of sorry you went to him, Andy. Shucks, why not? As soon as the claim begins to pay, I'll return the money I borrowed. Uh, I hope you can. I wish I'd known you needed cash, but of course I didn't. I didn't have no idea where you and Mary had gone to after you left the flat. <laughs> Funny being together again here, ain't it? It sure is. What brought you here anyhow, Mr. Ramsey? Well, to tell the truth, ma'am, I come here to pay a debt. Is that so? Oh, I didn't think you had any debts. Why the money debt, Andy? Oh. There's a man that once saved my life. I was sitting in a faro game one time, and crooks tried to hoodwink me. We shot it out. Well, this stranger stepped in, took my side in the argument, and got me out in there half alive. Gosh. For weeks, him and an Indian friend of his took care of me, and finally got me on my feet again. I promised them, too, I'd never gamble again, and I won't. What are you figuring to do if you meet them? Tell them that it's been two years since they saved me, and I ain't handled a card since then. Who are the two men? If they're in these parts, I should know them. There ain't many folks around here I don't know. The Indian's name is Tonto. Tonto? What's the other man's name? I don't know. What do he look like? Can't even tell you that. He has a powerful white horse that he calls Silver. And he wears a mask over his face. The horse? <laughs> <laughs> no, ma'am. The white man. 
I heard him spoken of as the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger? Sakes alive. We've heard stories about him. I always thought he was sort of a, uh, well, a legend. Yeah, we never figured he was really all that he's cracked up to be. Andy, let me tell you this. He's real flesh and blood, and no matter what you heard about him in the way of doing great things, it's true. My sakes alive. I'd sure like to get a look at that hombre. Maybe you will. Do you think he's around here? That's what I heard. That's why I come here. Reckon that's Mike. Who? He's working for me. I ain't young enough to do much in the way of drilling and blasting anymore. Now, that you, Mike? Yeah. Evening, Miss Beecham. Evening, Mike. How's things look after this day's drilling? Just about the same. Here's samples of what we got today, boss. Ah. Look like we're getting close to the mother load? Nope. Don't look no better than before. Oh, gosh. I'm hoping you ain't made a mistake on your sizing up the land, Mr. Beecham. Well, you're getting paid anyway, ain't you? Sure. Only it'd be hard for you if you didn't hit the pay dirt soon. I know. Well, there's the samples. You don't mind if I go to town, do you? Why should I mind? Well, I just mentioned that I was going, that's all. We should hit the mother load one of these days, shouldn't we, Mike? Can't tell. Night. Night, Mike. Andy, there's something about Mike I don't like. I know, Mary. He's a queer sort. Never since he's been here has he wore a smile. Always that same surly look on his face. Like he was doing you a favor to work here. Well, I expect don't set too well with him. Do most of the work and see me own the mine. Where'd you get him, Andy? He just drifted in looking for work after I settled here. I needed a man bad, so I put him on. Can you trust him? What do you mean, Rod? Just that. Wouldn't it be easy for him to be taking gold ore out in the claim and telling you he hadn't got to it yet? Mm, I suppose it would, but... Well, I gotta trust him. Maybe it's from have been a gambler that makes me distrust a lot of men. But I didn't like his eyes. In a game of cards, that man would bear close watching. There ain't but one thing would keep him from ringing in sleeve cards. And that's being afraid of getting caught. Great Scott. Did you hear that? That voice. What was it? Silver. Did you hear it? Called his horse Silver. You mean? I mean that was the Lone Ranger. <laughs> I need your help. What's the matter? I've been following Black Mike. Huh? He just left the mine and headed for town. What him do there? I don't know. But I do know that he told old Andy Beecham that the mine hadn't started to pay yet. Him tell that? Yes. Not, not true. I know it isn't true, Kimasabi, but Andy Beecham doesn't know it. What we do? We've got to check on Black Mike and see what connection he has with that moneylender. You go and do that. Uh, me get horse. Here, white fella. You'll find Black Mike heading toward town. If you ride fast, you'll get there ahead of him. Then you can watch him. Tonto! Uh, Tonto do! I'm going back to Beecham's place. An old acquaintance of ours is there. Who? That? You remember the reform gambler? What him name? Ramsey. Oh, him good color. He's looking for us, Kimosabe. And I think maybe he'll find us. Ah. Uh. He's one man we can count on to help smash this moneylender and the crook known as Black Mike. Not good. Now then, Kimosabe, on your way. Get him up, white fellow. Come on, fellow. We're heading the other way. Mike, the miner employed by Andy Beecham, went to the home of the moneylender, Mark Nelson. He was unconscious of the fact that his movements were observed by Tonto. At Nelson's home, he made his report on the condition of Beecham's claim. The mother load is just about in plain sight, Nelson. I had to do some fast work to cover it after the last blast showed it up. So, <laughs> my investment won't turn out bad at all, will it? When do I get paid? You've been getting paid all along by Beecham, haven't you? Yeah, but I work blame hard for that cash. What about my share of your profits? Plenty of time for that, Mike. Plenty of time. 
Uh, wait and see how much I profit. I ought to get a share of the claim. Maybe you will, Mike. Maybe you will. I'll think it over. You're a good man, a big help to me. Yes, sir. Uh, what are you going to do now? Take over the mine. Hmm? Huh? Yep. Now is the time I get paid off. I don't see how you figure to do it. That's the difference between us, Mike. That's why I'm a planner and you ain't nothing but a worker. But all you done was lend them enough cash to work the place for a time. Sure. Well, how does that give you the claim? I got a mortgage on it. Shucks. All he has to do is pay back what he owes you. You'll be able to do that easy. How? Just tell me how. Why, from his gold. What gold? He ain't got none yet, has he? No, but he will have. I told you to let me know as soon as the mother load was in sight. Yeah. All right. Now we know the mine is good, don't we? Sure. Now we know it's worth me buying in for the couple of hundred dollars I let him take. Gosh, yes. Very well. If it hadn't have been worthwhile, I'd let him keep it and owe me the money. Collect from him some other way. Now, however... I want that mine. But I don't see how... The paper he signed promises to pay me my cash on demand. Yeah? I'm a lawyer, see? I've got that paper all signed by him in front of reliable witnesses. Ain't my fault if he don't read what he signed. Now, tomorrow, the claim will be mine. How come? Because I'm demanding that cash the first thing in the morning. And the agreement calls for the money to be paid in paper currency. Savvy that? He can't rush the work on the mine, get gold and pay me off. Not on your life. It's got to be folded money. I'll give him till midnight tomorrow night to pay it. My agreement says he's to have 12 hours notice. And that's all he gets. 12 hours. There ain't a chance to get the gold refined in that time. This ain't nothing to getting all the cash here for you. I know it. <laughs> so he can't pay. And then he... Sure, he turns the mine over to me. Pretty slick. I own it, you see. Being as I own it, he can't work it no more. Hold on, Mr. Nelson. Well? Your scheme won't work. What's the reason it won't? Rod Ramsey. Who? Ramsey. He's a gambler from Beecham's Old Diggin'. Well, what about him? He's visited Andy. He's got considerable cash. What about it? He might buy up Andy's mortgage from you. Can't buy what I won't sell, can he? He might let Andy Beecham borrow the money. Oh, no. That wouldn't work, neither. I'm a lawyer, I tell you. I draw that agreement up in good shape. But how will you get around it if Beecham gets cash from Ramsey and pays you? Easy. The agreement states that the cash has to be paid with profits from the mine. Oh. <laughs> Savvy? And he can't do that till he gets profits. Hardly. So you got him beat any way he turns. Yes, so. <laughs> Tomorrow, Mike, I'll take over the Beecham claim. And I got a share of it coming to me? Wouldn't surprise me none of you had, Mike. <laughs> You're a good man. A good man for me to have around. <laughs> The curtain falls on the first act of tonight's thrilling Lone Ranger drama. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. You will recall that in the first act of tonight's Lone Ranger drama, Andy Beecham told his friend Rod Ramsey that he had borrowed money from Mark Nelson to work his claim. Tonto, following Mike and his hired man, learned that he was secretly working for the moneylender. Tonto learned also that Nelson planned to foreclose the mortgage he held on the mine and that Beecham was almost sure to lose his claim. The Indian reported these facts to the Lone Ranger, and as our second act opens, we see the masked man and his companion riding toward the Beecham home later the same night. You didn't learn where Nelson kept that paper, did you, Tonto? No. That's too bad. I'd like to have a look at it. Uh-huh. However, we can be pretty sure the paper's just what Nelson said it was. He's too shrewd to leave a loophole for Beecham. That's right. There's one man who might be able to help us, though... Who that? Rod Ramsey. I'm going to see him right now. Him sleep in Beecham House? Yes. I think he'll be glad to see us. <laughs> Why do you laugh? <laughs> him plenty glad to see you. You save him life. Stop here. Who's over? Oh, I tell him. Oh. 
Stay here with the horses, Kimasabi. I'll go the rest of the way on foot. Uh, me, me wait. What the? Quiet, Ramsey. That, that voice. Keep your voice down. There's no need to awaken the Beecham's. Friend, the one man I wanted to speak to. I've kept my word to you. That means a lot to me, Ramsey. Look, I came here to ask your help. Whatever it is I can do for you, count on it. Thanks. I want you to help me save the Beecham's gold mine and put a schemer where he belongs. Save it? What's the matter with it? The mother load is right at the surface now. But Beecham is due to lose his claim tomorrow. How's that? Steady, Ramsey. How can he lose it? It's his, ain't it? Tonight it's his. But tomorrow, Mark Nelson plans to foreclose the mortgage on it. Why, that... If Andy Beecham could have a week or so of time, he'd be able to pay off that mortgage. But he won't have. Just tell me what I can do, that's all. Keep away from this house tomorrow. Let Nelson do just what he wants. Beecham will have until midnight tomorrow. Before then, you'll do your part. Rod Ramsey listened to the Lone Ranger and agreed to do as he was directed. He left the home of his friend the next morning without explanation. And we hear Andy and Mary as they try to account for Rod's sudden departure. I can't figure why he left so sudden, Mary. It's got me beat. I'm sure I don't know, Andy. We didn't offend him, did we? Not so I know of. Maybe that's him come back again. I'll go see. Howdy. Oh, why, Mr. Nelson. I'll step right in if you don't mind. Come along, Sheriff Purdy. Howdy, Beecham. Uh, hello, Sheriff Purdy. We don't get to see you very frequent. I reckon not. I trust everything's all right with you, Sheriff. So, so. I'm here, Beecham, to call your attention to a paper signed by you and witnessed by the Sheriff and a deputy. Oh, that. Sure. I'm hoping to be able to pay you off real soon, Nelson. I figured uh, I'd hit pay dirt long for this. But can't be much longer now. No, Beecham, you're right. It can't be much longer now. In fact, it can't be later than midnight. You don't mean tonight. That's exactly what I mean. You promised to pay my money on demand, Beecham. And so I'm here with Sheriff Purdy as a witness to make that demand. But gosh, Mr. Nelson, if if you'd just give me a little more time, I'm I... I'm sorry, but I can't do it. I'll have to have the cash by midnight or I'll take over the mine. And remember... This house goes with it. He can't do that, can he, Sheriff? I'm afraid he can, Beecham. No, but I... And that ain't all. The paper calls for the cash to be paid from the profits of the mine and handed over in paper currency. Don't forget that. You... You mean after... After all the work here, we gotta lose our gold claim? You was willing enough to take my terms when you needed cash money. Now live up to them. Huh, Mr. Nelson. Well? Suppose I strike the pay dirt today. Then I could fetch the gold to you, couldn't I? No, sir. The agreement states I'm to be paid in paper currency. Uh, suppose I can borrow the paper money somewhere? Won't go. Gotta be profits from your claim. That's what the agreement says. Then the whole thing was just a scheme to take our claim away from us. Call it what you remind her. Only pay up before midnight or hand over the deed to the property. I've given notice. That's all I'm required to do, ain't it, Sheriff? I reckon so, Nelson. But I'd call it a doggone ornery trick. It ain't for you to call it anything. You just see that the law is enforced. That's all you gotta do. I look for you by midnight, Beecham. You got twelve hours. Come on, Purdy. Good day to you. Oh, Andy. Swindled. Bunk clean out of our mind. Oh, Mary, I've been a fool. I've been a doggone trusting fool. I never thought them terms was like that. I... I don't see anything you can do, Andy. There ain't a thing I can do. Not a thing. He's got me licked. Not yet. Who was that? There at the window. A masked man. You're not licked yet. Huh? Your friend Rod Ramsey's going to help you. Uh, where is he? Who are you? Never mind that. Now just listen to what I tell you. The Lone Ranger explained his plan to old Andy Beecham, and the hopes of the miner rose higher as he listened. He knew what the masked man had done for Ramsey, and he had faith that he too would be helped. 
It is night. And Rod Ramsey stands before the door of Nelson's house. Well? Nelson? Yeah? I'm here to have a little talk with you. What about? I'll step inside if you don't mind. I do mind. Well, it's too late. I'm already inside. What do you want here? Just came Nelson to tell you that you ain't a chance of getting Beecham's mind. What's that? You see, before he has to pay the cash to you, you got to show him the paper he signed. That's the law, ain't it? I'll show him the paper all right enough. That paper is Beecham's note, and uh, you got to return that note when he pays the cash. Let him show the cash. He won't need to, because you see, Nelson, you don't have the note. Who says so? I'm saying so. What more do you want? Blast you. You look like you knowed what you were saying. I should. You can't know. I put that paper away safe. I'll produce it when the time comes. Uh-uh, no, Don't no, shake no, your no. head that way. You remember what Mike said? Huh? He wanted to share the claim. Well, I... You wouldn't make no promises to him, and he knows you for a double-dealing rat. You mean... Mike's looking out for himself, the same as you are. He knows Andy Beecham's an honest hombre. He knows that Beecham is on the level. If that dirty coyote sold me out... You don't think I'd come here and bluff you, do you? I, I don't know. How could I benefit by it? You know where you put the paper. You can find out soon enough if I'm bluffing. Go on, Nelson. Call me. I'll have the law on Mike. If he stole that paper, he'll go to jail for life. I'll soon know. I'm afraid it isn't there, Nelson. You stand where you are. Hold on. Don't make a move. Put that gun down, you crazy fool. Stand still. I ain't taking no chances. I'm standing still. You needn't think you're going to try and steal this paper. You won't find it. We'll see. Ain't there, Nelson. Besides, you ain't the nerve to shoot a man anyhow. They'd hang you for it. Stand still now. Don't you make no fast move. The paper was right here in my desk. Better make sure it's still there. You can't collect without it. If it ain't, I'll throw Mike into jail. What's the matter? Can't you find it? Uh, there it is. <laughs> That's a funny one. Uh, here it is. This is the mortgage and the note and the whole thing. Better make sure it's a real thing and not a fake. It's the real and all right enough. Well, there's the names of the sheriff and the deputy all signed to it. Now what have you got to say? You better have it with you when Beecham comes, because I understand he's been getting profits from his mind. I'll have it all right. I'll... Well, what the... Who shot that lamp out? Who's here? Look out, Nelson. You might get hurt. Someone's in this room. Out of my way, Nelson. Who are you? Stop. Stop, thief. Get a light. Where's the match? Here's another lamp. I got a match here. Hurry up. Someone's here. He shut me aside. Now, there's your lamp. Now, stop your yelling like that. Where is he? Where's he going? Let me get a shot at him. Looks like he went out the window the same way he came in. Them papers. Them papers is gone. He stole them. My mortgage. My claim on Beecham's mine. Yeah, they're sure gone completely, Nelson. And look, there's something on the table in place of them. A bullet. What's this? What's this mean? A bullet. A silver bullet. I know. <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> oh, golly, that's a good one. Stop laughing. <laughs> I'll have the law on him. You're in on it, too. I really didn't know why I was to show you the poker face and talk like I did, but I see it now. You brought out the paper and the masked man took him. It was Beecham. <laughs> it was Beecham that done it. I'll have the law. I'll get the sheriff. I'll jail Beecham for life. Stop your noise and see who's at the door. Never mind. Come right in. We want to know what all the yelling is about. Sheriff! Sheriff Purdy! Arrest Beecham! He stole... Hold on, Nelson. Beecham! What are you saying about Beecham? He stole the papers! He stole papers from me! That ain't so. When is he supposed to have done that? Just now! Just a minute ago! Uh, You're loco. Looks like your greed is finally touched in the head. Andy Beecham has been with me for the past hour. We've been on our way here to see you. According to my figuring, he's still got time to pay you that there cash money. I don't want it. I won't take it. Oh, yes, you will. You take it and turn over them papers according to the agreement. But I... He ain't got the papers. <laughs> They're gone. Gone? They were stolen. Well, that puts a new light on things. You can't expect Andy to pay you the cash without you handing over his notes, can you? He hasn't got the cash for mine, profits. I'll take his claim. Oh, I reckon not. You ain't the only one that knows the law around here, Nelson. But I tell you, the papers were stolen. Hmm, you got a witness to that? Or maybe you're just using that as a stall because you ain't got no papers. Sure, I got a witness. This man was right here at the time. 
You seen that man come in and steal the papers? Sorry, Nelson, but I didn't see a dog on thing. Why? That's the truth, Sheriff. I didn't see a thing. All right. You show the papers, Nelson. You get your cash money. Profit from Beecham's claim in paper currency, just like what the contract calls for. Me speak. Oh, 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 hey, oh, oh, me speak now. Go ahead. How long take feller get paper money? Well, now that I've found the mother load showing, I ought to have the fold money in a couple of weeks. Oh, maybe then paper come back. <laughs> Looks like you'll get your papers back, Nelson, when it's a mite more convenient for Andy to pay up. I've been cheated! I've been robbed! Come on, Andy. There's nothing I can do if Nelson ain't no witnesses. Gosh. Yeah. I'm doggone glad it's worked out like this, Andy. That old skin flint got what is coming to him. Mike confessed that he was working for Nelson all along, aiming to cross you up. Yeah, but Sheriff, this bag I said uh, had cash in it, uh, uh, just between you and me, there ain't no cash. Uh, just yet. <laughs> Andy, uh, just between you and me, who the Sam Hill cares? Oh! Oh! Come on there, Silver Old Boy. We're heading for the coast. Hello, Silver! Slaughter's my name. Luke Slaughter. Cattle's my business. It's a tough business. It's a big business. I got a big stake in it. And there's no man west of the Rio Grande big enough to take it from me. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, Civil War cavalryman turned Arizona cattleman. Across the territory from Yuma to Fort Defiance, from Flagstaff to the Huachucas, and below the border through Chihuahua and Sonora, his name was respected or feared, depending on which side of the law you were on. Man of vision, man of legend, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. It was a long, hot ride to Laredo. The last day I pushed it hard, eating dust all the way. I didn't know if I'd be in time or not. But when I rode up to the cantina in town and went inside, I saw I was, barely in time. The two of them were sitting at a corner table... From the sound of it, the deal was just about closed. Me and my boys will bring that herd up across the border for you in good shape. Hell, I hope so, Hancock. The association's pretty worried about all the trouble we've had on these drives before. Excuse me, gents. You Ben Wilkins? Why, yes. President of the Cattlemen's Association? Yes, that's right. I don't think I know you. Look, mister, we're talking business. That's why I'm here, Hancock. How come you know my name? Wilkins, I understand you're aiming to bring a herd of cattle up from Mexico into Texas. Well, what's that to you? You're missing a good bet. Why don't you drive them west, to Arizona? Arizona? That's right. Haven't you heard about the new mines opening up around Tombstone? Everybody and his brother's headed out there, and they all gotta eat. That means a good market for beef. A lot better price than you get around here. He's crazy, Wilkins. That's too far to drive a herd. Hell, it's sure too dangerous anyway. Why, there's banditos, rustlers, even Indians, maybe. I took a herd out there last month. There wasn't near enough to take care of all those beef-eating miners. I'll drive your herd out there for you, for a percentage. Now, you just shut that big mouth of yours, mister, whoever you are. I'm the one drives Wilkins' herds, wherever they go. Oh. Wilkins, you can't afford Jess Hancock anymore. No, what do you mean? A... The last herd he brought across the border for you. How many did he, uh... Lose along the way. Why, 43 head. Could have happened to anyone. Banditos, that's what it was. Mexican bandits, huh? Here's a bill of sale might interest you, Wilkins. 
Seems last week a rancher named Hollister bought 43 head in good faith. Paid for him proper. Man who sold him was Jess Hancock. What? That's a lie. Take a look, Wilkins. That Hancock signature. What? It sure is. Nobody's gonna accuse me of wrestling. Don't try it, Hancock. I can kick that gun out of your hand before you get it loose from the holster. You just try it, man. You convinced, Hancock. Who are you, mister? Slaughter. Luke Slaughter. Oh, I've heard of you, Mr. Slaughter, but I didn't know you was in these parts. You don't have to mister me, Wilkins. Just slaughter's good enough. Hancock, the association's going to hear about this. If those are the same 43... You got no proof. We'll see about that. Slaughter, you said Arizona, huh? A lot of hungry miners in Tombstone. Bigger price, huh? Half again as much. Meet me back here in an hour. You got yourself a job. I'll be here, Wilkins. Uh, You hear me, Slaughter. I don't care what your reputation is. You ain't gonna beat me out of this. I'll stop you. Here I am, Hancock. And now's as good a time as any. Go ahead. Yeah, you can talk mighty tall with my gun laying there on the floor. Oh, yeah. Your gun. There it is, Hancock. And I'm just as far from that table it's sitting on as you are. Now go ahead. There's, uh... There's other ways, Slaughter. There's other ways. Now, look, Slaughter, when you signed for this job, you guaranteed me six good trail hands. Well, I didn't know you were just going to pick them cold out of the bar here. That's the difference, Wilkins. If they're not good hands now, they will be by the time we get to Tombstone. I'll see to that. Yeah, I guess you will. How many you got so far? Two Mexican boys who know the country pretty well, and a cook. It still leaves you three shy. I'll get them. Say, mister, your name's Slaughter? Yeah, Mine's Rusty. I hear you're looking for trail hands. Maybe. You ever been to Tombstone? Not with a herd. Didn't know anybody had. This will be the second. But I've been almost every place else you can take a herd, I guess. Dodge City, Cheyenne, the Panhandle, you name it. All right, I'll take you. Uh, you the one that's hiring, mister? That's right. But you look a little old for the drive I've got in mind. Tombstone's a long way. Don't worry about that, none. I'll keep up. What's your name? They call me Wichita. All right, Wichita, you're on. Got room for one more, Slaughter? Who are you, son? Name's Carson. Jim Carson. You ever ridden trail before? No, but I don't figure it'd be too tough. Besides, Slaughter, I come in handy when there's trouble. Oh? How about when there's work? I'll work. I need the money. I want to buy me a gun. You already got a gun. I want to get me another one. All right, I'll put you on. You say your name was Jimmy? It's not Jimmy, it's Jim. I don't like being called Jimmy. Go get your stuff together, Jimmy. I guess you didn't hear me, Slaughter. I said I don't like being called... You want to come along or don't you? I want to come. Then get moving, Jimmy. I don't like that one, Slaughter. He's on the prod. Could be, Wilkins. I take a chance with him, then. I don't want any trouble with this herd. Now, just a minute, Wilkins. I didn't guarantee no trouble. Matter of fact, I'd be surprised if there wasn't. I guarantee just one thing, to bring that herd through. That you can count on. Oh, I have seen young punks like him before, Slaughter. They go around with a chip on their shoulder trying to show how tough they are. He probably heard about you. What about me, Wichita? Oh, no offense. You've got a kind of reputation, that's all. Punk like that, sooner or later, he'll probably want to find out how tough you are. <laughs> Maybe. I heard him shooting off his mouth at the bar earlier about how he'd gunned down a couple of men here and there. Oh? I bet he's awful green on the trail, though. You can show him the ropes, Rusty. Maybe the trail will take some of the toughness out of him. Anyway, I need what men we can get. He goes with us. You're the boss. Where are we heading from here? Delgada. Little town below the border. That's where we pick up the herd. When we leaving? Soon as we saddle up. Tonight? Yeah. 
We should be able to hit the trail with the cattle tomorrow afternoon. Make a few miles toward Tombstone before dark. Well, what's the hurry? There's a man named Jess Hancock wouldn't mind making a little trouble for me. I want that herd all in one piece. To start with, anyway. Pretty good-looking herd, Rusty. Yeah, but no herd's worth pounding leather like we did all the way down here to Delgada. Slaughter said he wanted to make it by this afternoon. He did. Where is he, anyway? Signing the papers over there at the pens. I don't see why we can't hang around town tonight, leave in the morning. Well, why not take it up with the boss? Here he comes. You think you're pretty funny, don't you, Wichita? (laughs) Just once in a while, son. Well, I guess we're all ready. Rusty, how about the cook? Oh, he's got all the grub loaded in the chuck wagon, ready to roll. Good. Senor? Senor? What? You're Slaughter? Yeah, who are you? I'm Carlota. You are going to Arizona? Yeah, Tombstone. Why? Take me with you. What? I want to get away from this place. I want to go to Arizona. Please take me with you. Sorry. What are you doing here, Carlotta? Come on, back to the cantina where you belong. Well, well, Jess Hancock. How come you're down here? This is my stamping ground, Slaughter. Or was. I ain't forgot. I didn't figure you had. First you take my job, now you try to take my girl. Just a minute, Hancock. Don't get things any more twisted up than you can help. Get moving, Carlotta. You leave me alone. Get out! I hope you have a real pleasant trip to Tombstone, Slaughter. I better have. Getting pretty dark, Slaughter. Don't you reckon we'd better get that herd bedded down for the night? A little further. You've been avoiding the regular trail. Expecting trouble? I usually do, Wichita. I've been watching you around horses, Slaughter. Been thinking you was in the cavalry. Oh? I heard about a man named Slaughter once. Commanded a regiment from Illinois in the war. Yeah? Raiders, they was. Used to raid across the line. This Slaughter I heard about... He always used to come back leading a string of Confederate horses with their saddles empty. I've been thinking you're the same slaughter. And I've been thinking you're a pretty nosy old man. (laughs) Yep, that's me. (laughs) Well, this is far enough. Rusty, go bed down here. Right. Wichita, that chuck wagon of ours. I just saw the tarp move. There's somebody inside. Yeah, I saw two. All right, Carlotta. Get out of there. Please, senor, I want to go to Tombstone. You picked the wrong way. But you don't send me back now. It's night. It's wild country. You wouldn't do that, would you? You counted on that, didn't you? All right. You'll go with us. Gracias. But you'll earn your way. You'll help the cook. You'll clean up after him. You'll wash the dishes. Work me like a horse, huh? Or worse. Maybe you like the horses better. There's one big difference. I invited the horses. After we bedded down the herd, the cook wrestled up some grub. Carlotta was plenty sullen, but she worked. Jimmy kept eyeing her, so I figured I'd better put him on night herd. I turned in around midnight. Everything was peaceful. But it didn't stay that way very long. Slaughter, you hear that? Yeah, where'd they come from? Well, I don't know, but it's got the herd riled up. There they go. They stampeding, Slaughter. They stampeding. In a moment, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone returns. Somebody ought to set Jack Benny straight about how to make a movie because he's at it again. When you join him later on today, CBS Radio's misguided matinee idol will attempt his own version of a famous movie. To make it even better, Hollywood producer Stanley Kramer, who made the movie, will be right there when he does. For a hilarious example of how not to make a motion picture, hear the Jack Benny Show later today on most of these same stations. Henry Morgan and Mitch Miller will be around following Jack Benny. Henry Morgan is host on the fast and funny guessing game, Says Who?, 
His star-studded panel of experts spark one laugh after another as they try to identify memory-teasing mystery voices. And speaking of stars, you'll find an hour of fast and funny conversation with the biggest name stars of Hollywood and Broadway waiting for you on CBS Radio's Mitch Miller Show tonight. And now, Act Two of William N. Robeson's production of Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. Wichita, turn him in! We gotta get him turned to Miller! You are getting too close, Slaughter! Jerry, rest him over there! I can't turn the bunch in the lead! Slaughter! Watch out! They'll run you down! Yeah! Yeah, get around! Just ah. head off that lead steer! Right! Kick Miller. That's it. Let's get him slow. Whoa. Whoa, Barbara. Yeah. I was close, Wichita. Yeah. I thought I'd seen everything, Slaughter. But I guess I was wrong. What do you mean? Well, riding into that herd the way you did. You know a better way to turn him? You could have been run down, killed. Maybe. Jimmy, come out over here. Look, look, Slaughter, up on the ridge. Small fire. Could be Indians. We'll go up and take a look in a minute. What do you want, Slaughter? Those two shots that started the stampede. Sounded like they came from over near where you were. You fire those shots, Jimmy? I said, did you fire those shots? Yeah. Why? I thought I saw something moving in the dark near me. Figured it could be trouble. So you just hauled up and blasted away, huh? Pretty spooky with that six gun of yours, aren't you? I tell you, I thought someone was coming at me. You almost cost us the whole herd. You want two of those guns, but one's too much for you. I'm taking your six gun, Jimmy. No, you ain't, Slaughter. I'll leave you your rifle in case you run into trouble on the way to Tombstone. But I can't take any more chances on that itchy trigger finger of yours. I'll hand it over. Ain't nobody gonna take my gun away from me. I'll... I'll draw on you before I let you. No, you won't. I... Maybe you ain't heard about them two men I gunned, Slaughter. I hear you were shooting off your mouth about it in the saloon, but I don't believe it, Jimmy. You never gunned a man. And you're not gonna start now. Now hand it over. But first... I... Let's have it. All right. Now get back to the herd. Yeah, you've taken a lot away from that kid, Slaughter. First calling him Jimmy, and now taking his gun. I had no choice. Uh, even so, you cut him up, and he won't forget it. You're trying to be my conscience or something, Wichita. No, oh, like you say, I'm just a nosy old man. <laughs> <laughs> then let's go nose around that fire up on the ridge. There's some dirt on that fire, Wichita. Get it out. All right. Uh, nobody around here. You know, this could be a signal fire. Think it was Indians at Lidditch? I doubt it. I think it was intended as a signal for Jess Hancock, so he could locate the herd. You suggesting somebody in our outfit set off the fire? Could be. But the stampede, we was all there. The fire could have been lit just before the stampede. You say somebody in the outfit, uh, that it include me? Yeah. Right now, Wichita, there's only one person in the outfit I'm sure of. Who's that? Me. I tell you, I didn't start the fire slaughter. I wouldn't help Hancock. I told you I want to get away from him. I know that's what you told me, Carlotta. But you don't believe me. You think I'm still Hancock's girl? Why don't you trust me? Why don't you be nice to me, huh? Maybe I could be your muchacha. Sorry. Right now my job's riding herd on cattle, not women. Oh, would you make me sick? You don't care about nobody but yourself. Is she right, Slaughter? What? <laughs> oh, Wichita. I might have known you'd be listening. Yep. 
Well, Slaughter, the herd's quieted down. Two Mexican boys are keeping an eye on it. Did Carlotta admit anything? No. I wouldn't trust her any. I don't, Rusty. You want us for anything more, or can we turn in? In a minute. I want to lay out the plans for tomorrow. I think we're in for some trouble. How so? Well, we've got two possible routes through the country ahead, Rusty. Through a narrow pass or along the river bottom. The question is, which way to take the herd? You expecting to be dry gulched? I wouldn't be surprised, Jimmy. Yeah, that narrow pass would be the logical place for a bushwhacking. Why not take the herd through along the river bottom? Well, there's one thing wrong with that, Rusty. Hey, it could be just what Hancock wants you to do. Right. He might be trying to outfigure me. There's a lot of willows and underbrush along that river bottom. He could be holed up there. That's why we're going to take the herd through the pass. We'll start right after sunup. I didn't know if my bluff would work or not. It was the only way I could find out who Hancock's spy was. I rode away from camp toward the herd. Whoever it was, I had to give him a chance to make a move. And it didn't take long. Pretty soon I heard muffled hooves moving away. I rode back to camp and took a look. It was rusty. He was gone. Carlotta's gone too, Slaughter. I guess she wasn't so anxious to get away from Hancock as she let on. So Rusty's gone to tell him that we're bringing the herd through the pass. It's just what I wanted him to do. Unless he knows this country a lot better than I do, he's going to lead me right to Hancock. You're going after him? Yeah. They should give me the slip. We're going to be in for some trouble. What do you want us to do? Split the outfit in two, Wichita. Take half the herd through the pass, the other half through the river bottom. Be ready for trouble, especially in the pass. Let me take the pass, Slaughter. You, uh, you sure you want to? Yeah, real sure. And I think I can handle it. I think you can, too. Oh, and, uh, you might be needing that six-gun of yours. Here it is, Jim. Thanks. Luke? <laughs> Slaughter will do. Get moving at sunup. Join up on the other side and wait for me. I picked up Rusty's trail. He was headed for the ridge between the pass and the river bottom. He was getting light when I reached a shortcut where I could gain some ground on him. But I gained too much. Just as I got back to the trail again, a horse came pounding around the bend carrying Rusty and Carlotta. He pulled up when he spotted me and shoved Carlotta off. Get off! Then I saw he'd been holding a gun on her. His slug burned my shirt as I dove at him. Uh. Slaughter, you... You all right, Carlotta? I think so. Rusty made me go with him. He was taking me back to Hancock. Ah! It came from those rocks up above there. Take cover. All right. Oh, I can't walk. My ankle is twisted. All right. All right. I'll carry you. Get her up behind this rock. You'll be all right. There. Sit here. You'll be safe now. I was wrong about you, Slaughter. What do you mean? You do care about somebody beside yourself. Gracias. It's got to be Hancock up there in those rocks. Here, take my rifle and stay put. I'm going to try and circle around behind him. There was a big shoulder of rock above me and to my left. If I could get around that, I might be able to get behind Hancock if he didn't hear me coming. There he was. Twenty yards away. His back to me. His gun in the holster so he could get a better handhold as he edged his way along the rocks. I holstered my own gun and stepped out into the clear. Hancock! Slaughter. Yeah. Here I am, Hancock. Now go ahead. Draw. <laughs> like it, Wichita. Slaughter should have been here by now. He'll be long, Jim. Well, maybe we ought to head up there and see if we can find him. He could be in trouble. He said wait for him here. Well, even so, maybe... Here we... he is, coming up the draw. Carlotta's with him. Ain't that uh, Rusty's horse that she's riding? Yeah. And Slaughter's leading another one. Uh-huh. With an empty saddle. Heard all right. Yeah, all in one piece, no trouble. 
But it uh, looks like you had some. A little. That horse you're leading, is it Hancock's? It was. I knew you could outdraw him. Matter of fact, the draw was about even. But how come you... Jim, you got a couple of things to learn. It isn't getting your gun out of your holster that's the most important thing. It's what you do with it once it's out. <laughs> you figure Hancock was after the herd or after Carlotta? I didn't take time to ask him which Wichita. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, starring Sam Buffington. Written by Robert Stanley, with editorial supervision by Tom Hanley, and directed by William N. Robeson. Supporting Mr. Buffington in the first of this new series were Lillian Bieff, Eddie Marr, Herb Vigran, Sam Edwards, Junius Matthews, and Vic Perrin. Next week at this time, we return with... Slaughter's the name. Luke Slaughter. When we meet up again, you can call me that. Luke Slaughter. You must be proud of yourself, mister. You've turned your son into a killer. And he's going to enjoy the same kind of life you have, if he lives long enough. Have Gun, Will Travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel. Headquarters of a man called Paladin. Mr. Paladin, here is a brandy you order. Thank you, hey boy. Just set it down. I... Uh... Mr. Paladin, wine stewards say this brandy very special, also very expensive. Oh. Mm. Very palatable. Yes, yeah, so, uh, sake cheaper and faster, but sometimes cause you much trouble. <laughs> you know, hey boy, here in the West, it's water that causes the real trouble. <laughs> oh, no, Mr. Paladin, water. Who ever got into trouble because they drink too much water? Now, listen. This item in today's paper. Benedict, Wyoming. The refusal of a local rancher to permit access to the sole remaining source of water in this drought-stricken area has resulted in the deaths of two men and threatened open warfare. Oh, too bad. Hey, Mr. Paladin, you plan to offer services in interests of drought-stricken area? As a matter of fact, I have a letter to a Mr. Wellman of Benedict, Wyoming. Here, ready to mail. Will you take care of it? Oh, yes. Uh, anything else, Mr. Paladin? Yes. You might bring me another brandy. It was mid-morning when I rode into Benedict. The town was hot, dusty, and quiet. There was a feeling of tension in the air and uneasiness, a waiting for something to happen. I tied my horse to the hitching rail and went into the saloon. What'll it be, mister? Yeah, uh, glass of rye. You might as well fill mine again, Barney. Okay, Jeff. It's hot. Yeah. 
Pretty quiet town. No more than most. You live around here? Yep. How do I get to the Wellman Ranch? Take the North Road, about three miles. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it'll be a dollar. Right. You a friend of the Wellmans? No. Looking for work, then? In a way. So what's going on here? What's What's everyone waiting for? For me to get killed. Yes. Casey just rode into town. Guess the waiting's about done. That squares us, Barney. Maybe I'll see you, mister. He was slender, rangy, maybe 19. Too young for the troubled seriousness in his eyes as he walked out of the saloon. When I got outside, he was already standing in the thick, white dust of the street. Steady. Watching the man advancing toward him. Don't, Casey. There's no sense to this. You want an apology? All right, I apologize. It's no good, Casey. Listen to me, please. You know it. Excuse me, mister. Have to get my horse. You killed that man. I know. Guess the town will have to keep on waiting. There's a job open at the Wellman's now. His. The drought had taken its toll at the Wellman Ranch. The house stood still and desolate in an expanse of bare, scorched earth. I rode into the yard and dismounted. Then I led my horse to the watering trough. It was empty. I tried the hand pump. Huh? Oh. How'd you do, ma'am? Uh, I can let you have a bucket from the kitchen pump if you like. Yeah, I'd appreciate it. It's been a long ride. Just come on in and help yourself. Fine. My name is Paladin. I'm here to see Mr. Wellman. Well, he should he should be back soon. Uh, uh, the pump's by the sink. It'll need priming. Thank you. Mister, uh, yeah? you you just come from town. Yes. Did did anything happen? Uh, man was killed, if that's uh, what you mean. You you know who? His name is Casey, I believe. I understand he worked for you. Oh no, I was afraid when I saw him start away this morning. Jeff did it. Jeff, yes. So senseless, over nothing. And there'll be more. Now, this Jeff didn't want to kill him. He tried to stop him. Oh, boy. Poor Jeff. No, no. Jeff's alive. Martha, Casey's dead. Young Calvert Gun. Who are you? He's, he's Mr. Paladin. He just told me about it. Oh. I passed through Benedict on my way out here. I saw it happen. You're Paladin, huh? Think you can stand up to Calvert? If there's a good reason. That's your job. Get rid of him. Well, I don't think we understand each other. I offered my services to help you get water. Here. This is your card, isn't it? The one you sent me? Yes. Have gun, will travel? That only means one thing as far as I'm concerned, and it's the only reason I hired you. Then we've both made a mistake, Mr. Wellman. I'm not an executioner. Heat rose off the dry, parched earth to hang in the air and sear every breath. I was well on my way back to town when I heard someone coming up behind me fast. Paladin! Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Paladin, wait! Paladin! I'm sorry. I, I was upset about Casey. I... I wasn't thinking straight, but I need your help. We all do. I told you, Wellman, I didn't offer that kind of help. Look, can I talk to you or not? Go ahead. We're desperate, Paladin. Our water holes are dried up. Even our deep wells are going dry. Another week of this and our herds will be buzzard bait. 
Calvert's trying to ruin us. Now, why should a boy like that want to ruin you? A boy? I'm not talking about Jeff. It's his father, Roy Calvert. He owns a six iron over in the valley. Roy Calvert? Yeah. There was a gunfighter by that name. The same man. Bought the ranch here three years ago. Well, what's he done? What's he got to do with your water supply? Well, there's a lake behind his ranch fed by underground springs. It never runs dry. Calvert's land crosses the mouth of the valley. It's the only approach to the lake. Now he's fenced it off, won't let our herds through. Well, there must be some local ordinance about that, an easement, a right-of-way. Yeah, there's nothing like... in writing. Folks just always used the lake whenever there's been a dry spell. Calvert let us through the first year he'd come, but not now. Why not? I don't know. Two weeks ago, Harry Craig got mad, tried to drive his herd through. Young Calvert killed two of his men. Well, his father's turned him into a worse killer than he was himself. I'll tell you right now, Paladin, the only way to break Calvert is to get that boy. What do you really want, Mr. Wellman? Water or Jeff's hide? I want results, fast. All right. I'll get them for you, but in my own way. What are you going to do? Talk with Calvert. At the gateway of the Six Iron Ranch, I wondered if I was heading into trouble. I could hear gunshots. I dismounted and moved toward the sound. When I reached the corner of the barn, I realized it was happening. There was a crudely drawn silhouette of a man on the barn wall. And Roy Calvert was working with his son. That's good, but you're a little late and the second shot hit too high. But I hit him. He'd have been hurt. That's not good enough. How many times do I have to tell you when you fire, every shot's got to kill. Hurt ain't enough. From the armpits to the waist, that's your target. Nowhere else. Good advice if all you want to do is kill him. Who are you? What do you want? Five minutes of conversation. The name's Paladin. Paladin. Yeah, I've heard of you. Did you get that job at the Wellman's? Anybody who works for Wellman has no business here. Anybody who would deprive his neighbors of water has no business being a rancher. So that's it. Can we talk it over? Let me show you something. Then you decide how much there is to talk over. I followed Calvert through the yard and on past the ranch house to a pleasant tree-shaded knoll that overlooked the valley below. He stopped beside a mound of earth marked with a white cross. Here's all I got to say, Paladin. That's my wife's grave. This town put her there. Twenty years we were married. Kind woman she was. Good, patient. Lonely. So lonely. You must have loved her very much. Takes that for a man like you to give up his gun. I turned to this ranch because I wanted her to have a place where she could say hello to somebody and he wouldn't look past her. Or somebody talk to her. Pass the time of day like ordinary folks. The name Calvert was a death sentence to more than 20 men. Did you think he could hide it? Nobody would have known except for Wellman. He found out and... Pass the word around. And she was alone again. Yeah. Gunslinger's wife. Killer's wife. When she took sick, nobody came to call except the doctor. Then she died. I loved her very much. This town killed her. Now I'm going to kill this town. Calvert, the ranchers will drive their way through. They tried it once. It cost him. Maybe next time it'll cost you. Not likely. With Jeff playing my hand. I have more respect for a man who plays his own. Calvert had been hurt. Badly. But now the ranchers in the town were being hurt. Somewhere it had to end. I went back to see Wellman at his place. I found him by the corral, his horse saddled and ready. Well... Calvert gonna let us through? Wellman, I can't undo three years of hate in one afternoon. Calvert told me about his wife. Wife? But what? what do you mean? We never had anything to do with her. I, I know. That's just it. Well, I know if we can't use that lake, we're wiped out. Now, can we get through or not? As of right now, no. And then we'll have to drive our way through, and you take care of the boy. I told you before, I'll do this job my way. Now, if you're working for me, Paladin... I'm going out for a meeting with the other ranchers. If you're with us, get rid of young Calvert. If not, cut out. Mr. Paladin. Mr. 
Allison, wait. You, you're leaving? I can't do this his way. Oh, then he'll go ahead without you, him and the others. Yeah, looks that way. They'll, they'll be fighting and shooting. Men will be killed. Men with wives and family. Mr. Paladin, please. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Wellman. Are you asking me to kill Jeff? I'm asking you to measure one life against many. back here again, Paladin. If you're working for Wellman, sooner or later we'll shoot it out. You've killed three men already, Jeff. Do you have a taste for it now? You think I want to stand out there watching someone come at me like Casey this morning and know I had to kill him? Did you have to? He'd have killed me. That's your excuse this time. What'll it be next? He asked for it over nothing. Jeff, when you set yourself up as the fastest gun, there'll be men making you prove it until the day you can't. Paladin, haven't we had enough talk? This time you listen, Calvert. Wellman's getting the other ranchers together. They're going to drive their way through to the lake. They're going to try, you mean? The herds are going through tomorrow afternoon. I don't think so. I'll see to it myself. I wouldn't if I were you. If you have any objections, I'll be in town all morning. We can settle everything right there. We'll be glad to oblige. You were Jeff. Me. Oh, it's getting easier all the time, isn't it, Jeff? You must be proud of yourself, Calvert. You've turned your son into a killer, and he's going to enjoy the same kind of life you have, if he lives long enough. Back in town, word had got around that Jeff Calvert was riding in to meet me. I waited in the saloon while men spoke in whispers and marked time. Wellman was there, too. Well, you might as well fill mine up again, Barney. I want to tell you, Paladin, I'm sorry about the way I talked yesterday. Wellman, it's late to clear a guilty conscience. If you'd use that word sorry when Calvert's wife died, this wouldn't be necessary. I know that. I did some thinking last night. Mr. Paladin, the Calvert's just rode in town. All right. That squares us, Barney. Well, I hope the show is worth the price. Hello, Paladin. All right, Jeff. Anytime you're ready. It won't be self-defense this time, Jeff. You'll have to draw first. No. No, Paladin, over here. What? Huh? Me. You're, you're pretty good, Paladin. Decided to play your own hand after all, huh, Calvin? Dad, are you all right? Sure. You were wrong, Paladin. I didn't turn my boy into a killer. Let's get him to the doctor, Jeff. Unless we're not finished. We're finished. I got nothing to prove. Could I... I'd like to help. After he sees the doctor, I... I could drive him on home. Calvert... Or maybe we can talk, huh? A little late for that, Wellman. Calvert, when you came here, you expected people to forget the past. Oh, suppose you try it. Let it end. You're right. Wellman, I'd, I'd be much obliged to talk. Hello, hey boy. Oh, Miss Paladin. Oh, too bad. What? What's too bad? You come back, you find San Francisco cold, rainy, fog creeping around everywhere. <laughs> oh, miserable. Oh, what are you talking about, hey boy? This is what I've dreamed of for many a long, hot, dusty mile. Oh, oh, then very good. 
Hey, you look at time, Mr. Paladin. Something I can do for you? It sure is, hey, boy. Nice, big pitcher of ice water. Have Gun, Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Norman MacDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Albert Alley and adapted for radio by Ann Dowd. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, Virginia Christine, Vic Perrin, Harry Cook, and Harry Bartell. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week when CBS Radio presents Have Gun, Will Travel. you'll hear James Stewart as the Six Shooter, just one of many fine programs brought to you each week on NBC. Tomorrow night, there's top comedy entertainment with the Bob Hope Show, the Phil Harris, Alice Faye Show, and Can You Top This with Senator Ford. Bob Hope delivers rapid-fire comedy routines while Phil Harris and Alice Faye bring both mirth and music. It's a great Friday night lineup of comedy programs, all of them heard only on NBC. James Stewart as the sick shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle, unmarked. People call them both the sick shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as the Six Shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponson, the Texas plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still remembered legends. a Tuesday evening choir practice and quite a spell, but when Reverend Broom stopped by the Tropical Ranch where I was working and asked me if I could manage to take part in this week's rehearsal, well, I sure couldn't see how to do any harm, so I'm bringing in the keys, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the keys. Anyhow, there we are. About ten of us all gathered around. And John Farley's general store it was. You see, the town of Easter Creek didn't have a regular church building yet. 
They held their services and social affairs in the mercantile while they went ahead trying to raise money to put up a community church. It, it was during the second verse of bringing in the sheaves that things started sounding a little peculiar, sort of like the voices and the music were sort of traveling different trails. First, I thought it was me. I never had been exactly what you'd call melodious, but uh, then the other folks were beginning to have their troubles, too. And I, Holy smoke, it just was getting terrible. And finally, Mrs. Peebles, she was the organist. She just threw up her hands and stopped even trying to play. I can't go on, Mrs. Bloom. I simply can't. No, no, Elvira. No, that's right. I've done my best. But this organ just won't play anymore. Well, we'll have Mr. Farley take another look at it, Elvira. I'm sure he'll be able to get it back into shape. There's nothing Mr. Farley can do. Or anybody else. It's plain wore out. You can't expect a thing to last forever. Oh, no, no, of course Seems not. Seems to me that after all this time, something could have been done about buying a new organ. When I donated this one to the congregation, I didn't suppose I'd have to go on playing it all the rest of my life. But apparently that's what's expected. Now, of now, me. there's no need to upset yourself, Elvira. Well, I can't help being upset. I, I say I can't help it. How do you think I feel every Sunday? All those sour notes and that wheezing and whining. Folks are beginning to think that it's me, that it's my oh, plan. No, no, no. Well, I've been humiliated for the last time, and I won't go through it again. But, 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 but Elvira, we got to have music for Easter service. Oh, music? Well, you certainly don't call that music, do you? Good night, Reverend Bruce. Oh, All right, everybody. Give me your attention, please. Attention, folks. Quiet down now, please. Quiet down. It appears that matters have come to a serious crisis. It's bad enough for a town by the name of Easter Creek not to have a proper building for Easter services. But to be without an organ and an organist. Well, it's a disgrace, a positive disgrace. No, now we mustn't blame Miss Peebles. That instrument has seen its best days. There's no doubt about it. So I propose that we take immediate steps to purchase a replacement. Uh, uh, just, uh, just, just one thing, Reverend Boone. Yes, sir. Where's the money coming from? Well, uh, now I've given that matter serious thought, Sheriff Appleton, and there seems to be only one possible solution to the problem. We'll just have to borrow from the building fund. Uh, yeah, now, uh, that's yeah. sort of like robbing Peter to pay Paul, isn't it? No, no, not exactly, not exactly. Seeing as how we haven't reached our thousand dollar goal anyway, well, the money's just sort of lying there. Uh, yeah. No, I don't know about that. Uh, just how much do you figure a new organ will cost, Reverend Brew? Well, I've done some investigating in the field, Mrs. Appleton. Last month, when Elvira's foot went through the pump pedal, it seemed like the situation was coming to head. The church over to Whitefield purchased a new organ just last Christmas, and uh, they're willing to sell us their old one. Uh, it's used, of course, but it's still in excellent repair. And they're only asking $95. Right. Oh, no, no, no. I'm afraid that's a bit more than we can afford, Reverend. We must have at least $95 in the building fund. We've been putting money aside for the last year. No, no, we ain't. We got forty two fifty. That's the total. Up to and including three dollars sixty five in the cake bazaar a month ago. Forty two fifty. Yep. Oh, I just had no idea I was We're certain. shy over fifty dollars from what it would take to buy the organ. And there just isn't any way we could raise it. Not between now and Easter. No, no, no. We mustn't give up. After all, we only need um the fifty dollars. No, uh, fifty two fifty. Yeah, yes, exactly. Well, let's see. There was just someone who could take a firm grip of the situation. A man who... Mr. Ponson. Uh, yes, yes, Reverend. Uh, uh, Mr. Ponson, I know you aren't a regular member of our congregation, and, and you've only been in our midst a few months. But, well, I, uh, sure would be glad to donate what I can to the cause, Reverend, but I'm afraid there's going to be a drop in the bucket. Oh, a donation wasn't exactly what I had in mind. Oh? I think perhaps you can be of more service in another fashion. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I propose that we appoint Britt Ponson, a committee of one to take charge of the organ raising. Well, oh, now, hold on a minute here, Reverend Brown. We all know that, that you're a man of strength and determination, Mr. Ponson. That you inspire confidence. And we trust generosity. Well, now, I, I'd sure like to oblige you folks, but what you're asking it was just out of the question. That's all. You wouldn't turn us down in our hour of need. Oh, no, I'm not turning you down exactly. What I mean is, I... It just couldn't be done. Why, you've been a whole year raising forty-two fifty, and now you're talking about raising over fifty dollars in just a few days. Well, we've been going at it the wrong way, I'm Mr. Sorry. Potts. What? I'm sure your approach will be one hundred percent more effective. My approach? Why, but certainly. And just to show you how easy it'll be, we'll start things off by taking up a collection right now. Sheriff Appleton, will you pass the hat? But the uh, uh, all right, everybody. Dig down deep. It's a wonderful thing Mr. Ponsett's doing in taking over this fundraising campaign. But I never said and a word. And here's our chance to let him know how Reverend. much we appreciate it. Reverend. Well, the sheriff finished passing the hat and poured it out on the table. And Reverend Broom counted it. Two dollars and fifty cents. And you know, the Reverend was real pleased, too. He said that that meant that I only had $50 to go. A nice round number. Well, not that I had any intention of taking this job of raising the money to get the new organ, you understand. I told the Reverend I couldn't do it. I told him just as plain as day that I couldn't do it. But somehow he got the idea that I had already agreed to do it. And no matter how hard I talked, he just kept... Uh, and the uh, other folks, they... They were as bad as Reverend Broom. They I was just outnumbered. That's all it was to it. So, early the next morning, I took my hat in my hand and started out. Um, must have been getting around noon when I finally came back to the sheriff's office. Oh, come in, Bet. Come in. Good morning, Abner. Oh, well, how's everything going? You you've been out collecting? Yeah, yeah, I've been collecting. Well, well, eleven dollars. That's what I got so far. Hey, eleven dollars, huh? That's mm-hmm. remarkable, Brett. Simply remarkable. But the trouble is, I've already asked everybody in town. Uh huh. Except you, that is. Oh. Oh well, I, I suppose I could give you a dollar, but don't forget, I was in on the collection at Clarefax. You ain't serious, Britt. You, you don't mean you really ask everybody else. I, as a matter of fact, there is one area I sort of skipped over. Oh? Well, there's those cabins over east of the creek and the ranches out that way. I I haven't visited them yet. Right. Well, hey, just be wasting your time if you did. I would. I... Yeah, those folks wouldn't be very anxious to help out at church. Mess of thieves, cattle wrestlers, every other kind of riffraff. Oh, is that what they are? Oh. Oh, well, now, that's just the general senses of opinion. And of course, if I could know for certain that we had any actual outlaws living around Easter Creek, if I was positive, that is, well, it'd be my duty to arrest them. I see. Uh-huh. But the fact is, they ain't caused any trouble here in town, none of them. I can't go around arresting people on rumors. Well, can I, Britt? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I understand Red-Eyed Kirk has a place somewhere east of town, doesn't he? That's hearsay, Brett, oh. doing simple hearsay. Oh, I see. Why, you don't think I'd let a notorious gunfighter like Red-Eye live right here under my nose, do you? Well, it's too bad he's out in these parts. Oh? No, I was thinking I might like to pay him a little visit. Well, what on earth for? Well, as long as he's not in the neighborhood, I guess it doesn't matter. Kind of a shame, though. Oh, well, now, if you're really anxious to... Uh, what I mean is... Oh, but they do say there's a fellow who somewhat resembles Red Eye. He's got himself a cabin just this side of Deer Mountain. Just this side of Deer Mountain, huh? Hey, uh, now, well, wait a minute, Red. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, what in Sunday do you want to get mixed up with Red Eye Kirk for? What's he got to do with raising money for a new organ? Well, a... Probably won't have anything to do with it, but it's just that I don't want to leave any stones unturned, you see. Go on, Emma. Hey, 
was about a half hour's ride out to the cabin Sheriff Applin told me about. Not much of a cabin, though. Just a shack at the foot of Beer Mountain with a corral off one side. Hmm. There sure were a lot of different brands on the horses in that corral. Well, I pulled up in the yard about 15 feet from the cabin door. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. For a minute, it didn't seem like there was anybody at home. But... And then I heard the door start to creak open. The barrel of a forty-five poked into sight. The man behind it was tall and square-shouldered and thick black beard and kind of reddish eyes. Howdy. What do you want, mister? I'm looking for Red Eye Kirk. Ain't nobody here by that name. Uh-huh. Well, maybe you'll do, then. What? My name's Ponsett, Brett Ponsett. Ponsett? Now, hold on, hold on. I'll just take it easy with that gun. Get him up. Get him up high. Oh, sure, sure. How's it? You alone? Yep, yep, I'm alone. You must be plumb crazy thinking you can take me single-handed. No, 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 I'm not interested in taking you, Red Eye. I told you that ain't who I am. Oh, that's right, yeah, that's right. Yes, you did. Yes, that's right. Uh, you mind if I get off my horse? Well, just don't try nothing, that's all. And don't move towards your holster. Don't worry. That's close enough. Sure, 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 sure. Now, what are you doing out here, anyway? Well, the fact is, uh... You see, Mr. I... Uh, Mr. Uh... What'd you say your name was? Uh... Jones. Bill Jones. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Jones... I've been given the job of raising some money. What? Now, now, don't get me wrong. It wasn't my idea, but since it was for such a good cause, I just couldn't turn the folks down. Good cause? A new church organ. That's what I'm collecting for. What? Now, you see, the one that Reverend Broom's congregation has been using, it sort of gave up the ghost last night, and what with Easter coming on, I... Well, it, Are you it, joshing me, mister? No. No, of course I'm not. You mean you're out here trying to raise money so you can buy a church organ? That's right. Go on. Get moving before I take a shot at you. You won't give me a hand, huh? I wouldn't give you five cents for every church organ west of Mississippi River. Now, it, it wasn't your money I wanted. What? No, no. No, it wasn't that at all. What the devil did you come around bothering me for? Well, I was thinking that... Uh, you're a pretty influential man with some of the folks here about. Yeah, they've told the mark if I tell them to. You can bet on that. Yeah, well, that's just the impression I got. So what? Well, it seemed to me that if I was to go moseying around these parts alone, some of your friends might not look too kindly on the idea of giving me donations. <laughs> they sure wouldn't. But on the other hand, if... If we were to approach them together as a kind of a team, you might say. A team? That's the general idea, yeah. You? You want me to go along with you? I sure would appreciate it if you would. And, and help you raise money for a church organ? That's, that's right. Well, I'll be... <laughs> <laughs> Me taking up a Sunday school collection. Well, that's the doggone notion anybody ever had. <laughs> what do the boys think? Huh? Jack Denton, Wisconsin Billy. Why, it'd be almost worth it just to see their faces. <laughs> you sure got a sense of humor, Ponson. And you know something this here crazy scheme of yours? I'm going to take you up on it. Uh, you know something, Mr. Jones? Uh, you, know, you know something? I kind of thought you would. <laughs> you are listening to The Six Shooter, starring James Stewart as Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman whose name has become a legend throughout the great Southwest. And now, act two of the story called Crisis at Easter Creek. Well, 
Well, the first place we came to was a farmhouse about a quarter of a mile south of Red Eye's cabin. At least it had been a farmhouse once. And there sure wasn't any crops growing in the vicinity now. The porch sagged off at a slant, and the windows were stuffed full of papers and rags. Even the front door looked like it was about to slide off its hinges. And the place really looked deserted, but Red Eye gave me the nod, and we pulled up and dismounted. <laughs> Old Red Eye, he had a great big grin as wide as a full moon spread all over his face. Been there ever since we started off. Hey, Danton! Get out here, Danton! It's me, Red Eye! Uh, well, I'm, I mean, uh, <laughs> well, I guess you know who I was anyway. Didn't well, you know I, 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 I had a pretty good idea. Howdy, Red Eye. What can I do for you? Danton! This here's Britt Ponson. Ponson! Howdy, Danton. Now, don't you worry, Red Eye. Even if he did get the draw on you, he ain't turning you over to no sheriff. Oh, put your gun away, Denton. Huh? Use your eyes. Ponson ain't covered me, is he? Then, what are you doing riding along with him? Oh, we got us a little project. Now, you explain it to it, Ponson. Well, the fact is we're collecting money to buy a new organ for Reverend Broom. What? That's right, Jack. Oh, Sounds to me like you said money for a new organ. I must be getting law close. I sure ain't going to argue that with you, Denton. Well, come on. Come on, fork over. You you mean you're serious, Red Eye? Of course I'm serious. And he must be holding a gun on you. I ain't got all day, Denton. How much we need, Britt? Well, let's see. Uh, Twelve from fifty, uh, thirty-eight dollars. Well, you heard him. Denton. Oh, oh, sure, sure, Red Eye, sure. Uh, now, uh, just let me look in my purse here. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, two twenty-dollar gold pieces. How's that? Well, I, I didn't mean that you had to contribute the whole thing. Uh, 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 just just huh? keep the change. Just keep the change. Oh, well, thanks a lot. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure entirely. Well, was there anything else, Red Eye? Uh, no, no, I guess that'll do it for now. Well, let's go, Ponson. Yeah, sure. He's good. He's good. I'm glad you boys stop by. Anytime I can. Well, you know where to find me. <laughs> now, we'll stop at Mike Morgan's place next. That's just down the road. Well, that's mighty considerate of you, Red Eye, but uh, we, we don't need to make another stop. What? Well, what are you talking about? Well, $38. That's all we needed, you see. Oh. See, the, the organ's all paid for. Now. Well, uh, uh, there must be something else the Reverend needs money for, ain't it? Oh, I suppose. Well, that doggone could... it, Ponson. I'm enjoying myself. And besides, it wouldn't be fair to the rest of the boys if Denton was the only one who got a chance to do a little contributing to charity. At least we can do is stop at Mike Morgan's. Since how we're so close. I said, well, whatever you say. Whatever you say, Red Eye. <laughs> Well, we made about eight more stops before evening, and I must say that all of Red Eye's friends are mighty generous. I, I even had to turn down the offer of a couple of cows for the cause, seeing as how there was some doubt as to the legal owner of the stock in question. But the gold and the silver and the paper money, well, there just wasn't any way of telling how that was come by. At least uh, there wasn't any way I could think of it. So by sundown, I was carrying quite a load of cash. And we were riding away from Slick Wilson's place when Red Eye gave a little sigh and looked at me sort of disappointed. Well, guess I better head back home now. Sure, Red Eye. Sure. <laughs> what, what's the matter? I was just thinking about how Mike Morgan tripped over his shotgun when I oh. told him what it was we wanted. Oh, he nearly yeah. blowed himself right over the bar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's kind of a close call, wasn't it? No, Gona, I don't see why Wisconsin Billy wasn't at home. Well, he'd have been fit to be tied. Well, we did all right without him. He's a say, 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 it's a Brit. Oh, why don't you come back tomorrow, huh? Oh, no. He'll no. probably be around there. Oh, no, no. No, thanks, Red Eye. I, I got a... Well, I got a whole whole lot more than I ever expected. Huh? And I sure do appreciate your assistance. Oh, pleasure's all mine. <laughs> well, good luck. Same to you. Same to you, Red Eye. <laughs> It was about an hour's ride back to town. 
But before I'd gone more than halfway, I... I got the feeling there was somebody following me. I sure didn't like it either. Not with all this money I had in the saddlebag. So I gave Scar a little touch of the spur. Come on, boy. Come on. Come on. Let's go. When I heard the other horse pounding up the trail after me, I said, Let's go, boy. Come on. Come on. Let's go. His first shot was over my head. There wasn't any point in trying to outrun him. Scar being as tired as he was. So I slid out of the saddle. I rolled over behind a rock. He was still coming, so I eased my gun out of the holster and inched up to get a look at him. He was a big fella, holding his revolver loose in his hand like he didn't figure on using it. Well, I didn't figure on letting him rob me either. I waited until he was about even with the rock where I was hiding. Then I stood up. Drop it! Drop it! Okay, okay, take it easy, Parsip. Why, you know who I am, huh? Red, I told me you was heading this way. I've been trying to catch up with you for the last 15 minutes. You... You mean Red Eye sent you after me? I'll say he did. Well, I'll be darned. Huh. I thought I had him figured different. Now, I suppose he told you about the money, too. Oh, sure, yeah. sure, here's mine. Hmm? My share, cat. What? Your your share? Little church organ. Name's Wisconsin Billy. I was out when you come by to collect this afternoon. Oh. Oh. Then I wanted to make certain you got my donation. Oh. Oh, I see. Now, do you mind handing me my gun? You you got it? No. Not a bit. Here. Here you are. Thanks. Well, so long, contract. Yes, yes, so long, there. I, I simply can't believe it, Mr. Ponson. There must be over a thousand dollars here. It's about, Reverend, it's about. Enough for the organ, enough to build a church, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Ponson. Yeah? Now, you mustn't think me ungrateful, but I'm afraid we can't accept this money. What? Well, you see, Sheriff Appleton told me where you got it. He did, huh? Now, mind you, I don't have any objections myself. I think when help is offered, it should be accepted, regardless of the source. But uh, some of my people, they aren't quite so broad-minded. And the idea of permitting Red Eye Kirk and those other outlaws to donate to our fund, well... Now, it's... now, now, just hold on, minute, Reverend Bro. Now, just hold on. Now, when I was talking to Sheriff Atherton earlier today, he claimed that there weren't any outlaws in the vicinity of Easter Creek. Well, we don't like to admit that our town is a, a haven. Of... Why, the, why, the sheriff said that if there were any bandits around here, it was his duty to arrest them. Of course, that would mean getting a posse together. It would probably mean a lot of shooting and killing. Well, Mr. Ponson, everybody knows it. I mean, it's common knowledge. And as for Red Eye Kirk ever having anything to do with that money I raised, well, I, you could be mistaken, Reverend. But, but you were seen riding along. Well, it, it looked like Red Eye. Didn't Sheriff Fraplin ever tell you about the fellow that lives out near Deer Mountain who's supposed to be the... But an image of Red Eye Kirk in the water tunnel, but... Now, Mr. Ponce... No, no, even if some of those fellows on the other side of the creek are sort of outside the law... Now, I'm not saying they are, mind you, but even so, you know, accusing them of being criminals, it might stir up a whole lot of trouble. Well, that's true, of course. And besides, Sheriff Ablin says they're law-abiding citizens, and he's your duly elected sheriff. He sure ought to know. Hmm? Well, night, Reverend. I'll uh, see you in church. Well, I guess there was a little argument about whether or not to accept the money, but Sheriff Appleton finally convinced folks that they didn't have any right to turn it down. So by the following Sunday, Easter, the congregation had a new organ. The service was real well attended, too. Now, I, some of the folks didn't look like regular church doors. They, 
But Red Eye, he, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Jones, he explained to me afterwards that he and his friends just wanted to make sure their contributions had been put to a good use. I don't know if they've been back since, but you never can tell, you know. Well, that broom preached a real fine sermon that morning. NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is based on a character created by Frank Burt and is written by him. Mr. Stewart may currently be seen in the Universal International picture, The Glenn Miller Story. Others in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Marvin Miller, Ted DeCorsia, Robert Griffin, and Red Eye Kirk. Special music for this program was by Basil Adlam, and the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Well, by the way, you'll be interested in knowing that the sick shooter has been chosen for broadcast to our men overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Services. This is John Wall speaking. Play Truth or Consequences with Ralph Edwards on the NBC Radio Network. Here's adventure. Here's romance. Here's the famous Robin Hood of the Old West. Cisco, the sheriff, he is getting closer. The play, Punto, Pamelo. The Cisco Tip. Cisco Kid in our exciting story, The Duel. Although the history of the bad men of the Old West gives us little mention of Armand Duport, alias the Duke, he was nevertheless one of the most cold-blooded criminals ever to plot a robbery and killing. For the Duke loved to frame innocent men, as witness a clipping from the leading southwestern newspaper of the 1870s. Quote, George Wayne will receive sentence today for the murder of bank guard Joseph Hale. Hale was shot and killed when he surprised Wayne and presumably a confederate who was still at large with $20,000 worth of bonds in the act of robbing the National Bank. The prisoner will rise and face the bar. George Wayne, it's a judgment of this court that one month from today, you'll be hanged by the neck until dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. No, I'm innocent, Judge. I told the truth. I told the truth. Remove the prisoner. I'm innocent. I tell you, I never killed anybody. I never robbed that bank. Uh, I'm sponsoring it like this, Cisco. We get out of here, no? See, Poncho, we'll leave now. Come on. Uh. You know, Poncho, I'm convinced that Senor Wayne is innocent. Hmm? I have known Senor Wayne for years, and he would not harm anyone. And who killed the bank guard, Cisco? I do not know, Poncho. But if it is humanly possible, I'm going to find out who stole those bonds and killed the guard before Senor Wayne has to pay the penalty for something he did not do. I'm going to get General Stone a little dump up a frontier town. The 
It's not my idea of sports, Sam. I figure it's made us a good hideout, Duke. Anyway, you've stood it for most a month. You she can stand it a couple of days more. Wayne swings day after tomorrow. <laughs> yes. And then we'll get back to the city again. At least you ain't tried to stage any holdups here in Mesa Flats, Duke. I've been afraid you might. Uh, those two jobs we did on the way out kept me satisfied, I guess. <laughs> in each case, Sam, we framed somebody. Uh, that's the way to work these jobs. Always fix it so somebody else takes the blame. I enjoy that, monsieur. I didn't like it. Now, see here. You ain't got to hand me that phony French step you're always pulling on other people. Phony? Hardly that. After all, I did receive much of my education in France. Also, I first became interested in, shall we say, easier ways of making a living in France. You're a pretty cool customer, Duke. But I've got to hand it to you. You're smart. Well, see, monsieur. You figure things out ahead of time. Yeah, that's what education does, for one. But you wouldn't understand that, Sammy, any more than you understand the reason why I short-weight the oaks who pay for their purchases in this store with gold dust. It isn't for the extra profit. It's purely because I gloat in their stupidity. Yeah, they ain't all as stupid as you think, Duke. Take that Austin kid who comes in here with his sister. He's been giving you some funny looks lately. Yes, yeah, so I've noticed. I'm beginning not to like those looks. Here they come now. Oh, don't make a new story, Joe. You might be wrong. No, I ain't wrong. Look, Duke, I want to talk to you. You are talking with me, monsieur. Please, Joe. Duke, I've been checking up on my gold dust lately. I figure you've overcharged me most $100 for things I bought. And that is a grave charge, monsieur. I want that money back. Is it that you accuse me of dishonesty? I said I want that money back. Oh, Joe, at least give him a chance to explain. There is nothing to explain, Monsieur. It is an insult, and I demand my satisfaction. From beneath this counter, I draw my choice of weapons. You will either withdraw your insult, Monsieur, or we will fight a duel at dawn as do my countrymen. Now, look, if you want to fight this out, my two fists are good enough for me. You're afraid. No, I ain't afraid. You sure ain't afraid, any... Duke. Shall I throw him out of this store? You better not try it. Come on, Joe. I don't like this. You will accept my challenge? I tell you, he's scared, Duke. He's turning green. Oh, I am, huh? All right, I'll show you. Sure, I'll accept your challenge. Excellent. Behind your house at dawn, monsieur. No, no, this is just plain crazy. Joe never even had a sword in his hand before. Uh, let me correct you, mademoiselle. These are rapiers, not swords. <laughs> I'll be most happy to let your brother take these with him so that he may practice. Oh, but that won't do any good. <laughs> Go ahead, kid. Hide behind her skirt. Sure, I'll take him along. And I'll be waiting for you tomorrow morning, Duke. Come on, Louis. Joe, this is crazy. You'll be killed. <laughs> <laughs> it's been some time since I killed a man with a rapier, Sammy. I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> Cisco, in France, not know how we find a number we not ever see. We hunt a long time, Cisco. Say, time is getting short, Pancho. I admit it is a slim chance. But at least we have the description Senora Wayne gave us. What's the prescription, Cisco? You remember what she said to me, go? No. She said that late in the afternoon of that day when the bank was robbed and the guard murdered, she saw Senor Wayne talking with an hombre in front of their house. Oh, Pancho remember now. The senora say he a big, big hombre. Hey, a tall one with very white teeth who look like a foreigner. The senora say Senor Wayne go with the big, big hombre. But I have a feeling that hombre made Senor Wayne go with him in order to place the blame for the crime on Senor Wayne. Then I'd let us talk to the senor in the prison. Yeah, that is right. They would not, Pancho. Now, she's going Pancho to right little town of Mesa Flat. How she's going to know the hombre in this part of the country? I'm not sure, Pancho, but most criminals work according to a pattern. Yeah, a pattern, sir. Uh -huh. That bank robbery and murder happened at midnight. Midnight, midnight. Huh? Your Wayne was used by the criminal to get the blame. To get the blame. Huh? Very well. Uh -huh. Since then, two robberies have occurred in this part of the country. Two, two. Committed exactly the same way. They happened at midnight. And in each case, the hombre who was caught protested his innocence just the way Senor Wayne did. And those hombres innocent too, Cisco? I do not know, Pancho, but the pattern is the same. Same pattern. Which makes me think the criminal we are after is in this part of the country. So, Santo, what is that? But what? Just in that field just ahead of us, Pancho. Huh? It's a duel between a young senor and a senorita. He tried to kill a senorita. Oh, yeah, well, oh, oh, oh. First time I ever saw anything like that. Madre mía, they look as if they mean it too. Oh, there, oh, ho, 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 ho. That'll be enough of that, senor. That'll be enough of that, senor. Huh? What do you mean? Enough of what? Shame on you, senor. We'll fight the senor either with his sword. Wait, Pancho, wait. He now knows. that we are closer, they do not appear to be angry. Hey, wh what are you talking about? They thought we were really fighting, Joe. Oh, yeah, I must admit that we did, senorita. The distance, it looked very real. Oh, no. We're just practicing. 
I'm trying to help my brother. Yeah, I gotta fight a duel tomorrow morning at daylight. I'm trying to learn to handle this here sword. You say you must fight a duel? Yeah, that's right. With the Duke. Uh, he runs the general store here. I guess he's a Frenchman. But who are you two men? I'm known as the Cisco Kid, and this is my compañero, Pancho. You're the Cisco Kid? Honest? Si. Cisco, not nobody but Cisco. Well, shake, Cisco. Why, well, sure, I've always wanted to meet you. Gracias, senor. Oh, uh, this is my sister, Millie Austin. A pleasure, senorita. A pleasure, senorita. I'm glad to meet both of you. Gracias. Gracias. But I do not understand that dual business, senor. Oh, it's got me terribly worried, Cisco. Joe thinks this man called Duke, who runs the store, has short-weighted his gold dust lately, and he told him about it. Yeah, and the hombre pulled out these two swords and challenged me. Oh, what could I do? You have never fenced before? No, nope, never. May I see those rapiers? Yeah, sure. Here's mine, too. Oh, I'm glad to get rid of it. Hmm, they're very good ones, too. Hey, you handle that as if you'd used one, Cisco. Hey, I have, senor, several times. Tell me more about this storekeeper, senor, and then Pancho and I will go to see him. He interests me a great deal. Say, Duke. Well? How are we going to cash these bombs in? We'll cash them in when the time comes, Sam. Uh, $20,000 is a nice chunk of cash. Put them out of sight. Here comes somebody. Oh, 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 a couple of strangers, Duke. I ain't seen them before since we've been here. Hey, I think one of them is the Cisco kid. Cisco? How interesting. They say he's pretty much of a man. He's more than that. He's dynamite. He was at Wayne's trial, too, Duke. I read about him being there. I understand he's a friend of Wayne's. And that event will be watchful. Uh, can I serve you, monsieur? I would like to buy a box of cartridges. Forty-fours. You take gold dust in payment? Maybe. Your cartridges, monsieur. Will there be anything else? No, that is all. Here's my bag of dust. You may weigh out the price of the cartridges. Now, see. One pinch more. No. That is correct, monsieur. Well, momento. I would like to weigh this box of cartridges in those scales. Hey, uh, what's the idea? Just go say he like to weigh the cartridges. He like to weigh the cartridges. Of course. I'm a bit curious, that is all. Do you weigh right, Cisco? No, they do not. These scales of yours are not correct, senor. Hey, look, you. Look, you. No need for you to talk. I say the scales are correct, monsieur. No, they are not. Grave insult and I slap your face. Aha. I return this lap, senor, with interest. <laughs> it's a good slap, Cisco. Now the hombre clean it in the flower barrel. Maybe you could knock me into the flower barrel, too. I'm fine to stick out his foot. Oh, excuse, senor. You trip over Pancho's foot. Oh, I That'll do, do Sam. Monsieur, it is my choice of weapons. Tomorrow at dawn, I'm fighting a duel. I will fight you with rapiers after I dispose of my first victim. You were what? I will fight you after I dispose of my first victim. You say you are insulted, but I am the one who is insulted. You will fight me first, hombre. You understand? I yield such an honor to no one. Very well, very well. Makes no difference, monsieur. I shall be most happy to accommodate you first. Where is the dueling ground? Come to the doorway. You see that frame house down the street? See? The duels will take place in the field behind that house. At dawn. I will be there. At dawn. Come, Pancho. Si, si, go. Martin, I think this was so excited before over who fight first. I had to pretend to be excited, Pancho, in order that he would allow me the first duel. Oh. If the young senor fought that hombre first, there would be no chance for him. This could get a chance, no? Oh, that remains to be seen, Pancho. Mm -hmm. I have some experience with the rapiers. Mm -hmm. Perhaps not enough if that duke is a good swordsman. But I am looking beyond this duel, amigo. I think we have found our man. <laughs> But even though Cisco thinks he has found his man, he has, as yet, no proof. In just a moment, we'll return to the Cisco Kid. Cisco Kid in our gripping story, The Duel. Believing that his friend George Wayne is innocent of the murder for which he has been sentenced to hang, Cisco and Pancho set out to track down the real criminal. 
The trail leads to the small frontier town of Mesa Flats, where Cisco finds that the storekeeper, known as the Duke, has challenged young Joe Austin to a duel with rapiers at dawn. Cisco made haste to insult the Duke and, being challenged, insisted on fighting his duel with the Duke first. Now, after leaving the store... Cisco think he the hombre we want? See, si, I do think so, Pancho. He answers the description Senora Wayne gave of him. No, sir, Pancho think he look like a bad hombre. We'll see what we can find out from the sheriff. Uh-huh. Time is passing and the execution of Senor Wayne is set for the day after tomorrow. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Oh, here's a little senorita, Cisco. Oh, Cisco, did you go to the store? See, si, we did, senorita. But I trust you will not need to worry any more about your brother fighting that duel. You mean he got a called off? No, not exactly that. Yeah, Cisco means he fight the Duke Hombre the first duel, senorita. And after that, Pancho think <laughs> no more Duke Hombre. Oh, Cisco, you angel. Gracias, senorita, but I do not wish to be an angel just yet. Uh, please excuse us. We have many things to do, huh? Of course. But be sure and come to our house to talk. Gracias, senorita, but perhaps... Uh, I... Perhaps nothing, Cisco. <laughs> si, senorita, gracias. We happy to come for supper, no? Well, it's... You? Not Mrs. Woodfish. The shop is just going on. No, no. <laughs> oh, as you wish, Pancho. Ah, see the sheriff is in. Come on. Come in. Well, howdy, strangers. One is there, Sheriff. The one is there, Sheriff. Sit down, men. Yeah. What can I do for you? Well, you can answer a few questions for us if you will, Senor Sheriff. First, we'll make ourselves known to you as the Cisco Kid. And Pancho. Oh, Cisco, huh? See, si, Sheriff. I would like some information about your storekeeper here. The, the storekeeper here? Duke? See? Si. See? Si. Well, I don't know much about him, Cisco. He's been here about a month. We don't ask any questions in this country if an hombre's on the level. And the Duke appears to be. Have you had any complaints from anyone about being short-weighted in his store? You mean short-weighted in gold dust? See? Si. See? Si. No, I ain't. Why? What you want to know for Perhaps at some later time I can tell you why I am asking. Oh. Speaking of asking questions, uh, how long you hombres intend to be around here? Oh, a day or two more, perhaps. We are camped behind the home of Senor and Senorita Austin. See, behind the home. Go and Millie, huh? Well, they're all right. Meaning that we are not? I didn't say that, Cisco. But I just assume you didn't hang around my country. We will leave within the time I said, Sheriff. Gracias. Gracias. Come back, John. This is good. Ranch, and I think we find that much from him, Cisco. Not as much as I had hoped. If he had given us a better welcome, I would have told him why we are here. But we did find out one thing, Pancho. What that, Cisco? What we find out? We huh? found out that the Duke and his partner have been here for only the past month. Uh-huh. I am certain now that the Duke is the hombre we want. So what we do next, Cisco? After dark, we must get into that store of his, Pancho. We must try to find those stolen bonds for proof. Sam. Ah, what you want, dude? You know where Cisco is camped? I heard somebody say he was camped in the back of the Austin's place. Why? I'm considering ways and means of eliminating Cisco. That's a good idea, Duke. I tell you, that hombre spotted us. I'm giving it thought while I adjust these scales. With both Austin and Cisco questioning them, it's time to change. Yeah. Ah, that'll be safer. How about Freeman, Cisco? That's what you usually do, Duke. Works out nice, too. I don't quite see how that can be done in this town. Oh, we're being honored by a visit from the sheriff. Bonjour, monsieur. Howdy, Duke. Sam? Howdy, sheriff. Just like to test these here scales of yours, if you don't mind. Not at all, sheriff. Help yourself. Figure I know the way to this gun of mine to the house. Let's see if these scales agree with me. Uh, that's uh, quite a heavy weight to place on scales just to weigh gold dust, monsieur. Yeah, they'll take it, though. Let's yeah, see now. Yep. Scales do agree with me. Yes, they're all right, Duke. Uh, did someone say they were not? Well, I heard word they might not be. From the Cisco kid, perhaps? Might have been from Cisco. Hey, if you're on your job, Sheriff, you'll kick him out of here. I reckon I know my job, Sam. Uh, Sam, but means, Sheriff, that the Cisco kid is one to be watched closely. He was in the store. He and the one with him were eyeing the cash box. Oh, you got any reason to think he's planning to break in? No, except that when a man looks at a cash box as he did, he usually has designs upon it. I'd appreciate your cooperation, monsieur. All right, I'll watch the store. Cisco proved he ain't to be trusted when he lied to me about the hair scales. 
It looks now, Duke, as if we got to fix it so Cisco will break into this store. Or that we bring him into the store tonight, then call the sheriff. What about them duels you signed up for? I'm counting on killing the boy, Sam. As for Cisco, any way we can kill him will be good, and the sooner the better. We'll go to his camp, Sam, after dark. <laughs> Pancho, wake up. Quieto, quieto. Do not make so much noise. It's nearly midnight. Remember, it's time for us to go to the stores with plan. Now wake up. Pancho, open his eyes, Cisco. Here, buckle on your gun belt. Si, si. Now listen to me, Pancho. I listen, I listen. Those hombres may suspect us. If so, they will try to kill us or to frame us somehow. Frame us somehow. That Duke thinks we suspect him. He may also think we will try to find those bonds. Hmm? And have a trap all set for us in the store. Uh, this is going, Pancho, keep by the trap. That is why I'm telling you, so you will have all your wits about you. That hombre will kill us in a moment. Now come, quiet. Uh, nobody on the street, Cisco. Not at this hour. He's in the shadow of the buildings. Uh, wait, wait, Pancho, what, 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 what? I saw, I saw that bush move. The one just ahead of us. No reason I can move the boot. I will see what caught this. Hey, let me go. Oh, take him up. Use hey, hey, your gun, Ted. Hey. Not while he is within my reach. Let's go knock him down. Pancho, grab his gun. Now for you, hombre. Why were you hiding behind this bush? Not if I can help it, you will not. He's going to get him. Yeah, what's going on here? Come on, quit that fight. Uh, you, Cisco, get your hands up. You too, hombre. You punch your hands up. They try to hold us up, monsieur. What? You lie, hombre. How about it, sir? That's right, sir. The sure did. Yeah. Tempted hold up, huh? Uh, these hombres not tell the truth, Sheriff. Keep your hands up or walk ahead of me. Duke, I want you and Sam to come in about nine o'clock and make formal charges. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. What has happened to your French accent all of a sudden, hombre? You had better take note of that, Sheriff. Get going, Cisco. But I tell you... Very well, Sheriff, as you say. But Cisco... Why don't you come along? Si, si, if Cisco says so... Too hard to sleep on, Cisco. <laughs> when we get out of this jail? As soon as I see the first streak of light in the east, Pancho. We can get out, Cisco. See, si, amigo. <laughs> I'm working on the cell window bars. They are loose and we can get out through the window. Oh, bueno, bueno. Um, Pancho, ready to go right now. No, 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 Pancho. No? Not just yet. I want to be sure those hombres have left their quarters in the store for the duel with young Senor Austin, amigo. Oh, si, si. Uh, Cisco not let them fight that duel, no? Not if I can help it, Pancho. Uh-huh. Uh, it's the first sign of dawn. Come, Pancho. I'll push these window bars aside for you. Pancho, try not to get stuck this time, Cisco. Hey, try hard not to, Pancho. Right up you go. Pancho, try to get stuck. Push, push, Cisco. I am pushing hard. Pancho, through. Well, now I will come out. Uh, now we go to the store, Cisco. You will go to the store, amigo. Uh-huh. And when you see those hombres leave, go in and look for the bonds. seen a thing of them yet, Millie. Mm. Getting daylight, though. Oh, I, I do hope they won't come, Joe. I guess that's them now. All right. Uh, I'll be right with you. I do not wish to be kept waiting, monsieur. You won't be. Give me them swords, Millie. But where's this go? Oh, Joe, you can't go through with this. You can't. You'll be... You'll I ain't be... anxious to go through with it, but I... Well, I took his challenge and I got to... Well, all right, all right. You stay here, Millie. No, I won't. I'm going to. Oh, well, you're not You will act as your brother second. Please don't hold Joe to this duel. He doesn't know anything about fighting with swords. <laughs> then I will give him a lesson. Come. Oh, please. Please. You're pretty when you plead, mademoiselle. Oh. But no. Uh, this place is good and level. Your choice of the rapist, monsieur. I... Oh, it don't make any difference. This one. <laughs> kind of figure I'll enjoy this, Duke. You may not enjoy it as much as you think, Henri. Oh, Cisco. Oh, you're ahead. I'll fix him, too. Tell me what. Hey, Austin. Yes, Cisco? Take this gun and keep it on this time, Henri. All the time. Yeah, sure. But the duel. I have the honor to fight the first duel with the duel. Give me your rapier. Gracias. Ah, it's a good weapon. That's life. 
<laughs> At your service, Duke. I'm going to kill you, Cisco. Not with words, hombre. Come, let us not waste time. Hunk up! Hey! Oh. I have not duel for some time, hombre. If it becomes apparent, let me know you. Let us live by, Duke. Uh-huh. That is an unpleasant thought. Too long, hombre. Let us carry. Faster, hombre. Faster. Ha uh-huh. ha. We're slowing down. Kill us, Cisco. Ha ha ha. Now, let us see. Find some, find some papers like you say. All right, Domingo. I'm busy. Ah, I'm no longer so busy. Jump and grasshopper. Cisco knocked that sword right out of his hand. Well, hombre, the point of the sword is at your throat. No, Cisco. No, don't, don't. Put those bonds in my hand, Pancho. Yes, Cisco. I must keep my eyes on this hombre's face. Oh, where'd you get those bonds? Stand still, hombre. Mm, Pancho, find the papers. The bonds in the back room of the store. Bueno, Pancho. That was good work. So, Duke. You did kill that bank guard. No, no, you're wrong, Cisco. The point of this rapier is still at your throat, hombre. Tell the truth, quickly. All right, Cisco. Samurai did the job. No, no, I'm going to get out of here. Stand still and shut up, you. Pancho, you and Senor Austin tie these hombres up and keep close guard over them. There is just about time to have the sheriff send a telegram to the governor of the state to save Senor Wayne from hanging for a crime he did not commit. And the telegram did get to the governor in time, Cisco. Si, senorita. Senor Wayne has been reprieved, and the two killers, Duke and Sam, are now on their way to prison. Oh, I'm so glad. But you know, I'm not surprised, Cisco. You're wonderful. I wish you'd settle in Mesa Flat. It's a nice little town, senorita, but there are many towns in the southwest we have not yet seen. Mm. So you're going to ride on, huh? Si. Well, until you come back here. Si? Until I come back? Take this with you, Cisco. Oh, Cisco. Oh, senorita. Si, Pancho. Cisco, see that bird over there on the fence post? Si, amigo, I see that bird. You Cisco know what kind of bird that is? Well, from here I would say it looks like a bullfinch, Pancho. No, no, that's not a bullfinch, Cisco. That bird a woofle bird. A woofle bird? See, si, that's a woofle bird. Pancho's Uncle Jose tell him. Oh, so that is a woofle bird, Cisco. Mm, see, si. the woofle bird fly backwards, Cisco. Flies backwards? See? Si. Well, that is strange. I would think he would fly forward to see where he is going. Woofle bird fly back with Cisco because the woofle bird not care where he's going. No? The woofle bird wants to know where he's been. Oh, Pancho! Oh, Cisco! So ends another exciting adventure with O. Henry's famous Robin Hood of the West, the Cisco Kid. listen again for another thrilling adventure of the Cisco Kid. Cisco Kid was played by Jack Mather, Poncho by Harry Lang. of Weber's Bread present your all-star Western Theater.
From Hollywood comes your all-star Western theater, starring America's great Western singers, Boy Willing and the Rioters of the Purple Sage, in music, song, and a story of the wide open spaces. My name is Cotton C. Clark, and here are the Riders of the Purple Sage. <laughs> Now, yippee-yay, yippee-yay, at the break of the day, I ride along with a song in my heart on the way. I find that open range of land that is free. I've where the sky the blue keeps flying down on me. When the sun goes to rest on the rim of the west, the moon above will return and the cap I will burn. To the stars above, I'll sing of my love with a face bright and phony. as they go drifting along toward another of their weekly adventures. Suppose we take them back to the old days, say the 1880s, and see what happens when three easygoing fellows become involved in a murder. We find Boy, Al, and Jimmy riding toward Trail City. It's rather late at night, and they're tired, saddle sore, and hungry. And not knowing exactly how much further their destination, they ride up to a lamp-lighted ranch house in the hope that they may get food and lodging for the night. Al, who is always elected to do the dirty work, is voted to knock on the door and make the necessary speech. 
Yes? Oh, uh, howdy, ma'am. I wonder if... Uh, well, hello. Yes? What was it you wanted? Well, um, uh, ma'am, uh, uh, me and my two buddies are looking to get something to eat and uh, to be put up for the night. That is, if uh, you let us pay for it. Well, I, I suppose so. Just a moment. Bob! Yeah, Jane, what is it? This gentleman and his two friends would like to quit up for the oh, night. Oh, we'd they... uh, be mighty much obliged if you could feed us and give us a bunk for the night, friend. We're willing to pay you well. Well, I reckon it'd be all right. Never mind about the pay, though. We'll be glad to accommodate you. Oh, we'd sure appreciate it. It's been eight or ten hours since we've eaten, and our horses are mighty tired, too. We're glad to help. Glad to help. Have your friends come in, and we'll stir up some food first. Well, thank you. All right, boys. Come on in. Good. Right with you. Come in. I'll get something ready to eat. It won't take me long. Oh, my name is Chloe, and this is Floyd Willing and Jimmy Dean. Glad to know you, boys. My name is Bob Fletcher. Glad to know you, Bob. Right, Bob. Reckon we're lucky to find you folks still up. Well, as a rule, we don't sit up this late, but my dad is riding in from Trail City, and we're waiting up for him. We hate to bother you people like this. Don't think nothing of it. Now, you must be mighty tired if you've been riding all day. There's a bucket of water and a pan there on the washstand if you want to wash up a bit. I'll put your horses up for you and see if I can fix you up a bunk for the night. That's mighty nice of you, Fletcher. Jenny's getting some grub ready. I'll be back in a few minutes. Man, these three folks are full of nothing but hospitality. Yeah, from all the hospitality they're showing us, you'd think we were long-lost cousins or something. I don't get it myself. Guys, just want a cold. Yeah, water. especially mm. since we're total strangers. Hand me that towel, Troy. Yeah. Well, you know, as long as we eat and sleep, I'm satisfied, though, you know. Yeah. Boy, I hope whoever's fixing that grub don't keep us waiting. Hey, you ought to see what's uh, getting the grub ready. Man, she's as pretty as a spotted pup under a red wagon. Now, wait a minute. Don't go trying to flirt with the man's wife. Oh, I ain't, but that don't keep her from being pretty, boy. Oh, boy, your supper's on the table. Wowie. You just ain't a whooping about her. Who was that? Oh, uh, nothing, ma'am. I was, uh, I was, uh, talking about, a about a spotty pup I know. <laughs> oh, well, I hope you boys don't mind things being cold. But it would take quite a while to make a fire in the cook stove, and I'm sure you're hungry. Oh, we sure are, ma'am. By the way, where did Bob go? Oh, your husband is putting up our horses, hey. You mean my brother. Your brother? <laughs> Why, yes, I have no husband. Well, that's wonderful. Mm. I mean, uh, that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> you better tighten up your shins there, Will, and you're slipping a little. <laughs> well, right now you'd better eat. Yeah, that's the most intelligent thing that's been said yet. <laughs> then come right into the kitchen. <laughs> Jane, this grub is nothing short of the best in the West. I'm glad you like it. Here, have some more turnip greens. Uh, don't mind if I do. You might pass me some more of that there sorghum molasses, boy. Yes, here you are. And what can I pass you, Mr. Dean? Uh, a couple more biscuits, I reckon. Dean, you know better than that. Well, I guess you'd better make it just one more biscuit. No, you eat all of them you want. I wish they were hot. Boy, this here sausage is mighty fine. Well, well boy, your horses are cared for and your bunks are ready. We don't know how to thank you folks for all of this kindness. No, I think nothing of it. We're happy to be of help. Well, we're going to pay you, of course. You'll do no such thing. We'll be here to it. We sure do appreciate it. Yes, sir, also. You boys uh, planning on going to work in this part of the country? Oh, well, we hadn't thought much about it. We generally stop off somewhere for a few weeks' work. That is, when our money runs low. And uh, we ain't too rich right now. No. Well, I don't wish you any financial hard luck, but I hope you need work now. What do you mean? I might as well come on out with it. I guess you men wonder why we gave such a big welcome to three strange men so late at night. Yeah, we thought of that. Well, we need help here on the ranch mighty bad. Are hands scarce in this part of the country? Mighty scarce. I just got back from Granite City a few minutes before you fellas showed up, and Dad and Jake Ballard, our foreman, are due in from Trail City most any minute. We've been scouting around for hands all day. We have no one but our foreman and Bob left. What brought on all of this shortage help? Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, some prospectors supposedly struck gold up at Ore City near the state line, about a couple of hundred miles from here. Everybody and their dogs headed in that direction to get rich quick. It's a serious problem, not only for us, but for the other ranchers in this section. Yeah, I see what you mean. Maybe I shouldn't have told you boys about it since I want to hire you so bad, but you know, you'd find it out anyway. How come Ballard, your foreman, stays? Well, Jake's been with us since he was a kid, almost. You see... Jake's father and our dad were partners in a lot of business deals, and dad's kept him through loyalty. Even made him foreman of the ranch, which is all right with me, because after all, dad's interests are my interests. That's a mighty big ranch, isn't it? One of the biggest in these parts. And being without help presents a mighty serious problem. All right, Fletcher, you can count on us. 
That is, for a while. Oh, anyway. that's fine, boys. The pay is 40 and cheap. Hey, that must be Jake and Daddy coming now. Oh, Bob, Jane, something terrible's happened. What's wrong, Jake? Where's Daddy? He's in the wagon outside. Well, what's happened? What? Somebody ambushed us on the way in, Bob. Your dad is dead. <laughs> Bob, I know how upset you and Miss Janie are, and uh, we want to let you know that we're going to help you in every way that we can. Oh, thank you, boys. It's mighty nice of you. And I reckon there's no need to tell you how badly we really need you now. Bob, who would have wanted to kill your father? That's hard to say, Foy. In this country, every man is after all he can get. Dad could drive a hard bargain. And to be honest about it, he was cold-blooded when it came to business, but I can't think he'd do anything that would warrant a man's killing him. Well, just exactly how did Jake Ballard describe the killing? Well, they were driving along and had just reached Sunset Pass when somebody opened fire and emptied their gun at Jake and Dad. Two of the slugs found their mark. It's about all there was to it. Then I believe Jake said he whipped the horses into a fast run toward home. Yeah, that's right. Trying to figure out the killer is going to be a tough job. Well, I hope some will turn up. Let us know if we can be of any help. No, thank you a lot, boy. You know, there's something mighty strange about old man Fletcher's death. Now, don't tell us you got it all figured out. Yes, I have. Now, ain't that nice. Now you're going to get us mixed up in something that's none of our business. Well, who do you think done it? Jake Ballard either killed him or was in cahoots with the man that did. Are you crazy? Ballard was just like a son to the old man. Never mind what he was like. Remember when Jake came riding in with the old man's body? Yeah. He told Bob and Jane that he drove home like all get out from Sunset Pass? Yeah. So what? It's two miles to Sunset Pass, according to Bob. And when a man runs a team of horses two miles, they're going to be sweating like rain and panting like a pump. I think I'm beginning to get you. If you remember, when we went out to bring in Fletcher's body, those horses were as cool as a cucumber. They'd either been walked from Sunset Pass or carried. So, what does that prove? It proves that somebody's been lying. The next morning, I went out and examined the wagon. There was a bullet hole in a sack of feed, and there wasn't any powder burns on it. Nobody shooting from ambush from the side of the road could powder burn that sack. Right. Suppose we just keep quiet on the subject for a few days and keep our eyes and ears open to every move that Jake Dollard makes. Yeah. But why would Jake kill him, and where would he profit by it? That's what we've got to find out. <laughs> I got word from lawyer Simpson today, Jane. He's back from the Capitol. I suppose he's heard about Dad's death. Yeah, yeah. He said he was going to drop out to see us day after tomorrow on some business. Well, maybe he can throw some light on who might have had reason to kill Daddy. I hope so. Didn't give me a lot of worry. The table is ready. You can call the boys. Okay, Jane. All right, boys. Supper's ready. Good. Jake said he had something he wanted to discuss with us at supper tonight. I wonder what's on his mind. Hope he's not wanting to quit. Well, come on and sit right down, boys. Everything's ready. Thank you, Miss Jane. Say, if uh, you boys don't mind, right after supper, I have something I'd like to discuss and like to have all you fellas present. Sure, we'll wait around, Jake. Good. Well, Jake, what's on your mind? Bob, I have a letter here, and, well, I haven't any idea of what its contents are. It was given to me by your father a couple of months before he was killed. He asked me not to open it until a proper time after his death, and then to do so in the presence of you and Jane in witnesses. I can't imagine what it's all about. Neither can I. Maybe it'll throw some light on who the killer is. Well, let us hope so. Miss Jane, I'm going to suggest that you break the seal and read it to us. I... I'd rather Bob would do it. All right, Jenny. To my dear children, Bob and Jane, I am writing this so in case of my death there will be no misunderstanding regarding my property. As you know, Jake Ballard's father and I were the closest of friends. After his death, I took his son to raise. I owe John Ballard the credit for all of my success, 
Therefore, I feel that I am only doing what is right when I ask my two children to share with Jake all of my properties, money, and holdings. This is the way I want it to be, and I hope there will be no objection. With deep love and affection, your father, Jim Fletcher. Bob, I, I don't know what to say to you and Miss Jane. I, I had no idea that was what the letter was about. It's all right, Jake. That was the way Dad wanted it. That's the way it'll be. That's right, Jake. I'm sure Dad knew it was best. Folks, this is kind of a personal thing between the three of you, so I reckon we could be excused now. Sure, that's all right, boys. And thanks for staying. Now, I'm telling you, there's something powerful wrong about the whole thing, especially this Jake Ballard. I don't make sense to me. The old man must have written that note, all right. Otherwise, Bob and Jane could have told. Well, if you ask me, that's a funny way to leave a will. Yeah, I'll come to think of it, it is. Especially for a big layout like this. Oh, here comes Bob now. Well, boys, how's things going? Fine, Bob. I guess you, Miss Jane, and Ballard have come to an agreement on how you'll operate from here on. Yeah, that's right. We're going to have Lawyer Simpson put everything in legal form. This is going to mean quite a lot to Jake, isn't it? Third interest in a quarter of a million dollars worth of property and money and stock. That was mighty nice of your dad. I can't quite understand it. But I reckon it's all right if he wanted it that way. By the way, who is this lawyer Simpson? Uh, he handled all of Dad's business and legal affairs for him. He offices over at the county seat. I was just wondering. Oh, by the way, do you mind if we go into town this afternoon? I thought we'd like to stretch our legs a bit. No, no, it's quite all right. You've gone through enough with us the past few days. Go out and have yourself a good time. <laughs> Mr. Willing, I'll expect you boys to keep this matter very confidential. It's highly irregular to show you such a document as this, but uh, under the circumstances, I feel that I'm doing the Fletcher heirs a mighty big favor. You can trust us, Mr. Simpson. Now, uh, what do you suggest? When you call on Bob and Jane tomorrow, insist that Jake Dollard be present. Mm -hmm. Also insist that we're present as witnesses. Mm -hmm. Leave the rest to us. Well and good. I'll see you two tomorrow afternoon. Right. I'm glad you came out, Mr. Simpson. Yeah. There's some legal work we wanted you to prepare for us to carry out the wishes Dad left in this letter to us. Well, we'll get around to that after we discuss some other matters. Here comes Floyd with Ballard now. I'm glad you asked that Jake be present. After all, he is our partner in business now. Well, howdy, Lawyer Simpson. How are you? Oh, fine, Jake, fine. I'm glad you're present because there are a few things regarding Mr. Fletcher's estate that uh, we should all understand. Oh, sure, certainly. Of course, you know how I... Well, I feel awful grateful for what Dad Fletcher did for me, Lawyer Simpson. Mm, naturally, naturally. Uh, Mr. Willing. Yeah. I'd like to ask you and Mr. Slory and Mr. Dean to serve as witnesses to this meeting and the things that transpire. Glad to be of help, Mr. Simpson. Uh, Jake. Jake, I have examined the letter left in your care by the deceased, and apparently it's genuine. You know, I can't help feeling, Mr. Simpson, that Dad Fletcher was well, he was a little too liberal toward me. But, of course, if it was his wish, then... Makes me mighty happy. Well, I have here the last will and testament of the deceased, which I will read at this time. The will? I didn't even know Dad had made a will. Neither did I. We had discussed it with him many times, and, well, he always told us that such a thing was unnecessary. And Bob and I were his only heirs. Just when, uh, when was this will made, Mr. Fenton? About six months ago, Jake. And on my insistence, since he had decided to include you in the estate... But I don't understand why... If you, if you don't mind, Jake, we'll explain everything after I read the will. It's short and it's as follows. I, James Fletcher, being of sound mind, do hereby bequeath one half of all my earthly holdings and possessions to my daughter Jane and my son Robert. I hope my children will understand my liberal attitude as I provide for Jake Ballard, the son of my good friend and partner, John Ballard, deceased. All my success and wealth... I owe to the kindness of John Ballard, and I feel justified in having Jake Ballard share my earthly properties, holdings, and money. Therefore, I bequeath to him one half of said property, 
One half? Hey, this doesn't make sense. Bob, it makes mighty good sense. I agree with Mr. Willing. But why did he write that letter? Since the will was made out leaving one half to Jake instead of one third. Get Jake to tell you why he wrote the letter. Why are you driving at that? You know, Jake, I'm in the dark about this thing just as the rest of you are. Tell him, Jake. Now look here. You then can't... I'll tell him. The late Jim Fletcher trapped his own killer. I don't understand, Troy. Let Jake tell you. He killed your father. You're a liar. Don't reach for that gun. <laughs> All right, Jake. Now take it easy. If you try anything else, you're going to get more than just a slug in your hand. I'm afraid there's some explaining to do here. All right, Bob. Jake forced your father to write that letter at the point of a gun. Your father made it look good, knowing that when the real will came to light, it would throw the blame on Jake. He then faked an ambush, killing after having shot your father in the back. It's too bad, Jake, that you didn't wait, because Jim Fletcher was even more liberal than you forced him to be. And you'll be bragging for the next six months how you track down old Jake Ballard. Yeah, I reckon I will. Boy Willing, the great cowboy detective. <laughs> all right, all right. You guys don't have to rub it in. Well, I don't understand why you wanted to leave the Fletcher place. We could have had a job there as long as we wanted it. A job? Who wants a job? Well, I'd been satisfied just hanging around Jane Fletcher myself. Oh, but that wouldn't have made her too happy, I'm afraid. Oh, I don't know about that. Well, anyway, we've got over a hundred bucks in our jeans. Where are we head for? Well, I hear there's a big rodeo next month over at Carson City. Well, we're heading in that direction. Let's go. Let's go. We'll sing along, singing a song. Heard with the writers of the Purple Stage in today's story were Mr. Joe Granby as Lawyer Simpson, Miss Helen Gerald as Janie, Hard Cover as Bob. Your announcer was the killer, Jake Ballard. Now here is Poor Willing and the boys to bring you another of their Western Heart songs. The new and popular love ballad entitled, The Leaf of Love. The leaf of love is slowly falling Like winter's storm with rain and snow You broke a heart in one short moment I'll never forget at our first meeting. Maybe it was meant to be. I didn't think you'd prove false-hearted and kill the soul inside of me. My stormy road and traveling on now, where I will let God only know. A beam rock along the river is quiet and deep for where it flows. The leaf of love is slowly falling like winter storm with rain and snow. You broke a heart in one short moment. The leaf of love is falling low. Well, now suppose we call the great cowboy detective himself to tell you what the writers of the Purple Sage are going to sing next. All right, you guys can stop that cowboy detective stuff. Okay, Sherlock, we won't say another <laughs> word about it. <laughs> well, I expect we'd better get back to Western music and song. Here's one, Cotton, we hope will please the folks. It's an old-timer called the Train Whistle Blues. Well, all aboard, we're listening. When a woman gets the blues, she hangs her little head and she cries. When a woman gets the blues, she hangs her little head and cries. When a man gets the blues, he grabs the first train and flies. Every time I see that lonesome railroad train. Every time I see that lonesome railroad train. It makes me wish I was going home again. 
Look yonder, coming, coming down the railroad track, coming back. Look yonder, coming, coming down the railroad track. With the black smoke rolling, rolling from that old smoke It used to be that the great cattle kingdoms covered vast areas of unfenced rangeland, and a cattleman's closest neighbor might be 50 miles away. Little wonder that strangers riding by were heartily welcomed and provided with food and shelter as a matter of course. That was the beginning of the traditional Western hospitality. For the hostess who serves Weber's bread is certain that her guests and family alike will enjoy its freshness and distinctive flavor. As toast for breakfast, sandwiches for lunch, or in-between snacks, and when served with more elaborate meals, Weber's bread is always an enjoyable, substantial item on the menu. Buy Weber's bread when you go shopping. You'll find it on your grocer's shelves. The really good bread in the blue gingham wrapper. Song of the West, depicting a cowboy's religion, comes your way now from the riders of the Purple Sage as they blend their fine western voices to sing Cowboy's Heaven. <laughs> nice keeping company with you today, and we hope you'll all be on hand next week. And until then, from Al Floyd, Jimmy Dean, myself, and all of the writers of the Purple Sage, so long and good luck to you all. From Hollywood, you have heard your all-star Western theater. A V.M. Bear production starring America's great Western singers, Boy Willing and the Riders of the Purple Sage. My name is Cotton C. Clark. This program came to you from Columbia Square. K.M. Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. Come along, folks, and listen for a spell. Here's Hawk Larrabee with a tale to tell. Come a tie, I yippee, yippee, I yippee, yay. Come a tie, I yippee, yippee, yay. When you drive your first beef herd down the trail to the shipping station, you're a cowpuncher breathing dust and eating it. 
and sleeping with dust for your pillow. When you come back from the shipping station, you aren't a cowboy anymore. You're a cowman. Of course, there's still dust in your throat, but there's money in your jeans and plenty of places to spend it. When Brazos and I rode back to Silver Bow, we felt like we owned the town. It was four days since we'd been gone, and every man we saw in town seemed like a long-lost brother. Oh, here comes old Sandy Williams and his messes. Hiya, Sandy, you old rooster. Howdy, ma'am. Hi, Brazos. Howdy, folks. You're good to see you again. We just got back to town. What do you know about that? You didn't say a word. This old woman stuck her nose up. I never did take the she stuff. They answered you, but looked straight ahead when I said howdy. Oh, just deep seems like. They didn't hear you. Of course they heard me. Friends of mine, too. Oh, well, forget them. Oh, here comes Plenty Moss. Hey, Gregors. How's the alfalfa coming, Plenty? We just got back to town and... Well, I'll be another one of my friends. Something mighty strange in this town. What did I ask Buck Wheeler over here at the feed store? Hi, Buck. Getting some grain for your calves? I said, Buck Wheeler, are you getting some grain? Yeah, I'm talking to me, Larrabee. What do you think I'm talking to, that hitching post? Maybe. Maybe the hitching post won't object to being seen talking to you. Well, I'll... Listen, see. Buck. You're my neighbor. Your outfit and mine are next to each other without any fences. We got the same things to fight together. So maybe you'll help me now. I wouldn't help you if a bunch of Mojaves came to burn down your outfit, Larrabee. And there ain't no man in this town low enough to help you. Did you forget me, you old hopper grass? Maybe a horse thief like you would help him, yes. If you wasn't the old man, I'd just burn off them whiskers of your and Buck Wheeler. Stay out of this a few minutes longer, Brazos. Then maybe we'll start fighting. Sure, sure. Start fighting me, why don't you? I'm an old man, too. Only, only I ain't blind. It's only a blind man you have nerve enough to rob. Blind man? No blind man in this town. You don't mean Chuckaluck Jones. Who do you think I mean? You know well enough who you robbed. Don't talk to me. I'm going home to put up a fence between our outfits. A fence that'll keep out the smell of the wind. Chuckaluck Jones. So that's what's in the air. Oh, Chuckaluck. He must have told him about it. About what, huh? Well, don't you remember a couple of nights before we put up our trail herd, Chuck and I played a friendly game and I won his last cent. Well, who'd blame you for that? Chuck must have told it around town that you cheated him, honoring little penny ante toad frog. Well, wait till I find him. I'll make him tell the truth. I'll burn off his ears. We've got to I... find him first. Well, maybe he's at the gold bar house. Good idea. We can cool off at the same time. Come along, folks, and listen for a spell. Here's Hawk Larrabee with a tail and tail. Come a tie, I yippee yippee, I yippee yay. Come a tie, I yippee yippee yay. Hey, Pedro, some service over here. I'll shake you for two smiles, Pedro. Pass the shake box. I got no time to shake. Who pay for these drinks? You mean you aren't shaking with us? Listen here, you jug-headed little squirt. That's the insult. Hold it, Brazos. No rough stuff. Step up to the bar and have one on me. I want to know what this is all about. You'll find out. In the meantime, step up. Have a smile. Well, Brazos was hogtied. He didn't know how to figure it. While he was trying to make up his mind, I stood alone. Staring at myself in the bar mirror. I saw a long horse face with hollow black eyes. A big mouth. The face of a tragic actor playing a part on the stage. I got a funny feeling like I was dreaming. Then I realized I wasn't staring at my own face in the mirror at all, but at a gloomy-looking gent who'd sidled up beside me. He nudged me easy. Greetings to you, my lonely friend. Let's enjoy a libation together. So there's one man in town who'll drink with me. Ah, oh, yes. A friend in need. Edwin Crane, tragedian and legitimanist, joins you. As the bard says, misery loves company. Uh, two drafts of the nectar of which dreams are made, said Padro. I ask again, Horace, who is paying for this drink? It is I, my good fellow, who pays. Your health, my noble friend. So now you're treating me. A repayment for the many times you have so served me. Care not what these fair-weather friends may think. As for me, sir, methinks there is something rotten in the state of Denmark. I don't quite follow you, but anyway, thanks. It is nothing, dear friend. I could a tale unfold, but uh, <clears throat> may I inquire, sir, when are you taking leave of this miserable sun-baked clod of earth? This, this sterile promontory of hatred... And stupidity. I reckon you mean Silver Bow. Exactly. I myself was on my way to San Francisco to join the Edmund Everett Grand Shakespearean troupe. 
when I lost my, uh, <coughs> was forced to a temporary sojourn on this unfriendly shore. However, now I will continue my journey, and I was thinking perhaps we might follow the trail beyond the horizon together. I'm not trailing anywhere, Crane. I'm staying on this range. Not on this range, Larrabee. Just what do you mean by that, Bleak Top? Chuckaluck Jones here will tell you what I mean, as if you needed telling. I'm waiting to hear what you got to tell, Chuckaluck. Well, why tell you when you know every word? All I know is you came to my shack four or five nights ago and we had a little game. You admit he came to your shack? Sure, I admit it. And I won his money. He always won before, and now the first time he gets broke, he squawks. I'm squawking about your jumping my claim and leaving me in the desert to die. Leaving you where? As if you don't know. All you gents in this cantina, listen to me. I was on my way to my diggings when Hawk Larrabee followed me. How'd you notice him when you can't see? It was noon and the sun was blazing, and I can always see pretty good when there's plenty of light. Tell us what happened, Chuck. Hawk asked me for a drink of water, being his canteen was dry. I heard him drinking, and the canteen gurgling like he was filling his sombrero to water his horse. I told him it was my last water, and he handed the empty canteen back to me, and then jumped to his horse. And your own horse, Chuckaluck. Just what happened to your own horse? I heard it loping after Larrabee. He must have had the reins, but that I couldn't see. I'm just telling you what I know. But you know much more than you're telling, Chuckaluck. What more does anyone want to hear? I was left without water in the dry wash of Death Creek where the sun will bake a man's brains out in 30 minutes. A right good yarn. Best I ever heard since I was a kid listening to Jack and the Beanstalk. What's the rest of it? Maybe you don't know the rest of it, Larrabee. So I'll tell it. It was just by the grace of providence that Chuckaluck didn't die before he was found by a stray man riding for the Tumbling D. The Tumbling D? Doxy's outfit. I see how the hand's stacking up. It's beginning to make a pat hand. What difference does it make who found it? There's lots of Doxy's stray stuff drifts down the Death Creek Wash. But it was one of Doxy's riders found Chuck dying of thirst. No horse, no water. And you ain't denying it. What's the use of denying it? It's Chuck's words against mine. Chuck's got the ears of a hound dog, and the whole town will believe him. Uh, of course we believe him. Now, you men, stand back. Stand back, I tell you. If Chuck had died, it'd be different. We can't hang Larrabee for murder. Besides which, Chuck got his horse back, found it straggling in the desert. So we can't hang him for horse thieving either. I said, stand back, everybody. There's to be no smoke here. And that means you too, brothers. But me? I ain't even touched my holster. If Hawk done a thing like that to a half-blind little gent like Chuckaluck Jones, I wouldn't never speak to him myself again. You heard that, Hawk. I heard it, Brazos. Well, if you want, don't want to be dancing in there, Larrabee, you better slow fast and never show your face in this town again. Don't go away, partner, we're telling you why there's more to this story than meets with the eye. Come along, folks, and listen for a spell. Here's Hawk Larrabee with a tail to tell. Come a tie, I yippee yippee, I yippee yay. Come a tie, I yippee yippee yay. When I walked out of the gold bar house, I thought that crowd would throw a shot or two between my shoulder blades. But no one followed me for the simple reason that the town marshal stood at the door and held them back. One woozy cowboy managed to throw a bottle which whizzed past me and smashed against the water truck. I was sure at the lowest spot a man ever reached without a friend in the world. Not even that one-time bandit, Brothers John. Oh, wait a minute. I turned around. There was Brothers following me. We looked at each other like two roosters priming themselves for a good fight. And Brazos took a few steps toward me. I want to talk to you, Hulk. But it was adios between you and me, Brazos. And there's something else between me and you that I ain't forgot. A while back, this whole town figured that I changed the brands on a stray cow. And there wasn't a man jack on the whole darn range that believed me. Except you. I'm not asking you to believe anything, Brazos. Didn't say I was believing you against Chuckaluck. Not yet. But look, Hawk, there's a way I'm going to prove you innocent. You wouldn't leave that half-blind Chuckaluck out there in the desert to dry up like a trumped-on toad frog without you had some reason. This whole town thinks it knows the reason. Chuck found some more specimens which the assayer judged high grade. He was heading out to stake his claim when this trick was played on him. And whoever played the trick was a claim jumper. Ain't that reasonable? And you're figuring I'm the claim jumper. No, that's just it. Suppose the claim jumper figured that Chuck Luck was dead of thirst and couldn't tell no tales. Well, he'd ride right straight from the diggings to the recorder's office to post his location notice. 
I see what you're driving at. The recorder, Slim Barker. He'll tell us. Come on, Hawk. Recorder's office just across the street. That's where we'll get at the truth. It was a good feeling to know one man in town who refused to believe anything bad about me. Brazos was so anxious to get the proof of my innocence that he ran ahead of me and rushed into Slim Barker's office like a road agent holding up the works. I got in there as the recorder was looking through his files and right, talking. Sir, location notice right here. Hawk Larrabee brought in himself. Hawk who? Why, you just a triple-plated liar, Slim Barker. Liar, you call me. Well, who else would be filing location notice for Larrabee if it weren't him? Read that paper. Yeah. Uh, notice is hereby given the undersigned citizen of the USA has this day located and claimed the following described placer mining Let me see that paper, paper. brothers. Yeah. It's signed Hawk Larrabee. And it's your own handwriting, just like on your bills of sale for cows. Yeah, it looks like my signature. Who gave you this notice, Barker? Why, uh, you did. What are you asking fool questions for? When did I give it to you? Last Tuesday. There's the date on the notice. You came as I was closing up for the night, but I filed it for a lift. I'm still calling you a Wait, triple Brazos. play liar, you... Well... Now, you listen, Slim, let's hear that again. You say, I gave you this notice? Yeah, and you gave it fast and then turned and walked off. Maybe you figured I wouldn't recognize you, but uh, there was still enough light. I see better than Chuckaluck. Well, ain't you denying it, Hawk? I... I want to find Chuckaluck Jones first. Hope you're satisfied now, brothers. Huh. You sure picked a 17-button rattler for a partner. No, I ain't satisfied. Wait, Hawk, I'm coming. Still willing to be seen walking with me, brothers? Well, maybe yes and maybe no. What you want to find Chuckle up to for? To twist his leather neck until he squawks the truth, that's what. Well, then, then you telling me that you didn't file that location notice? What do you think? Well, I... <clears throat> throat's kind of alkaline for talking. I need me a drink. That's Jake with me. We'll step into the gold bar. Hawk, if you go in there, that crowd will make a lead pig out of you. I'll have my gun out and you'll be behind me. Or will you? Well, Hawk, if you approve the slimiest two-spot lizard on this range, I won't walk with you or drink with you or even talk to you. But I sure will fight for you. Then come on. Into the gold bar. <laughs> I'm looking for Chuckaluck Jones. He ain't here. And what you indicating that gun at me for? And if he's not here, I'm talking to you. Every man in this cantina, every man in this town is going to hear it before I'm through. One of the big cow outfits hired Chuckaluck Jones to make up this gauzy yarn about me. Oh, well, listen, Hawk, that... That don't match up with what we just found out at the land office. Everything will match up when Chuckaluck tells the truth. If he doesn't tell it, I'll blast it out of him with this gun. Oh, now, Hawk, I'm objecting to that. Little Chuckaluck's a friend of mine. Besides, he's half blind. That don't change him. Being a slimy little snake will do anything for money. Even cold deck me, the best friend he ever had. If you came in here looking for Chuckaluck, you're wasting your time. No one in here will tell you where he is. You don't have to tell me. I know where to find him. Come on, Brazos. He'll be in his shack at sundown cooking his evening bait. Wait just a minute, Hawk. If you go shoving a poor little coot like Chuckaluck around and threatening to smoke him up, well, then I am through. I don't need your help, Brazos. I can handle that little centipede alone. One moment, Mr. Larrabee. My good friend. Wait. Ah, oh, double bubble toil and trouble. Mind if I walk with you, my good friend? Still calling me your friend, Crane? To be or not to be, that is the question. It depends upon a point of honor, sir. You, uh, you're you not really going to hurt little Chuckaluck Jones, are you? Not if he tells the truth. And if he sticks to this tale told by an idiot? Then I'll... No, I won't hurt him. I blew up when I was facing that crowd in the gold bar. Didn't think what I was saying. Of course, I won't hurt a half-blind little shorthorn like Chuckaluck. Then blow winds and crack your cheeks. The point is settled. I'm your friend. Uh, shall we plan to travel to San Francisco together? We could start tonight at sundown. No, because a little after sundown, I'm going to Chuckaluck's shack on Skull Flats. I'm not leaving until I find out the truth. And after that, the dead you. After that, someone's going to get run out of this town in a pine box. Spot some Shakespeare about that, Mr. Crane. I shall. 
And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Those words of the broken-down actor Edwin Crane kept ringing in my ears as I waited for dusk to come to Skull Flats. It was a forking of the trails in my life. What I was doing was plenty drastic, taking the bull by the horns and a longhorn bull at that. Dusty death. That was what was in the air as I started walking to Chuckalock's tar-papered shack. I hear him coming now, gents. Well, I don't hear nothing. Yes, I do. Why, he's walking. Hmm. Walking instead of riding. Should have had his horse ready for sloping. He won't be sloping nowhere if he touches Chuckalock. You go in your shack, Chuck. Light a lantern so he can see you. Uh, but what if he takes a pot shot at me through the window? I'll tend to that the minute it slaps leather. Get behind this rain barrel, Brazos, and keep low. There's still some red light in the sky. Just the right light for sharpshoot. Here he comes. He's drawn his gun. He's gonna throw a shot through the window. No, he ain't. Put your hands up, Hawk. All the air, Larry. What you talking about, Blink Chuck? My head stays where it is and there's a gun in it. Don't walk out in the open, Brazos. I ain't going to be bluffed this easy. I meant what I said, Brazos. If you come a step closer, I'll shoot. Well, I'm coming, Hope. Stay back, Brazos. I'm warning. Stop. Stop. My, my hand. Where'd that shot come from? Not from me. Hold up. It come from over yonder behind that water trough. Don't pick up that gun, Larry. Now, maybe I'll put up your hands. I, I can't. My hand, a slug smashed it. His gun hands dripping blood. It wasn't me that throwed that shot, Hawk. What? Well, you ain't acting like Hawk Larry. Be whimpering that away. The man who shot you is hiding behind that water trough. Find out who it is, Brazos, while I doctor up this vomit. It ain't necessary. Standing up behind a trough coming in. It. What? Why, it's Hawk. That's Hawk Larrabee. What are you talking about? Here's Hawk right here. Somebody been feeding me loco weed. I'm seeing double. There's two Hawks. You're right, brothers. There's two of us. Me and this imitation hawk are shot in the hand. Well, I'll... I'll be hornswoggled. I can't believe my eyes. Hey, hey, Chuckalock, bring that lantern out here. Uh, I'm coming, Bleak Top. I know there's something wrong about this sniveling coyote here. Uh, what's happened, Bleak Top? I don't know. We come here to protect you from Hawk Larrabee, and we find two of them. Hold that lantern here to his face. Come on, sit up on Rick. Turn your face so as I can see it. Pretty good makeup. Long nose, wig. And this tall, peaked sombrero. I, I could have sworn it was you, Larry. Uh, but to just who is the it? The man who stole my saddle horse and rode out to the desert to steal your water, Chuck. He's the man who forged my name to your location notice. Yes, but his voice, it was you. There's one man in this town who can imitate my voice and any other voices he has a mind to. He was paid to impersonate me and play that trick on you, so I'd be kicked off this range. Yes, but I can't see him. Who, who is it? Wait till I take off this putty from his nose, then we'll see. I knew this was the man hired to frame me because he had money for drinks for the first time in a month. You slipped up doing that, Mr. Crane. What? It's Edwin Crane, not that play actor. Well, I'll be good, gosh darn. But if you knew this whizzer was being pulled on you, Larrabee, why didn't you come and tell well, me? Oh, believe me. The only man on this range who would have believed me was Brezos John, but I was afraid he'd start shooting before I had this lizard trap. But you announced in the gold bar that you was coming up here to give little Chuck a luck a lap. I wanted Crane to impersonate me again so he'd get him red-handed. When he heard me threatening to kill Chuck, it was his chance to do some shooting and get me blamed for it. Please, please, gentlemen. I'm not well. Me very lifeblood is heavy. <laughs> what are you gentlemen going to do with me? Get you to a bunk and call a medico to fix that wound. Oh. It is not as wide as a barn door, nor deep as a well, but twill serve, twill serve. For this relief, much thanks. It is bitter cold, and I am sick at heart. You should be. It was Rance Doxy paid you to do this, wasn't it? Aye. Me poverty, but not me will, consented. You can't talk any other way, can you, even when you're hurt? All the world's a stage. And all the men and women merely play us. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts. Believe me, gentlemen, this has been the bitterest role of all. And I am undone. Gentlemen, herewith cracks a noble heart. I know a little Shakespeare myself. The quality of mercy is not strained. It falleth as a gentle rain from heaven. You, 
You mean... I mean there's nothing you can hold Crane on, is there, Bleak Top? Well, now, I don't rightly and know. And since he I... was whipsawed into this, maybe he'd better just hit the trail for Frisco. Alone and fast. Hark! I called the world to witness what a noble heart beats here. I thank you, me noble friend. But as for Rance Doxy, the whole range is going to hear about but this. But you can't go gunning for him, Hawk. He didn't kill Chuckaluck, and he sent one of his riders to save him. Sure, he wanted Chuck alive so he could tell this darn story. And to think it, I nearly believed it. Hawk, I guess I was loco. Huh. Can you forgive me? Sure, brothers. You tried your best to believe in me. I guess I didn't help you any. Well, then, we we still partners? Sure, we're partners, Ryan and Titan. Well, then, it's all right. Well, then, as Crane might say, all's well that ends well. It's a mighty wide loop that Hawk Larrabee throws, but it's all well that ends well, as the old saying Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Marshal's closed up the stable and gone home for the night, Mr. Jones. Well, Andy Weaver must be around, though. He always is. Don't see no sign of him. Well, I'll... Oh. I'll, I'll open the door and we can get the horses inside, at least. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. I declare I'm so tired I can lay right down the stall and sleep with my horse. The way you roll around, the horse would get a worse kicking than you would. Uh, now, the only time I toss much is when I've had something that don't set right with me. And it ain't too often I do that. No, sure isn't. Say, we're going to have to bed these horses down ourselves, Mr. Dillon? No, Andy will do it. He's probably in the back room. Come on, let's go see. I declare I just couldn't have rode another mile tonight. Uh, it was either ride to no, Dodge or to camp up. I can prove it to you, too. Hey, listen, boys about sounds it, it like Andy's got easier, somebody right? with him. And they will, too. Mm-hmm. Andy's talking to himself more than likely. Just oh, keep awake. Right sure. Well, a livery stable sure. doesn't need much of a night watchman now, anyway, I guess. Right hand, well, I'm not saying I don't believe it, Andrew, but yeah. I'm not saying that I do believe it. That's old Miles McTagg and with him. <laughs> the well, the two time. biggest liars in Dodge are out of the camp. All they need now is Doc. Black Hill. Man, he never even seen the Black Hill. Right and then them Indians jumped on me. A dozen and a half of them. A hoop and then a holler and a shooting arrows. I seen I only had one chance, so I spurred <laughs> my horse and I rode for the timber. That dog on the old liar. He got that story out of Ned Bunt line. One of the boys we had in jail one time read it. In five minutes, them two trees were so full of arrows they looked like porcupines. And when the fight was over, there was 14 Indians laying dead all around me. Other two got away while I was reloading. Well, that's only 16. You said there was a dozen and a half. Well, that's only a matter of speaking. 16 is the same as a dozen and a half. Aha. No, it is not. It lacks two. 18 is a dozen and a half. Now, <laughs> let's go on and say hello, Chester. All right, you guys. Oh, dang it, Miles. I told you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, Marshal. Evening, Eddie. Oh. Miles. Good evening, Matthew. Chester. Oh, Mr. McTagg. Oh, what's the matter, Andy? Well, uh, opening the door that way, sudden like it. 
Oh, God dang it, Marshal, you ought to knock first. Why, my land, an old Indian fighter like you hadn't ought to get spooked over nothing that happened, Andy. Andy. You shut up, Chester. I know what I know. Yeah, too bad there ain't nobody else does. Yeah, one of them boys will come through here someday. You believe me, don't you, Marshal? Well, Andy, all that was a long time ago. Oh, you you doubt my word, is that it? <sighs> no, I didn't say I doubted your word, Andy. Oh, and it's all right, Marshal, I... Maybe it's best just to forget it. No, now, I was just funning you, yeah, Andy. Sure, Chester, I, I know. Well, I, I better get your horses unsaddled and bed it down. Uh, Andy, why don't you let them cool some before you water them, huh? Yes, sir. Oh, that's a pity, Matthew. He's a fine-hearted old man. It's a shame he's so prone to prevaricate. Well, he's like a lot of us, Miles. He tells about the things he wishes he'd done, wishes he had the courage to do. Marshal. Yeah, what is it, Andy? There's somebody here. It's... Uh, Evening, he... Marshal. Chester. What? Hard Logan. I didn't know you were out, huh? You've been paroled a week ago, Marshal. Two years, seven months. Parole. Don't ever go to prison, Marshal. It's no good. Yeah, so I hear. You traveling with the Beckett brothers again? Now, Marshal, the warden told me to stay away from evil companions. Uh Uh-huh. Of course, the Beckett boys ain't evil officially. They didn't go to prison. Andy here didn't identify them like he done me. Well, I I only told the truth, Hod. Sure you did, Andy. Stood right up there in court and told him you seen me run out of the bank. Told him I was wearing a mask, but it slipped and you seen my face. Yeah, I, I, I did. It was right brave of you, Andy. Downright brave. And now I'm back. And you, you better leave me alone, Hod. You better not bother me. What are your plans, Hod? Oh, reckon I'll hang around Dodge a while, Marshal. Look up my old friends. Drop in and pass the time with Andy here once in a while. No, 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 you, you, you stay away from me. No, that ain't being very kind to a man who's paid his debt, Andy. It's only paid up till now, Hud. Don't go open up a new account. Now, it's a funny thing, Marshal. Man can't always plan too far ahead. You don't always know just how things are going to work out. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Old Dobbin must decide that for himself. Similarly, we can lead you to the font of knowledge. We can tell you how, when, and where, but it's up to you to make the next move. As a member of the United States Armed Forces on active duty, you have the opportunity to continue your education through the United States Armed Forces Institute. The courses are varied and practically unlimited in scope. There is something for everyone. Your education officer has a USAFI catalog available. Sit down and discuss a correspondence or group course with him. It's your opportunity to increase your power through knowledge with USAFI. There's the long branch right there ahead of us. Yeah. It's always been there as far as I remember, Chester. Well, yes, sir, I know, but as long as we're passing it anyhow, don't you reckon we might as well look in for a minute? Oh, what for? Well, my land to say hello to whoever's in there. (laughs) Like Sam Nolan, for instance? Well, yeah, Sam. Anybody else, too, of course. What's the matter with you? You got a dime that's burning a hole in your pocket. <laughs> I could do with a glass of beer, as far as that's concerned. Uh, all right, Chester, but uh, I'm not going to stay long. I want to go see the doc. Well, maybe he's in there. No, no, the light's burning in his office. Well, 
Matt. Hey, Rick, oh, Kitty. Rick Kitty. Come on in out of the weather. Whatever they use for weather this time of year. You like a drink? Well, I think Chester's got a beer in mind, yeah. Uh, well, see, the truth is, I thought as long as I was here, I'd get me a glass of rye with a little dab of sugar in it. <laughs> for that matter, I think I'll just go get it while I got the chance. Uh, Sam? Yeah, the place looks real quiet tonight. Yeah, too quiet, man. That's good for you, I guess. Not for me. Oh, business will pick up. The rains are about over now. The trail herds will be rolling in before long. Well, something better happen or Sam and I will have to start taking in each other's wash to make a living. <laughs> I can't quite see you taking in wash, Kitty. You know something, Matt? Neither can I. Come on. Have one on me this time. I won't help business, honey. Well, it looks like business anyway. Hey, hey, wait a minute, kid. Hmm? What is it, man? What's he doing over there? Randy? Yeah, he's supposed to be holding another night watchman's job over the livery stable. Oh, I don't know. He's been here for about an hour. He's wearing a gun, too. Look, uh, Kitty, I'll take you up on that offer a little later. Huh? Sure, Matt. Anytime. I'll be along. <laughs> Hello, Andy. Oh, how's it oh, going? Oh, <laughs> now you kind of snuck up on me there. Oh. Uh-huh. The, uh... Stable running itself tonight? No, no, I, I was just going over. I, I was just uh, fixing to leave. I see. I, uh, 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 Marshal. Yeah. Marshal Hod, Hod Logan's aiming to kill me. Did he say so, Andy? He, he don't say nothing. At least, mostly don't. He just there, though. Four or five times a night. Every night this week. At the stable? Yeah. Well, why? Well, uh, looking in on his horse, he says... He's keeping it there. But that ain't why he hangs around, Marshal. He's fixing to kill me. That's what he's doing. How do you know, Andy? You just told me that he never said anything. Well, he don't have to. It's the way he looks. Just a grin and not saying nothing. Last night, kind of late it was, I, I went out the back door toward the corral. And there he was, leaning against the post, just a grinning at me. Is that why you took to wearing a gun? Oh, I got to, Marshal. He's, he's aiming to kill me. Well, if he is, the gun won't stop him. He wouldn't have a chance against Hot Logan. Well, then, uh, what, what am I going to do, Marshal? First thing is to stop letting him get your goat. Well, I can't help it. I ain't no gunfighter. All them tall stories that I've been telling, I, I never done nothing like that. Well, then don't start anything now, not with Hot. That's what he wants you to do, so he'll have an excuse. Excuse for what? Now, you've already said it, Andy. An excuse to kill you. <laughs> See how this is coming along, Matt. Oh, yes, we got to get those stitches out. Can you roll that sleeve up a little higher? Well, if I do, I'll choke myself, but I'll try. Um, how's that, Doc? Fine, fine, fine. <clears throat> fine. Yes, that seems to be healing all right. Yeah, that's huh? a sign of good blood. Isn't oh, it? your blood's all right, I reckon. What you got left of it? <laughs> what you got left of it? Bullet wounds, nothing but bullet wounds since I came out here to this blasted frontier. You know, man, it'd be a downright pleasure to treat a plain, oh, say a bellyache, a nice case of the gout. You wouldn't know what to do with a civilized practice, yeah, Doc, kind you of know it. It'd be kind of nice to find out, though. Now, you want to brace yourself kind of here, man. i got to get those stitches out. Well, now. go ahead. Oh, i got a hold of them now, so I just wanted it. <laughs> What did you do? Sew them through the bone? Well, you're lucky you got a bone there. An inch to the right and you wouldn't have. So why don't you steer clear of some of these gunmen, Matt? Well, I will if they'll stay clear of Dodge. <coughs> That's two of them, uh... Yeah. Uh... Oh, see, I understand Hod Logan is back. Yeah, he's been hanging around town for about a week. I thought maybe he'd head on west and try to find the Beckett brothers. Mm, those Beckett brothers. They were pretty thick, weren't they, for a while? Before Hard went to prison. Uh, they ought to have gone, too, but we didn't have enough case against them. <clears throat> Hurts, doesn't it? 
<laughs> Doc, if you were up around my mouth, I'd swear you were pulling teeth instead of stitches. Well, you didn't bellow when I sewed you up. <laughs> yeah, but you gave me a half a bottle of whiskey that time. Mr. Dillon? Uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? It's them Beckett's, Mr. Dillon. They're huh? back in town. Somebody's seen them about an hour ago. Uh, Doc, the rest of these will have to wait. I want to go talk to them before they meet too many old friends. <laughs> Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Joe. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm up. I'm up. I forget breakfast. I'll shave at work. Joe, it's not time to go to work. Then why'd you wake me up? You were snoring. How about that? You were snoring loud. Oh, really? I just wanted to quiet you. I thought I was quiet. You sounded like a buzzsaw going through a pine knot. Pretty good, pretty good. I wish I could be with you at 2.30 in the morning. You can go back to sleep now. Oh, gee, thanks. You can get a good night's sleep, too. Our savings bonds will protect us. Huh? They protect us. The money we invest is used to protect our country and its freedoms. Why, all around us, we can see the safeguards that our bonds have paid for. How about that? So, you see, when you buy that savings bond with every paycheck, you're really investing in a secure night's sleep. Not in this house, I'm not. What? Good night, Daphne. Good night, Joe. Stable two hours ago, and he checked out of the Dodge house. Maybe they've all hit the trail together. No, they're still in town somewhere. Well, there's no reason to expect them to try something the minute they get together, are they? Oh, why not? That's what Hod's been waiting around for. I couldn't figure him wasting a week like that just to get even with Andy Wimmer. Mm. Oh, wait a minute. What's the matter? No, I was just thinking. Now, Hod's been hanging around the stable there at odd hours of the night. I figured that he was just trying to prod Andy into drawing on him, but... Yeah, that might be something else. Uh, Chester, let's take a walk down between the stable and the general store, huh? All right. <laughs> Get all Andy ought to clean up some of this junk and put that dog on fire. Hey, be quiet, Chester. Yes, sir. Careful, watch it. What is it? A broken glass. Don't step on it, it'll make a noise. No. Hey, look. Somebody's busted open the window on the side of the store there. They've tore all the boards off. Yeah. So that's why Hod was hanging around the stable. People would get used to seeing him and not think nothing of it. That's what your man in. Right? They're inside the store. Yeah. Probably after Jonas is safe, you could bust it open with a crowbar. Well, I don't know. Probably after Jonas is safe, you could bust it open with a crowbar. They're going to be mighty surprised when they find us waiting for him here. We're not going to be waiting for him. Why not? I'm not sure that all three of them are in there. One of them might be out back in the stable with their horses. Now, look, you go back out to the street and go across to the long branch and get Sam Noonan to help you, and you wait there. And if Hard and the Beckett's come out that way, you stop them. Well, now, they ain't coming out the front way. Can you know You it? do as I tell you. I'm going to be back at the stable. Yes, sir. But you be careful, Mr. Young. Well, Hey, cut 
you, my dolly. I reckon that'll learn you hard. <laughs> it's not hard, you crazy fool. Marshal. Keep your voice down. Oh, first, I'm mighty sorry. I put them traps there for Hard Logan so he couldn't sneak into the back of the stable. Well, get a trap setter and open this thing, will you? Yes, sir, right away. I got one hit up here with that water barrel. Hey, that's Hard Logan. Let's get to the horses and ride out of here. He's up there between the stable and the store. Be quiet. Here, let me roll over and get my gun clear. First, and I'll take time to finish the land we Stand where you are, Hard. What? You're under arrest. Get your hands up. Get back to the building. You haven't got a chance, Hard. Now, come on out. Come and get us, Marshal. we got to get undercover, Marshal. We're right out here in plain sight. Then get that setter and open this trap. I can hold them in back of the building. They can't get a shot at me without stepping out into the open. He's caught in one of them bear traps, boy. Well, Stepped well, on well, one of them traps well, we seen Andy set well, this well. afternoon. You take one step from behind that building, Hard, and it'll be your last one. Don't have to take a step, Marshal. Just toss a match is all. Toss a match? Hey, he's going to set fire to the straw. Oh, he, you'll burn to death, Marshal. I'll try and find something to force that trap open. No, there's no time for that. Look that barrel of water there. Run out and tip it over, will you? Well, that's right by the corner of the building. I can't go out there. There ain't much cover. Here, take my gun. And go out shooting. It'll keep him off balance. Now, hurry. That fire's going to get oh, close. I, I can't, Marshal. They'll kill me. Look, Andy, they aim to kill you before they leave anyway. Hard wants to get even with you. Now, go on. I can't. I, I just can't go out there, Marshal. I can't. All right, Andy, just get clear then. No use of you burning, too. Oh, no, I... Oh, take no use, Marshal. I, I can't do that neither. I can't leave you here. Here, give me your gun, Marshal. Here. And good luck. It's Andy. Get him, boy. You dirty coward! Andy! Dump that barrel over! I've got it, Marshal! <coughs> I've done it, Marshal. I've done it. I've done just like you told me. And I think maybe I got hard and one other. The third man got away. Well, we'll get him, all right. Now go get that trap setter. I got it. I brought it back with me. I stood right up to him, gun to gun, didn't I, Marshal? Yeah, you sure did, Andy. Now hurry it up, will you? Yeah. Uh. 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 Well, Andy, you can forget about that Indian story now. I think this one's better. And I'll sure be around to back you up. Directed by Norman MacDonald. Stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. George Walsh speaking. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gunsmoke. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Here they come. They're riding fast. They're riding hard. Time for excitement and adventure in the modern West with Bobby Benson and the B-Bar B-Riders. <laughs> adventure, The Shadow of a Dead Man. Our adventure for today starts with an ancient train rattling along toward the Big Bend country of Texas. There are many passengers on the train, but our only interest is in one, a little old man who sits all alone listening to the hum of the wheels. But to him, they sing a very special song. Tex Mason. 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 Yes, the drumming of the wheels grinds that name into the old man's ears like a hollow chant as the train rattles on. Tex Mason. The man he's crossed the continent to meet. For a moment, his tired eyes narrow at the thought. And then as the eerie shriek of the train whistle suddenly blasts into his ears, a new thought is wedded to it. death in the guise of a pleasant-faced old man is on its way to the B-Bar B. But on the ranch itself, there isn't the slightest inkling of it. Instead, the thoughts of all of our friends are filled with just one subject, the coming Christmas season. Oh, golly, fellas. Isn't Christmas time great? Hey, no, that's not fair, Bobby. If you let your eyes go on and shine that way, you'll make the lights in our Christmas tree seem like nothing. <laughs> oh, quit teasing me, Irish. I can't help it if I'm entirely excited. Oh, shucks. Now, you just ignore him, little boss. <laughs> Why, there ain't a boy been born yet that don't get head up over the thought of Christmas presents. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean just the presents, Wendy. I mean, well, the way folks act. Everybody acts so nice and warm. I know what you mean, son. Like, well, like the Christmas season opens the door and lets the good side of folks shine out. Yes, that's it. God, I just wish folks... We'd act the same way all year. Amen to that, Bobby. Yeah, well, if you ask me, I still think the presents is the best part of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing, little boss. You ain't never going to find where I hid the present I got for you. Oh, I wouldn't want to find it, Wendy. It's more fun to be surprised. Oh. Well, if you did go looking for it, you'd still never find where I hid it. And just what makes you so sure of that, Mr. Wales? You want to know what makes me so sure? Yes. Yeah. Well, if you must know, it's because I forgot where I hid it. Now I can't find it. Oh, no, no Wendy. <laughs> Quit laughing, dog. This is a predicament I'm in. Well, if I know you, Wendy, you blunder out of your predicament as easily as you blundered in. Yeah, but... But Christmas or no Christmas, we've still got work to do. Son, how'd you like to ride down to the South 40 with me while I do some fence mending? Sure thing, Tex. Hey, and we'll take your own along. The run will be doing good. Come on. All right, then, son. Let's go saddle up. Hey. Sorry, Sonny. Didn't mean to frighten you. I was just about to knock when you opened the door. I'm uh, looking for someone. Feller named Tex Mason. And that's why I'm here, Mr. Mason. I was told as how you folks might uh, help me. Charlie, are you really going to write an article on Christmas on the ranch? Well, I'm hoping to. That is, if I can find enough that's uh, interesting. But what made you pick the B Bar B to write about? Well, I thought it'd be good human interest, you know. What with a boy here and all, uh, believe me, I'll be mighty obliged if you'll just let me stay here a few days, Mr. Mason, and I'll be glad to pay whatever you... Put your wallet away, Mr. So you haven't told us your name. Oh, well, (laughs) the name I write under is Emerson J. Smith, but uh, most folks just call me Smitty. (laughs) Well, Smitty, we have a sort of prejudice here on the ranch. Eh? We don't like to see price tags hung on hospitality. You're welcome to stay, but only as a guest. Yes, but I... Well, (laughs) all right, I I won't insist if that's the way you want it. It's the way. And now, suppose we see about getting you settled. Irish! Yeah, Tex. Iris, this is Smitty. Hello. You'll be staying with us over the holidays, so I suppose you see about picking up a bunk for him. Well, sure thing. Come on along, Smitty. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Mason. I sure do appreciate this. Glad to help. Oh, God, Jack. 
He was like a nice old fellow. Uh huh. And imagine an article all about the VRV. It's an exciting text. Text? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, son. I'm afraid I didn't hear you. Golly, Tex, what are you worrying about now? Well, I'm not worrying, son. Not exactly. I'm just a little skeptical about our friend Smitty's story. Oh, well, never mind. Smitty's our guest. We'll try to make him welcome. <laughs> moment in the bunkhouse where he lies stretched out on a cot. The strange old man is not concerned with his welcome at the B Bar B. His mind is on the past. On that day almost ten years ago, when he received the news that has haunted and driven him ever since. The news of the manner of his son's death. That's the story, Mr. Smith. Your son and this Tex Mason was in a spot where only one of them could come out of it alive. Mason's the one that lived. Your son's the one that died. Mason lived. Your son died. Mason lived. Your son died. And now, at last I've found you, Mason. Now? Now it's my turn. Smitty, being a writer like you are, I just knowed you'd be a dying to hear some of my reminiscences about the old days in the West. Well, actually, Wendy, my interest Yes, sir, is... I tell you, I got no. such a good memory that, I... <laughs> well, shucks, I can even remember things that never happened. I was... <laughs> no, I remember back in the old days but, being... But, uh, Wendy, what I've right been with... trying to tell you is that I'm not interested in writing about the old West. I'm, I'm more interested in the West of today. Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, now, that's just the way all of us modern Westerners feel about it. <laughs> you take me, for example. Oh, now, it's modern... windy. Well, Penny, you all set? Hmm? Set uh, for what, Mr. Mason? What for the... Hey, wait a minute. Windy, didn't you tell him? <laughs> My goodness, I, I guess I, I sort of forgot what I come in for, Tex. <laughs> you got to talking there and... <laughs> Well, you know how it is. Yes, Wendy, I know. Uh, what uh, What is this all about, Mason? I sent Wendy in to ask if you want to ride along with us. You see, this is the day that we get to play Santa Claus. Yeah, for some Mexican families in the region. Mm, it's gotten to be a custom on the ranch, Smitty. Each year we get together some food and gifts and take them down to them. If we didn't, I'm afraid they wouldn't have much of a Christmas. And it uh, salves your own conscience, huh, Mason? Huh? That's a strange remark. Huh? Oh, uh, sorry, Mr. Mason. I guess it did sound sort of funny, but you see, it's just a sort of standing gag back home. Uh, nothing personal, meant you. Uh, you say you're ready to leave now? Just about. Just a few more things to load on the buckboard. Well, uh, uh, go, go right ahead. I, I'll be right with you. I wouldn't miss this for anything. No, sirree, not for anything. <laughs> Senor Mason, already you have done so much for my family. How can we... We fight? won't even listen to any argument, Juan. Come on, boys, load him down so he's too busy to talk. All right, yeah, but it's just... Senor yeah, Mason, one. we can't... Uh, 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 Here's something for your kids. Kids! Uh, for amigos, I can... Uh, a present for your wife. Uh, uh, and to make their food for your Christmas dinner. Oh, 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 Senor Mason, how can we accept this? Already we are in your debt. You're uh, not in debt to anyone, Juan. Except maybe St. Nick. Save your thanks for him. <laughs> Senors, I... Uh, bless you, amigos. Bless you. And a Merry Christmas to you, Juan. All right, boys, that's the last call. Let's head for home. Not too fast for that buckboard, Juan. Well, Smitty, getting the kind of material you wanted? Yeah. What do you think of our Christmas in the big band? Well, I... I have to admit I'm impressed, but, um... Uh, Wait, what, Smitty? Oh, nothing. Nothing, Irish. I just... Uh, hey, Freddy B., what's that? Hey. Oh, my gosh, a little boy! He's been pitched off the buckboard! Hey, he's just lying there. He's been hurt. Come on, boys, we've got to get to Bobby and hurry! <laughs> hey, 
Thank you, dear. All right. I don't know yet. Bobby. Son. Can you hear me? Oh, Dad. Oh, go on. He's oh. coming to you. Easy, son. You had a bad fall. Mm. I remember now. Horses. Started acting up. I know, son. We saw it. They must have been frightened by something. They were. I saw it just before I... Phil. It was a rattle, Tex. He's over there on the... Tex, look out. He's still over there. Glory be. Oh, God. That rattler was heading straight for us. It was all set to strike. It... Why, you shot its head clean off. Doggone, Smitty. Where'd you learn to shoot like that? Yes, yeah, Smitty, I didn't even know you had a gun. I've had one a good many years. Carried it for just this reason. I've been waiting for the day I could kill a snake. Huh? Golly, you sure? I bought it in a town up north, Mason. One you might know on the edge of the desert. A town called Crow Flats. Crow Flats? But it's Smitty. Look, Smitty, wait. What do you mean by that? Smitty! Oh, God, he just rid off. There he goes. How do be, Tex? What does all that mean? What, what's this about Crow Flat? It... Nothing, Irish. Yeah, but you asked me. Like nothing. Uh... Crow Flat is just a town. Something happened there once that... Well, I'd almost forgot. When Smitty mentioned the name of the town, it... Brought it back. Yeah, but what happened? I'd rather not talk about it, son. Just, just forget it. Now let's head back to the ranch. Irish. Yeah. Oh, golly, Irish, I'm worried. About Tex? Golly, he's acting so strange. Ever since we got back, he's locked himself up in his office like, like a prisoner. Yeah, it's strange, all right. And Smitty's acting mighty queer, too. Smitty? Have you seen him? Well, sure. Didn't you know? He's right here. He was stretched out in his cot in the bunkhouse when we got back. But he won't say so much as a word. He was. What could it all mean? Well, they don't hey, know it. Hey, fellas, come on. Come on out to the corral. Is it, Wendy? Trouble? Trouble? Shucks, no. Why should there be? <laughs> no, it's just that we're going to have ourselves a song pass. A what? A song pass. You know... It's getting dark, so we're all going to build us a fire and sit around it and sing. A song pass. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I should have known. Well, so sorry. Everybody can't be as clever as me. <laughs> but come on. We're counting on you to start things wrong, little boss. Oh, golly, Wendy, I can't. Not well, oh, come on, little boss. You gotta. Please. Pretty please with Tabasco on it. Mm, all right, Wendy. I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> well, little boss, what about him? What you gonna start us off with? Guy, I don't know, Wendy. I feel like Oh, I'm... come on, Bobby. There's nothing you can do anyhow. Maybe a song will cheer you up. Hey, I know. Matter of fact, there ain't but one song to start off a Christmas party with. How about Jingle Bell? Hey, 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 hey. All right, fellas. If you'll join in with well, me. Well, what are we waiting on? Haul out the guitar, are we? So let's get a rolling here. <laughs> Bobby, hey, Irish, how about you now? Of yeah, course, you ain't got a malodorous voice like me, yeah, but right. how about doing a song? Yeah, go ahead. You go ahead and sing while I go and detect and make sure everything's okay. Yeah, but... Oh, come right. on, Irish. This ain't no time to get bashful now. Come on. We ain't no striking up there. Right. Oh, please, oh, not to disturb the happy life. 
gathers gather about the bonfire. Bobby Benson slips away and slowly makes his way toward the tiny light that flickers out of Texas office. In his ears, his mind, is a strange blending of the happy Christmas spirit with an odd premonition of fear. He can still hear Iris singing as he makes his way to the door of Texas office. But with the opening of that door, he enters an entirely different world. Hey! Oh, golly, Texas. Uh, Inside, Bobby. And no noise. Smitty. Smitty, let go and put it down. Not until I've done what I came here for. All right, Mason, what about it? You were just about to answer me. Is the story I heard true? Hey, what are you talking about? What story? Story of how Smitty's son... Died. Huh? That's right. My son. What's that got to do with that? Well, Mason, you want to tell him? That he heard that years ago his son and I were out prospecting in the desert up near Crow Flat. That we got ourselves in a spot where we knew that only one of us could live. He heard that I got out. I left his son to die. But it isn't true. Tell him it isn't. Dad. That's what I'm here to find out. It's taken me near ten years since then to find me. Now I want to know if the story is true. And if it is? If it is, Mason, I'm going to kill you. You're going to pay with your own life for that of my son. Well, Mason, what about it? Do you deny the story? No, Smitty. The story you heard is true. Out by the corral of the BBRB, around the flickering campfire, are gathered most of our friends. They're singing, they're happy with that warm joy which comes once each year at the Christmas season. And inside the ranch house, Bobby Benson and his foreman, Tex Mason, face death. You admit it, Mason. You admit it? No, Schmitty, please. Put down the gun. Get out of my way, Bobby. I don't want to hurt you, but I'm not... No, I won't let you kill Tex. I won't. At least let him explain. What is there to explain? He admits the story is true. He left my son to die. Must there be a reason? Tex, please. Tell him, Tex. Please. For a moment, the foreman of the Bobby doesn't speak. He sits passively, almost disinterested, as death stares him in the face. And then at last, he begins the story. Actually, there isn't much to tell, except a few details. It was almost ten years ago. His son, Dave, and I had been out on a prospecting trip. We both are pretty young, not too much experience. So we got ourselves into a spot. Bad spot. We traveled a long way from civilization, way out into the desert. By the end of the fourth day, our water was pretty low. But we weren't worried. We had a map showing a water hole just ahead. There it is, Tex, just like the map said. <laughs> and you were worried. Come on, we're gonna... Tex! It was empty. The water hole was where the map showed that it was dry. But even then, it needn't have been too bad. We could have made it back. But we didn't. We can't go back, Tex. Not when we've come this far. And the next water hole's only a day away. Let's head for it, Tex. Come on, be a sport. So we went on. And taking the chance, I was as much to blame as Dave. We went on and on. Not one day, it took two. By the time we reached the water hole, our emergency canteens were near empty. We both hoarded our water that last day. We were nearly out from exhaustion and thirst. But we reached it at last. Reached it and found... No! It's empty too, Tex. It's empty, too. For a long time, the two of us sat at the edge of the dried-up water hole without saying a word. For the first time, we knew what we faced. We knew what little chance a man had in the desert without water. 
And we knew the water we had left was not enough for two. Let's face it, Tex. If we go together, it only means we'll both die. But if one of us had all the water, he might make it out. Why should we both die? It wasn't a nice choice. The life of one to pay for the life of the other. But the alternative was death for both. It's the only way out, Tex. The toss of a coin. In the morning, the winner takes the water and strikes out one way. The loser tries for the next water hole. Come on, toss it, Tex. Flip the coin. I take heads, Tex. Well, which is it? Which was it, Tex? Well, tell us. It was tails, son. I'd won. So, you took the water... And left my son. He left me, Smitty. During the night, he slipped away. There was nothing I could do but try to make my way out. And I did. Gosh. You mean he... He deliberately went off, knowing he died? Left you the water and took off so you couldn't stop him? He... He was a brave man. You can be proud he was your son. A braver son than his father. He had the courage to give his life so you could live. And me. All I could think of was my own loss and how I could get even. I can't blame you, sir. I can. I was a fool. Coming here to kill you. I'm just... Just thankful I was stopped in time. I... Excuse me, will you, Mason? It, it's getting kind of smoky. Something in here, and I, I'd better get me outside. Get some fresh air. Thanks. Oh, Christ, thank goodness you told him this story. But, Guy, why didn't you tell him before? Dad, why are you looking at me that way? The story... It was true, wasn't it? No, son. But... But you did win, didn't you? Yes, that part was true. And Dave did take off during the night. But you see... He took the water with him. You mean... Cheated on you? That's why I didn't tell the old man before, son. I managed to find my way out of the desert somehow, even without the water. Dave didn't make it, even with the water. When I knew he was dead, I couldn't hurt the old man even more by letting him know his son died a coward. What a chance you took. He might have killed you. It was worth the chance. Come on, son, let's head outside. Seems to me I heard some of the boys singing before. Let's join them. So ends another adventure with the B. Bobby Riders. And don't forget, you can follow the further adventures of Bobby Benson in the Bobby Benson comic book. Featured today, Bobby Benson, Bob Haig, Wendy Wales, Don Knott, Gilbert Mack, Benton Hayworth Jr., Frank Milano, and Harker. The B. Bobby Riders is produced by Herbert Rice, directed by Bob Novak. Script was by Jim Sheehan. Original music composed and conducted by John Gart. Special guitar effects by Tommy Luke. This is Jack the Carl Warren speaking, and saying for the whole gang... Your part, Bobby Benson. Tex Mason. Irish. Oh, I don't know. We windy way. And Harker. Yes, the whole gang on the BBRB wish you a very... Merry Christmas! This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. There's something loose on that mountaintop that's bigger than any man I've ever seen. And stronger. Before I leave, I intend to find out what it is. Have gone.
begun. Will travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel. Headquarters of a man called Paladin. You will not change your mind, Mr. Paladin. You still go? I'm afraid so, hey, boy. Oh, by the way, uh, send a dozen long-stemmed roses to Miss Julie Parker and regrets. Oh, do not go there, Mr. Paladin. Please. Why not? Why does this trip bother you so much? Oh, I read a newspaper. Monster at Moon Ridge. Lady bewitched by apparition. Oh, please, you don't go there, Mr. Paladin. I've already been hired and accepted. I'm leaving right away. Oh, then... Let me... Please? Well, what have you got in that jar? Please? Ah, uh, yeah. Dragon tooth powder. Dragon tooth? These are... One here. And one here. Keep you from harm. Dragon's tooth powder. Very powerful protection. Your new country has a better formula for destroying superstition, hey boy. Equal parts of reason and daylight. But I thank you for the friendship behind the thought. Oh, uh, then you go. You see Mr. Vito Bella? That's right. Vito Bella. Bowtown, California. <laughs> Even if you've had embarrassing dandruff for years, you can get rid of it now in three minutes. That's all it takes with Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Yes, unsightly dandruff's gone in three minutes with Fitch, quickest, easiest of all leading shampoos. What's more, using Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep embarrassing dandruff away. Just apply in the unique Fitch manner. Before you wet hair, rub in one minute. This way, Fitch shampoo penetrates right down to the scalp. Next, add water. Lather one minute to wash every trace of dandruff out of your hair. Then rinse one minute. All that loosened dandruff goes down the drain. In three minutes, with Fitch, one rubbing, one lathering, one rinsing, dandruff's gone. At the same time, gentle Fitch can leave your hair up to 35% brighter. To get rid of dandruff problems forever, brighten hair too. Use Fitch regularly. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today, only 59 cents. The Indians have a name for the high mountain lands back of Placerville. They call it Shadow Ground. Indians have a way of seeing things in the shape of a piece of land that no white man can see. So they always bypass it. Like the thunder that boiled up against the peaks and rolled down. But then the Indians had little use for gold and silver, and the white men did. And the white men built their town where a teepee village might have been, close to the top of Moon Ridge. It was after dark, and the sky was heavily overcast when I pulled up in front of the sheriff's office in Bowtown. Hold it right there. What? I'm looking for the sheriff. That's me. My name is Paladin. <laughs> Riding in at night with black horse and black trail clothes. Well, I'm surprised you didn't get your head shot off. Well, do you... Do you have to hold that gun on me? Come on in. He's a hobgoblin, ain't you heard? Oh, yeah, very smart. This is Jake Kelly, Mr. Paladin. He carries silver bullets in his gun. Oh, really? Claims something grabbed him on top of Moon Ridge one night. Oh, uh, sit down. I'll pour you some coffee. Thanks. Well, where are you from, Mr. Paladin? San Francisco. Oh, that's a long way. Are you the fellow Vito said he was in for? About Emily? Uh, he wants to know what's bothering her. I'm going to try to find out. Well, I mean, I'll tell you what's wrong with Emily. She's hexed, that's what. And 
And you'd know I'm talking true, Dan, if, you, if you'd ever ride up there and see her yourself. Sheriff's got to stay around town. Now, you know that. <laughs> oh, you, you ain't set foot out since the time your posse got scattered. No. That was a little accident. <laughs> a few horses run away and folks build it into something big. There ain't nothing up there. Oh, Miss Paladin, I was as far from it as I am from you. And I, and I seen it. Be a half man, half bear. Yeah, oh, and, and footprints this long, a uh, human at one end, claws at the other. Well, I guess I'll have to see them, too. Oh, you uh, don't believe me. All right, all right. When you get to that Bella place, you ask Emily Bella what carried her off, hmm? Yeah, but you oh, don't ask Dan here, no, yeah. He's sheriff. <laughs> and if he admitted there was something up there, he'd have to go on out after it. <laughs> get out of here, Jake. Now go on. Yeah, we... Crazy old coot. Sheriff, is there anything valuable up there? Minerals? Grazing lands? Any reason for someone to scare people away? No. Formation ain't right for gold or silver. Indians didn't want it. Said it was full of spirits. You know, a short time ago, I was feeling superior to a Chinese friend of mine when he sprinkled dust on my coat. I forgot that he came by his superstitions honestly, that he learned them from the cradle. I, uh... I can't find the same excuse for you, Sheriff. Oh, I ain't superstitious. Why the mistletoe above your door? Oh, yeah. Uh, forgot it from Christmas, I guess. There's an old belief that it wards off evil spirits. All right, Paladin. The Bella Place is north out of town. The last house on the way to Moon Ridge country. What makes the different sound and sound difference that you hear on this station? It's the teamwork between the CBS radio network and its affiliated stations. This teamwork combines the far-flung resources of CBS News with local programming that helps you know your neighbors and neighborhood. Your listening post on your town, your nation, and the world is this station backed by CBS radio. Don't settle for less. The Bella Place was run down and listless with a small light gleaming in the window and the figure of a woman seated on the porch steps, a young woman, dark, plain, no shoes or stockings, long hair, and the most vacantly staring eyes I have ever seen. Good evening. Uh, Miss Emily Bella? Yes. Oh, Mr. Bella? Yes. My name is Paladin. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Paladin. Call me. Oh. Memento, please. Emily. No, you promised you'd tell Papa when you stepped outside. Remember? It's cold here. And when a visitor comes, a big girl says what? Huh? How do you do? Uh. How do you do, Emily? Very good. Now you come in the house with us, huh? Emily, you, you can go to your room. A dozen years ago, there was, in this valley, an epidemic. Took my wife, almost my daughter. I'm sorry. Afterwards, Emily's body grew, but her mind... Uh, she remains a child. Wine? Please. Uh, well, this epidemic, what was it? Oh, uh, we don't know. N no doctors here. There was a young boy who was affected the same way. People treat him like an animal. They call him names. They kick him until he's a mother, but... She took him away. I saw I have to leave, too. Bring Emily here, far from the town. The land here is... It's no good, but we manage. Those dolls are hers? See, she is of an age where toys are pleasant. She's fortunate to have you as a father. I think she's fortunate in other ways. Maybe you don't know what I mean, huh? Perhaps I do. 
There's nothing shocking, ugly about remaining a child. At the best age of all, their world is wonderful, mysterious, half real, half make believe. The world you and I live in, Mr. Bella, is not always as pleasant. Uh, I think you're a wiser man, Mr. Paladin. We drink. Yes. Hello. Salute. Salute. The newspaper said Emily was this way because of shock, some unusual experience. Uh, a spell cast by the monster of a moon rage. Well, since that story is untrue, why do you want to pay me $200, Mr. Bella? Your telegram said 500 You haven't answered my question. Mr. Paladin, there is something on Moon Ridge. It took Emily away from me for a week, and she wishes to go back to, uh, to, to it. I don't want to lose my daughter. Go on. Uh, well, that week I search for her. I find her prints and other prints which I will not describe because... Half I... bear, half man? Well, you have heard that. Huh? Now, she will not tell me, even her father, what kept her there. But she was not harmed. She wishes to return to this, this, this yes. thing? Yes, no. yes. She has tried twice to run away. Well, then I think it's time you let your daughter go back to Moon Ridge, Mr. Bellum. What? The three of us will leave first thing in the morning. The morning was dark and foreboding with the threat of rain in the air. Low clouds hung over the peaks and in the valleys, twisting the trees into gnarled shapes and making the rocks grotesque and sudden to come upon, all very unreal. But the track we came across on the top of Moon Ridge late that afternoon was real enough. Uh, half a man, half a bear, huh? Maybe. Emily. No, oh, Mr. Paladin, be honest with me, please. What make this print? I don't know, Mr. Bella. Uh, no, it's going to be dark later than I... What is that? I'd say it was a bear. Emily! Wait. Emily, come back! Paladin, she going down the canyon. You follow with the horses. I'll try to catch her. The canyon walls were steep and rocky, and it made the climb down them treacherous. By the time I was standing on the floor of the canyon, darkness was coming overhead. I walked toward what I thought might be the head of the canyon, only to find a wall of granite blocking my way. But no Emily. No sign of Bella. No way out. But something... Something watching me. Something old, bent in tattered clothing, witch-like in the quick look I had, and then gone suddenly. You come back here. All right. I know whoever you are. Listen to this carefully. I have a gun. I'm not going to be frightened away. Are you there? Can you hear me? I warn you that I'm going to... Oh. Regained consciousness, I was inside an old mine shaft, a chain on my leg, minus guns. A very real looking bear was chained across from me. There, in the dim light filtering back from the opening of the mine shaft, I saw something moving slowly toward me. Something which seemed only half human, something old and horrible. I waited there, quiet. As the thing came closer. What do you want with me? Leave. While you can. She had dropped a small sledgehammer before she turned and left. It took me the rest of the night to pound out the connecting pin so that I could remove the shackles from my leg. Outside it was morning. Bright and clear. Paladin! Bella! Over here! Oh, I've been 
hiding all night. Have you seen Emily? No. Uh, here, I found your gun and a belt, Father. Uh, oh, thank you very much. I didn't know what to do. I have expected to find your body. Now, let me ask you something, uh, Bella. Has anyone... Has anyone ever been hurt in Moon Ridge country here? Actually physically injured? No, no. no. Only frightened? Yes. I've been frightened, too, but I'm not hurt. Bella. Hmm? I think I know where Emily is. Where? I would say up there. Huh? Beyond that cliff that backs the canyon. The cliff? Possibly a meadow behind there. Oh. The trailer would be worse than in Sicily. That it would frighten a bad rider. And with a little clever discouragement, even a good rider. Come on. <laughs> Now, there's a luxury car that fits regular parking spaces and ordinary garages that's easy to handle in traffic. It's America's compact luxury car, the Ambassador by Rambler. Now, medium-priced car buyers can have the room, comfort, luxury, and performance they expect in a fine car, but without excessive length, width, and bulk. If other medium-priced cars have sized and priced you out of the market, then you owe it to yourself to test our best. American Motors' finest, the luxuriously compact Ambassador. Note the quality construction and careful attention to detail. Enjoy the most favorable power-to-weight ratio on the medium price field with Ambassador's 270-horsepower V8 engine. Try luxury features like individually adjustable front seats that glide back and forth separately. Five minutes at the wheel of an Ambassador will change your ideas about luxury cars. Test our best. The Ambassador V8 by Rambler. Finest car ever priced so close to the lowest. See, drive the luxurious ambassador now at Rambler Dealers. It was a steep trail, but a worthwhile one to follow because at the end of it, there was a meadow brilliant in the high sunlight, and there was a house with a fireplace and smoke coming from a chimney. Not very mysterious at all. Hey, some more are living up here. Very comfortably, I'd say. Hey, look, look there, across the meadow. Emily, my Emily. Wait. No, wait for what? She may be hurt. Does she, she sound be... like she's in trouble, Bella? Look. look there's a boy with her. Ah. Do you recognize him? Maybe. It could be Maria's boy. The one I told you who was afflicted like Emily. Yes, the mother and son. The, the, the ones they ran out of town. Mm. I think it's time that we visit her, huh? There's no uh, need. Marie? Yes, I, I watched you two climb the trail up there. You, you have no respect for witches. But I have a great deal of respect for a clever woman. So... Where else could I take my son? I, I had no money. I had to find a place where people wouldn't ridicule him. Mr. Bella suffered from the same things. Yeah, and once we were old friends, Murray. You should have had faith in me. Well, I, I should have sent her away the first time she wandered up here, but it, it's just so good to see children happy together. Uh, the soil is good up here? Uh, better than below. Hmm? More sun and more water, uh, why talk of it? Why not? Because it, there's always a man somewhere who won't scare off, like this one. I'm sorry. Materialize an apparition on a broomstick in front of him, and he'll ask it to sweep the floor. The monster footprints I made, half mine, half a bear's, they meant nothing. I've run out of tricks. I've moved before. We can do it again. Why move? See, why move, huh? If I lived here, there would be no man-bear track, no cave to put foolish men in and then release him to run frightened, shouting foolish things. I think since I am a man, there would be a gun in my hand and friends would be welcome, others would not. If a man has something to say, he comes right out and says it. <laughs> Yes, well, I, Maria, I think perhaps uh, I, I like your land. And I think I'll be going. 
I'll expect $200 to be placed in my San Francisco account, Mr. Bella. And, uh, I suspect that you got more than you bargained for. <laughs> but you will get what you bargained for, Mr. Paladin, 500 Uh, you have to ride through town, I suppose, and talk to the sheriff? No, no, no. Ignorant and prejudiced people like to be deceived, and they deserve it when they are. Why confuse them with the truth? <laughs> Mr. Paladin, you back safe all in one piece. I'm glad to be back, hey boy. Was it bad? Oh, bad for people who believe in witchcraft. Any messages for me? Oh, yes, sir. Many messages. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, uh, lady send note and say you call on her when you come back. Uh-huh. Uh, another lady send servant over and tell you not to call on her when you get back. <laughs> what else? Is all. Well, in that case... Uh, Tell me the name of the lady over there, hey boy. Oh, yes, sir. It's uh, Miss Romero from Spain. Uh -huh. Very new in this country. Thank you. Miss um, Romero? Oh, why, yes. Uh, my name is Paladin. May I be of service to you? Service, senor? See. Si. It is the custom for a gentleman to offer his services to a lady in this land. Oh? What kind of service is any kind the lady wishes. Dining in fine restaurants, the theater, the opera. Perhaps a carriage ride to historical points of the city. You, your heart names it. I like these customs, senor. But isn't such a relationship fraught with possibilities? Oh, it is, senorita. All kinds of possibilities. Shall we begin with the possibility of dinner this evening? Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed by Norman McDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Gene Roddenberry and adapted for radio by John Dawson. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Virginia Christine, Jess Kirkpatrick, and Gene Bates. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. It's Hop Along Cassidy. With action and suspense, out of the Old West comes the most famous hero of them all, Hop Along Cassidy, starring William Boyd. The ring of the silver spurs heralds the most amazing man ever to ride the prairies of the early West, Hop Along Cassidy. This famous hero thrills his 60 million fans with action and dangerous adventure. In the role of Hopalong Cassidy is the popular star of the motion picture series, William Boyd. And appearing as that laughable old character, California, is Andy Clyde. Now to our story, The Red Death. <laughs> to make 
break even for a friend like Kit Cavanaugh. South from the cool rolling hills of the Bar 20 to the Mesa country, from a land marked with place names like Peepsite and Deadwood, to the Alkali Desert still carrying the stamp of the Spaniards, to the Arena de la Muerte, the Desert of Death, to Alta Mesa and to the Rio Andiendo, the mysterious stream which suddenly vanishes underneath the ground. Well, California? Well, Hoppy? That's it ahead. That's what ahead. The Rio Andiendo. The earth? Uh? The disappearing river. It drops under the ground right there and never shows up again. Concern nasty of her, considering the country to the south. 120 miles of the gold blameless, dry, buzzard infested stretch of desert beside of Hades. <laughs> How do you feel? Sore feet, sore seat, and a powerful thirst. <laughs> Well, we'll be down at Kit's ranch in a day or two. If we ain't buzzard bait by then, uh, which way you reckon we're going to push them cattle of his? Right up through the desert that year. I knew it, I knew it. It's times like this when I know that I should have retired ten years ago. If I'd had the brains of a jackass, <laughs> I... <laughs> now, don't underrate yourself. You're smarter than a jackass I ever knew. Well, there's a nice... Right and it up. won't be much of a trick pushing 500 head up the arena. All right, Hoppy. Just do me one favor. You ride back in the dragon, keep an eye out for straggling doggies. If you see one flat in its face in that alkali dust, just handle it gentle. Of course, it will be me. <laughs> ah, come on. Let's get down to the stream and fill up our canteen. It'll be dark in a few minutes. We can cool off down there and hit the desert after sundown. What's that? Shots over there. Come on. No use, California. He's gone. Did you get a look at his horse? Ah, too dark. Oh, that critter was fast as a streak. Hey, uh, what you picking up there in the trail? Oh, nothing. Where'd the shot come from? Down there by the stream. Come on, let's take a look. Uh, probably someone fought in it a jackrabbit. Yeah? Then why do you ride off like a poppy with that thing? Well, that's a good question. Wait, hold it. Huh? Look. Leaning against that rock over there. Next to the water. You're right. It was a jackrabbit. Come on. Well, I'll be... Poppy. A man. Yeah, but look at him. Red. He's red as a beet. His clothes, his face, everything. Yeah, and he's not only red, he's dead. Two days now since the shots and the fleeing horsemen led Hoppy and California to their amazing discovery at the edge of the Rio Andiendo, the body of a man colored a brilliant red from head to foot. Meanwhile, at the ranch house of Kid Cavanaugh... You know something, Kid? I don't think you're being very smart. Why not? Well, you'll never get anywhere with this outfit. You know that. Well, I'm driving 500 ahead and north in a couple of days, Cantrell. That's nothing to sneeze at. Besides, there's something else. What's that? You haven't told me why you want to buy me out. What do you mean? I just finished telling you. Even if you are short of water, you've got some good grazing here. With my water, I can build this up to a thousand head. Besides, I need the right of way. Now, look, I've only been here a couple of years, but I think I know what's going on around here. A dozen ranches in one miserable town all squeezing out every drop of water there is. This country won't support one more beef critter than is here already. So don't you tell me you could put 500 head more on this place if you bought it. I offered you a fair price, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, too fair. If you'd made it a couple thousand or less, I might have thought you were on the square. Okay, kid. For now. For now? Yeah. Never can tell. Something might happen to change your mind. What? Kid. What is it, Martha? I don't know. Something's wrong. Huh? The cattle out by the corral. They act like they're sick or something. Sick? You see what I mean, Kip? No. No, I don't. Well, just think it over, will you? Uh, by the way, your friend Cassidy's in town. I just saw him heading for the sheriff's office. <laughs> Oh, 
Now take it easy, gents. If you think I'm going to swallow a crazy yarn about a blood-red corpse... But you... that's just what it was, Sheriff. We done buried him there, right by the river. Marked the grave with a heap of rocks. Red? His clothes, his hands, his face, everything. We'd have packed him down here, but we were loaded up already, and with a hundred miles of desert to cross... Yeah, but red. A dead man that's red, ain't he? What's that, Sheriff? Oh, oh, this here's Doc Galloway. I sent for him when you told me about this. Hello, Hoppy. How do you, Doc? Doc, what'd you say if I told you these gents run across a red corpse? Red? Yeah. Where? Rio Andiendo, right where she disappears. Near the water? That's right. It, it can't be. The Red Death. The what? The Red Death. It swept through this section years ago. Sort of a legend now, but it does have a basis of truth. What are you talking about? The springs, the water holes all through here suddenly turned red, became poisonous. Killed humans, horses, everything. Like the plague. Probably a bacteria, some kind of germ that suddenly increased beyond all reason and... Oh, this wasn't anything like that, Doc. This man died from something else entirely. Forty-four Irish. Sudden concentration of lead in the Sacri Iliad. He was shot. We got a glimpse of the killer as he rode off. Well, I'll send a deputy up after the corpus delecti and maybe we'll know more about this red business. Reckon we'll be able to find the grave if you marked it, like you say. Hoppy. Kid, how are you, boy? Well, I'm okay, I hope. California. Kid. Well, you don't know how glad I am you're here. Well, I'll uh, be... No, no, wait a minute, Doc. I want to see you, too. I want you to come out to my ranch, if you can. What's wrong? I don't know. A bunch of my cattle suddenly took sick like they were poisoned or something. Poisoned? Yeah. And a funny thing. That spring of mine. The water's running red. What do you make of it, Doc? I don't know, kids. I... Come on, Doc, tell me. Please, Doc. Well, I'm afraid they are poison. Oh, I knew it, I knew it. Martha, please. I, I can't help it, Kit. It almost seems like something's working against me. Look, dear, it's not going to help oh, I any... I know it. I, I guess I'm just a coward or a quitter or something. It's just that it's happened this way every time. We build a lot of hope. We start out telling ourselves that this time we'll lick Martha. it. Martha. What's the world got against us, kid? Martha, you don't know how you're making me feel. It's not your fault, Doc. I sold you this ranch. You couldn't know about that. I know that, but... Look, let me do this, will you? What? I'm all alone. I have no family. I've got plenty to get by on. What if... What if we just forget there ever was a deal? You mean you... Doc. Let me test the water first. We'll make sure before we go any further. If it's what I think it is, I'm willing to call it off. You know the old saying, satisfaction guaranteed or your money back? Well, I don't know what to say, Doc. Well, then don't say it. I'll say this much. I don't do business that way. If I took on a load of poison water with this ranch... I'm stuck with it. Kid. I'm sorry, Martha. Here comes Cantrell. Yeah. Brace yourselves, everyone. What's the verdict, Doc? Red plate? If it is, you'll know soon enough, Cantrell. Yeah? When it hit this country last time, it took every ranch in the district. Funny thing, Doc. I'm not worried at all. And Kit. Yeah? The offer's still good if you want to sell out. Only the price has changed. Goes down a thousand dollars a day until you make up your mind. Maybe you'd better get out of here, Cantrell. Sure, Doc. But just remember that, kid. Thousand dollars a day. Er, uh, Hoppy. Yeah. Wouldn't it hurt too much for you to wise me up as to the goings on? Uh, where are we headed? Ah, there it is. Sure is. What? The Navajo Saloon. Finest drink emporium in Altamesa. You going in uh, on another Sesperly binge? <laughs> I want to talk to the proprietor. He's an old friend of mine. <laughs> for a teetotaler, you know more bartenders than any man living. Sometimes I got my doubt. Hmm. His name is Eustace. Eustace Culpepper. And if he ran for president, I'd vote for him. Well, here we are. After you, California. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy. (laughs) (laughs) 
Cassidy. Eustace. Bill. Oh, name's Hopalong. He knew me when my name was Bill California. Uh, California Carlson. Meet Eustace Culpepper. Howdy. Hey, I'll be with you in a shake, Bill. Sure, go ahead. Uh, now, Fred, what, what... Sit down, California. Oh, uh, excuse me, stranger. Not at all. Hoppy, what's this got to do with them pies and steers? Not here. Um, uh, you new in town, stranger? Just coming through. My name's Cassidy. This is California Carlson. I'm Mike Reardon. Howdy. Uh, just passing through, you say? That's right. You, uh, you in the cattle business, Reardon? Nope. I see. Uh, quiet in here, ain't it? I like it quiet. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> now, Bill, or hop along it is now, huh? <laughs> it was Bill when I knew him up north. Now, nah, Eustace. Oh, them were the days, eh, hop along? Let me tell you, he was a tiger at a church social. <laughs> <laughs> Eustace ran the drugstore up north when I was a kid. Well, is that so? <laughs> Look here, sis. Hey, maybe you and me could... Oh, just... no, you don't, California. Uh, tell me, Eustace. What did you do with your equipment when you gave up the drugstore and took the bartending? Oh, well, still got her. Stashed away in the barn out back. You remember anything about the drug business? Sure do. No, I went into patent medicine for a while. Put out the slickest concoction you ever laid a tonsil on. Mm. Tasted wonderful. Wouldn't cure nothing, but I sold gallons of it. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're just the fellow I'm looking for. Uh, California. You sit here with Mr. Reardon while Eustace and I take a trip out to the barn. Ah. Well, we'll just let her set till she clears up. You sure you're right? Why not? Well, you haven't run a test like this for 30 years. The equipment's rusty, but I ain't. I hope not. This is pretty important. Where'd you get this? Down to Kit Cavanaugh's spring. His stock turned up sick this morning. What makes you think it was... Uh... I don't think anything yet. That's why I got you to drag out this equipment. Yeah. <laughs> Funny, ain't it? That pink color. Yeah. How's it look now? Well, I might be able to... Yeah. Hold the lantern up so I can look through it. There you are. Yeah. Hmm. What about it? You're right about that water bill. What's in it? Arsenic. Hmm. That answer your question? Uh, that answers the little one. What's the big one? What's a dead man, colored red from top to toe, sitting by a stream 120 miles from here, got to do with a batch of sick cows on Kit Cavanaugh's ranch? Well, now that's... Uh... That's quite a question. Indeed it is, Eustace. Indeed it is. It's late in the evening, and Hoppy in California returned from Alta Mesa to Kit Cavanaugh's ranch at the edge of the desert. Hoppy. Yeah, kid. Do me a favor, will you? Stop pacing the floor. Second the motion. I'm getting nervous. Ah, I'm sorry. This thing is beginning to get me. It's simple enough. I bought myself a spring full of poison water. It's not that simple. Why not? This isn't the first arsenic well around here. I bet it's the first one turned arsenic overnight. Now, well, there's more to it than that. Cantrell's still willing to buy. You sell to him and I'll break your neck. You're a little late. Huh? You mean you... No, no, I didn't sign anything, not yet. But every day I wait cost me a thousand dollars. What did you tell him? Said I'd be willing to talk business in the morning. Now, wait a minute. You listen to me, kid. I'm through listening to anyone. Whose ranch is it, yours? Who's gone broke if the cattle die? You? Kid. Oh, I... Sorry, Hoppy. I guess... Guess him falling to pieces, what with Martha and all to think about. Sure, I know. But there's something more to it. Something none of us know about. Look, the ranch goes sour. Spring runs poison. That look at Cantrell, willing to buy. And at a pretty good price, too. 
And Doc ready to give you back your money and take title for the spread. Does that make sense? No. I can't help feeling all of us has got something to do with that dead man we found up north. Oh, but doggone, Hoppy. How can that happen? I don't know. Call it a hunch if you want. Everybody's getting jumpy around here. Now, take that deadhead feller we sat with back at Eustace Culpepper Saloon. What was that, California? Uh, that feller we sat with. What did you call him? Deadhead. Why deadhead? Oh, uh, well, that's about the only thing he'd tell me. He don't know his business or nothing, but... When I asked him how he got to Altamacia, he said something about he deadheaded in on the stage. You're sure he said that? Yeah, but what the... Uh, That's what the... it. I knew there was a connection between that man at Disappearing River and this thing here. What do you think? I'm going down to the hotel. He's probably staying there. I want to talk to that bird right now. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Riordan just checked out, and I don't know where he went. Could he leave town? I run the hotel here, not the transportation business. Now, I don't mind telling you I'm busy. Ah, yeah, sure. Henry? Yeah, Eustace? You ever get up to heaven that way, Henry? Uh, what is it, Eustace? Oh, uh, Henry's praying a mite from the gospel. He knows he hustled Mr. Reardon out the back door of this flea bag not a half hour ago. Eustace, show him. Henry, I've seen it with my own eyes. He rode off toward Lazy Sea Ranch with Steve Cantrell. Thanks, Eustace. Eustace, got yes, Pepper, I want to... <laughs> now, you never busted your work to Cantrell, Henry. I mean, for that five dollars he slipped you to shut up. Wait. After all, twas me that told Cassidy. <laughs> I don't like this, Cantrell. I'm not used to being shanghai No bad feelings, Redden. Just want a little private talk, that's all. I know why you're here, and I think I can help you. Well, that is, if you play along with me. Go on, Cantrell. I can deliver what you want tomorrow morning. At a price, of course. There's only one thing. What's that? When are you planning to make this thing public? Tomorrow. I'm going to call a meeting of the cattlemen. Suppose you were to hold off till I get this little thing of mine straightened out. Can't do that. I'm afraid you'll have to. What kind of a remark is that, Cantrell? Call it a threat if you want to. You're riding up to my ranch tonight and you're going to stay there until the... Wait a minute. Go on, Cantrell. I'm interested too. Cassidy. Go ahead. Reach for your gun. Okay. Oh. Better trot home to the lazy sea and choke your hand. We'll be seeing you at the cattleman's meeting tomorrow, Cantrell. Maybe sooner than that, Cassidy. The man talks tough. Ah, you'll get over it. Now, what about you? All right, what about me? Don't you think you'd better tell me why you're here? Sure. At the meeting tomorrow night. <laughs> ah, you already gave yourself away, Reardon. When you told my partner you deadheaded into Alta Mesa on the stagecoach. Only a railroad man would say that. All right, so I'm a railroad man. And the only reason I can see for a railroad man to be in Alta Mesa right now is to lay out the location for a railroad across the arena at De La Muerte. To maybe link up with the line on the West End. You're a pretty good guesser. I try to be. So when you start thinking railroad, you automatically start looking around for something Alta Mesa hasn't got. In quantity, at least. Water. That's right. Okay, Cassidy, you win. It is a railroad and it is water. We sent a man here weeks ago to look the place over. Last we heard from him, he said he'd worked out a brilliant idea to find it for us. Then what? Nothing. He dropped out of sight. I think I know where you'll find him. Yeah? In the back room of the sheriff's office. Stretched out on a table. Covered from head to foot with red dye and pretty dead. You mean... Yeah. Carolina, California and I found him two nights ago, 120 miles north of here, at the edge of the Rio and Danville. You know, Ridden, that's something else we ought to take up at the cattlemen's meeting. <laughs> Hiya, Doc. Good to see you. All right. May I have your attention, please? You've already been told that the railroad I represent is planning a line across the Arena del Muerte to link up with the other side. I don't need to go into what that'll mean to this section. <laughs> Here at the edge of the desert, a town will spring up that'll grow into one of the big cattle shipping centers of the southwest. 
But all of our thinking up to now has run up against a stone wall. The one thing that keeps this section down, the thing that limits the number of cattle you can raise, the thing that keeps this town down to a crossroads, is water. That's right. We just the box. Every drop of water available here now is being used. We'll need a hundred times as much if we're to think about running the railroad through here or building the town to go with it. How are you going to do with the hatch gate water where there ain't now? Now, let me draw a diagram on the blackboard here. Here's a triangle. At the point of it, at the top, is the spot where the Rio Andiendo disappears into the earth, 120 miles north of here. Well, what good's that to an us? If we could tap that river under the ground. We'd have all the water we need and more besides. Oh, oh, God. What do you think of that? Now, along the bottom line of the triangle is the Alta Mesa country right here with its dozen or so ranches, all existing on the seats that come to the surface. The engineer we sent here a few weeks ago figured one of those seats might connect with the river itself under the desert. If we could find which one, it would be simple to develop it to drill down and tap the main stream. But which one of the seats? There's a whopping out of him. So our engineer figured out a simple plan. He rode north to the point where the river disappears and poured red dye into it for three days. Sure enough, day before yesterday, the spring at one of the ranches here ran red. The Kit Cavanaugh Ranch out at the edge of the mesa. Kit. But, honey, our, our ranch. Oh, Kit. Mr. Cavanaugh now holds the development of this section in his hands. I hope we'll be able to work with him in following it through. Just a minute, please. Just a minute. There's one thing more. Mr. Reardon left it to me to mention that the railroad engineer isn't with us tonight to see how his plan succeeded. Because someone, someone in this room, who had an eye on the money that water would bring here, Murdered the engineer and left his body up there by the Rio Andiendo. Well, say, right you? I think we can find out who that is. Well, I can't. His horse dropped a shoe on the trail up there right after the killing. He rode him over 120 miles of desert trail on a bare hoof. The left hind one. Everyone will keep his seat while my partner checks the horses at the tie rack outside. If the horse isn't there... We'll all stay right here while the ranchers are searched till we find him. <coughs> Let me out of here, Dave. Hey, he's got a gun. Put down that gun, you. Doc. Doc Galloway. Gosh, Hoppy, I don't know how to thank you for all your... <laughs> oh, forget it, kid. Let's think about those cattle we're going to start north tomorrow. Bro. Oh, that's not... <laughs> Doggone it, Hoppy. You sure pulled the rabbit out of the hat with that horseshoe. I was wondering what you picked up back there at the Rio. Yeah? You know, seeing old Eustace Culpepper reminded me of something I learned when I was a kid and my mother made me go to Sunday school. Something in the Bible that says, The guilty flee when no man pursueth. Oh, okay. come? Well, you saw that horseshoe, didn't you, California? No. Why? <laughs> that thing I picked up on the trail had been there since 49. And besides, it never belonged to a horse anyway. It belonged to a mule. <laughs> <laughs> Hoppy in California are hitting the trail homeward again, and after this little adventure, the Bar 20 is going to be a welcome sight. Hope you enjoyed this friendly visit, and that you'll remember to tune in next time these two fighting cowboys get involved in another thrilling escapade. Hop Along Cassidy, starring William Boyd, is transcribed and produced in the West by Walter White, Jr. The Red Death was written by Harold Swanton. All stories are based upon the characters created by Clarence E. Mulford. This is a Commodore production.
Fort Laramie. Fort Laramie, starring Raymond Burr as Captain Lee Quince. Specially transcribed tales of the dark and tragic ground of the wild frontier. The saga of fighting men who rode the rim of empire. And the dramatic story of Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry. Up there, you all are a chunk of spam crow, bay knock. Yeah, yeah, pull up, pull, pull. Yeah, cool. Now stand there easy before I take a notion to stand you with a club. <laughs> oh, my, my. You're just a natural born horseman, ain't you, Yates? <laughs> yeah, horses. All right, do squaw chores in the barracks and turn off this blast of stable duty. Hold still there. <laughs> How'd you ever happen to join up in the cavalry, anyhow? Of course, you ride every place. That's what they told me. Sure you ride. Time man gets through babying up his horse, he's too old, fired, tired to walk. <laughs> well, maybe you just ain't doing it right. <laughs> Curring him the way the sergeant said, now, ain't I? Curry him right down the ground and then clean up their hooves. All right, stand still there, you miserable. Clean up their hooves. Ain't nobody taking care of my feet in this army. Why, there's no call for it, Yates. You ride every place. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, I ride, and then I ride back. And I got calluses to prove it. You know, if I was... Hey. Look over there, Joby. Joby Turler? Yeah. Oh, he's just talking to his horse again. Oh, he's all the time doing that. He must be about half horse himself. Oh, Joby's all right. Hey, Joby, what are you telling her? The one about the engine princess and the corporal? I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Yates. I guess I wasn't listening. Well, then, how about loaning me a chart of tobacco? Well, I, I can't. I'm, I'm clean out. You sure got out mighty fast. I seen you with a plug of red mule in your hand. Not oh, more... that ain't mine. Oh, uh... What I mean is, it ain't for me. And who is it for? Well, it's it's for the, the mayor. It, it's it's Bells. Why? She's used to it, Yates. She always gets a chaw after her morning feed. And I only just got enough to last her until payday. A horse. Getting her daily chaw pretty as it pleases me going without. Well, you know, it's good for her, Yates. It keeps her cleaned out real good. Besides, I'm going without, too. I got none for myself. Just what kind of man are you, Joby? Doing more for a horse than you'll do for the human race. I'm sorry, Yeats. Uh, it's no wonder you ain't got a friend in the company. I don't need no friends. Only time I got them is when they want some tobacco. Oh, uh, go on. Keep your tobacco. Save it for that jughead of yours. Lay off of me, Yeats. Hey, what you gonna do when they shoot her, Joby? What? First time old Doc gets a good look at her, that's what's going to happen. You've been long overdue for a remount, Joe. Ain't no vet going to take Bell. Me and her staying together. He already got his eye on her. She was trotting lame yesterday. I'm afraid I seen her myself. Now shut up, Yates. You hear? You shut your mouth. I'll kill anybody that tries to take her. Hooey. Ain't you a fright now? <laughs> Engines hear you talking that way, they all going to find Mr. Kennedy. Come on, Yates, let's go water the mounts. Hey, what if Captain Quince tells you to get rid of her, Joby? You going to kill him, too? He's not going to tell me. Now, old Doc, he only makes a report. It's a captain puts out the list. Hey, Joby, what you going to do if Captain Quince puts you on a remount order? Yates, we... Yates, there ain't nobody gonna take Bell away. Mm. 
Well, in a way, it's a routine patrol, and in a way, it's not. Yeah. Hand me that map there behind you, Sergeant. Yes, sir. This one, Captain? Yeah. Yeah, roll it out there on the table. All right. That's good. Let's see now. Sure a lot of empty spaces on it. One of them is where we're going. Yeah, right in here. Broken Plains country. We'll move northwest out of Laramie as far as the Great Bow Bend, then due west till we pick up the east fork of the Platte, wherever that is. Nobody's got around to mapping it yet. We taking a surveyor, Captain? No, not this time. All right, we'll uh, follow the Platte south to about here, then swing back in. The route will depend on what we find. Well, at least we won't find trouble. Not a tribe within miles of there. No. Not now. I don't follow you, Captain. The well, Dove clan is getting restless. They could be fixing to break treaty. If they do, Fort Fetterman can't hold them. They'll come right through the Broken Plains to join up with Limp and Fox and his Cheyenne and the Black Hills. We might be campaigning in that country before the summer's over, Gorse. Yes, sir. And well, this is reconnaissance. Water holes, nature of the terrain, so on. I'm uh, taking Lieutenant Seibert, you, Corporal Dittman, and whatever troopers you've picked. Oh, I got the list right here, Captain. Oh, good. We'll uh, move out at dawn. I'm figuring about six days... You can't do it, sir. You you just can't do it. You come to attention, but, soldier. But, I'd be... Just what are you doing in the orderly room, soldier? Private Joby Turler, I want to talk to the captain. How long you been in the Army, Turley? Well, Sergeant, it's my third hitch. Hadn't anybody ever told you how to request an audience with the commanding officer? Permission of the first, Sergeant. All right, then why did you come busting in here this way? Well, there wasn't time, Sergeant. I got to talk to the captain right away. I just got to... Uh, Sergeant! Yes, sir. Sergeant, is Private Turler requesting an audience? It sort of seems that way, sir. And it's granted... At ease, soldier. Yes, sir. Hmm, Turler. Second platoon, around ten years service, all in cavalry. That's right, sir. I've always wondered about that first name of yours, Joby. Well, that, that's scriptural, Captain. It's, it's really Job. Oh, I see. Well, uh... What was it you had to see me about, Turler? Yes, sir. The remount order, sir. The list just been posted. I'm on it, Captain. That's so? Well, you just can't do it. Me and her, we've been together since I first come with the second. And Belle, she ain't just another mount. She's a lot more than that. Well, she is to me. I now, mean, wait a she's... minute. Am I to take it your horse has just been cashiered? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Belle is Shannon. She's on the order, sir. Have you got that vet's report handy, Sergeant? Here you are, sir. Hmm. Bell O'Shannon, Chestnut Mare, Stall 84, Breeder, Port Riley, Remount Service, fold in. You know how old that horse is, Turler? Well, sh she ain't old at all, sir. She's 11. Well, but so, some horses is different from others, Captain. You, you ought to see her on the march. She's friskier than a young colt. The report says she was lame on parade this week. Oh, that that wasn't nothing but a stone bruise, Captain Quince. Yes, sir, a little rock worked up in the frog. I took it right out. She's as good as ever, sir. There ain't nothing wrong with her legs. No, sir, not at all, sir. Well, she's 11 years old. Oh, but, Captain, you... Captain, you, you, can't, you can't send her away. All right, Tiller. Understand I'm not promising anything, but I'll... Take her off the order for the present. And I'll consider the matter further. Thank you, Captain. That's all, Tyler. Oh, yes, sir. Sir? Thank you. I had him on that list to go with us, Captain. No, not fine. But if he's gonna How does he get along with the other men, Sergeant? Keeps to himself mostly. He does his job all right. I see. Uh, may I say something, Captain? Go ahead. 
I know how you feel, sir, but you got to do it. That horse is 11 years old and she's showing lame. What's there to consider? Hmm. Nothing much. Just how to go about cutting out a man's heart without hurting him too bad. been in Africa. Sure, I've been in Africa. In every place there is to be. What do you want to know about it? How hot you get over there? Oh, 120 maybe. More in some parts. Well, then I'm right. It's just what I figured. What's what you figured? We done gone and taken the wrong turn back there somewhere. We are in Africa, Krell. <laughs> Last night in camp, you was belly aching about the cold. And there you are. Freezes you to death at night, burns you up in the daytime. Boy, I can't puzzle me out what the government wants with a country like this. Well, ain't you heard the news, Yates? What news? The devil's getting overcrowded. He's aiming to put in an annex out here. That's so. Well, he can... Well, here comes Captain. Captain? Yeah? What is it? Well, sir, uh, me and Krell was just saying, Captain, uh, this is sure a mighty poor country to fight over. <laughs> oh, you think so? Yeah. And it ain't the friendliest place we've been, sir. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that, soldier. For the next few years, you got a home in the Army. Yes, sir. Captain Quince. Yeah, what is it, Mr. Seibert? We got some trouble at the rear of the column, sir. Oh, Patrol! Halt! Come on, guys. Yes, sir. What kind of trouble, Mr. Seibert? Private Turtle's mount starting to show lame, Captain. I see. It don't amount to nothing, sir. It may be at their stone bruise again. Well, yeah, let's uh, take a look. Oh, easy, girl, easy. She was favoring that left foreleg, Captain. Yeah, I see. Hmm. It's hot, fevered. And it's starting to fill. It's a full tendon, Captain. There's no question about it. Well, Captain, sir, it ain't so bad I can wrap that. No, I head. agree with Sergeant Gorse. It's a tendon, no doubt of it. Uh, Mr. Seibert... Yes, sir. How do we stand? Well, uh, steady on the pace, sir. We're an hour and a half from tonight's bivouac, an hour and a half from sundown. Yes, sir. Corporal! Yes, sir. Corporal, you were out in the point earlier. What's around us here? Mostly open, a little rolling, a few cutbacks. General Falls to the south, the water course there to the west. Yeah, how far? Oh, about 20 minutes, sir. 30, maybe, with a, with a lame horse. Water and forage? Yes, sir, plenty. No steady flow, but a lot of pools. There's a high bank on the far side and a heavy sweet grass all along the stream bed. Yeah, thank you, Corporal. Uh, that's all. Yes, sir. Mr. Seibert, yes, we'll bear west and bivouac at the watercourse. Right, sir. All right, Sergeant. Move him at a walk. Yes, sir. Now, you see, I can plaster that leg with mud tonight, Captain. She'll be all right in the morning. Well, we'll see. I'm sorry, sir. So am I, soldier. At the walk! Ho! Mind if I join you, Captain? Oh. Sit down, Mr. Sabitz. <clears throat> That's a fine night, isn't it, sir? Yeah. About as perfect as they come. 
cool, peaceful, clear as a bell. <laughs> it's funny when you think about it. What is it? Well, the way things work out. This country we're in, five days now we haven't seen another soul. And chances are, the next time we come through, we'll have to fight our way. Maybe not. Sue may stand by their treaty. I hope so. <laughs> so do I, Mr. Savage. For all our sakes. I know what you mean, sir. I didn't when I first came out from the point. We all start green, Mr. Savage. I suppose. Beg pardon, Captain. Yes, yeah, Sergeant? Sir, what are we going to do about that horse at Turler's? Why, you know what we're going to do, Gorse. When, sir? I, uh... I figured first thing in the morning, we'll shift the loads and give him one of the pack horses. Does he know you're aiming to destroy her? Well, he ought to. He's had ten years in the cavalry. Well, I don't think he does, sir. Oh? Uh -huh. He's had her down there at the end of the pool ever since we unsaddled. Putting mud on her leg, walking her, standing her in the water. He, he keeps talking to her, Captain. What is it you're trying to tell me, Gorse? In the morning, sir, before we shoot that horse, we better take Joby's rifle and sidearm. All right, Gorse. Don't talk to him. I guess I've been putting it off all evening. And I... uh, Indians. They're up there along the edge of the bluff. Sergeant, form the men. Right, sir. Deploy a skirmishers. Find cover and dig in. Fire at will. Four skirmishers. Stand by for the moment, Cybert. Yes, sir. Corporal. Yes, sir. Get those horses under cover. Up against the bank under that overhang. Right, sir. Check the men's positions, Mr. Cybert. Have them lay their fire along the edge of that bluff. It's the only target they'll have. Yes, sir. And put two men at the north end of the pool. It's brushy. They could slip in on us. Right, sir. You think they're so? What's the difference? They're shooting at us. Carry on, Mr. Cybert. Yates? Uh, another half hour, it will be. That's when they're going to hit us, too. Right after dawn. That's how they always do. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, waiting up there right now, all along the edge of that bank, just waiting for dawn. And we're going to get it good. <laughs> what do you figure the captain's going to do, Yates? I don't know. What do you think he can do? They got us pinned down good and they know it. And so does he. And now they just wait. Oh. Ooh -wee. I seen that flash, Krell. You know, I could get me one right there. If the captain let us fire back. Yeah. Says we gotta save ammunition. What for? He ain't gonna give us time to use it up. Them's the orders. Well, you know I had me a belly full of orders in this army. Huh. An hour from now, you might have a belly full of bullets. You know where I'm gonna put my first shot when they hit us? Right in the back of Joby Turler's head. Yeah. Always knew you was brave. Well, it's him got us in this fix. Him and that crowbait horse ahead. Well, it'll be the captain that gets us out, if anybody does. I wonder what him and the sergeant's doing over there. Well, I know what I'd be doing. If I had anything to do it with, I'd be getting myself blind drunk. <laughs> Let's see his face, Gorse. Yes, sir. Black circle painted there on his forehead. 
You're on the war path, all right. Yep. Yellow bars across the cheeks, white dot on the chin, red line over the bridge of the nose. They're Dove Clan. At least we know who we're up against. Well, it's always nice to know, sir. Yep. Now let's get back to cover. It's almost light enough they can see us. Yes, sir. Captain, sir? Yeah? What is it, Taylor? Captain, I, I, I heard the men talking. They're saying... They're saying I'm to blame for all this. Who's your commanding officer, Turner? Huh? Well, you you are, sir. Who do you get your orders from? From you, Captain. Who ordered you to camp here last night? Well, you did. Then who's to blame? Well, yes, but... uh, Forget it, Turner. We've got a fight coming up. Yes, sir. Been praying in my mind all night. Yeah, I know. Uh, Come on, Gorse. All right, all right, hold it here. I figured about 20 of them, no more than 25. They wouldn't even try to stand again as captain if we was up there on the flat. Yeah, but we're not. We've no way of getting there. They got us pinned down tight. A mounted charge? Well, we'd have to mount in the open. Maybe three or four of us would get in the saddle. The way we stand, it's only a matter of time, sir. Well, not much time at that. As long as they hold the top of that bank, they... They got another one of our horses. Yeah, now, if that was... Gee, that was Bell! Yeah, sir. stay down, Teller! That's Bell or Shannon! That's hey, get back to cover! Crazy fool. Let him go, sir. We need every man we've got. Stay here, Sergeant. I'm going after him. Watch yourself, sir. The shotters. The shotters have got no call to do that. Oh, she's as much army as we are. No reason for them shooting a horse. Here, Joby. You can you can borrow my pistol. The pistol, sir? What for? Well, I didn't figure you'd want to use your own. I can't. I can't, sir. She's in pain, Joby. No. Some things a man's got no choice about in this world. Now, if you don't, then... And I'll have to. All right, Captain. Here you are. Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. Now, Bell. Bell. Joby? Yeah, I know, sir. Oh. They didn't have no call to do that. I'll... I'll take my pistol now, They didn't gain nothing by that. They didn't gain nothing at all. Joey. Dirty killer. Here, come back here. Joey, come back here. Joey! You all right, Captain? Ah, Joey's out of his mind. Well, he's going straight up the slope. You can't keep missing him, sir. Well, they're not. He's been hit twice already. Captain, they're up in the open all along the skyline. He's got them worried. Yeah, have the men give him some cover, Sergeant. Right, sir. As skirmishers, fire! Mr. Sivert, have them lay their fire along the ridge. They got targets on the skyline now. Lay your fire In the name of heaven, what's keeping him on his feet, sir? A heart, Sergeant. Crazy or not, that's a man up there. Look, Captain, they're going to break. They're leaving the ridge. Yeah, you're right. Come on, Gorse. Now he's still on his feet, and he's right at the ridge. What is it, sir? What's happening? That stunt was just insane enough to panic them, Mr. Seibertz. They must think it's a trick. They're breaking, pulling back from the ridge. We got a chance now. We're going up. I 
I'll never understand it, sir. Understand what, Mr. Simons? How he did it. Thirteen bullet wounds, and he still got all the way to the top. Well, I guess something takes hold of a man at times like that. But of all the, the, the least likely people, mild, meek little Joby Turler. Meek or not, everybody's got at least one thing he'll live for. Or die for. But you, you'll have to admit, sir, it's usually something more than just a horse. How would you feel, Mr. Seibertz, if the one and only friend you'd ever had in this world was lying helpless at your feet? The only thing that you could do for him was to put a bullet in his brain. Fort Laramie is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars Raymond Burr as Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry, with Vic Perrin as Sergeant Gorse. The script was specially written for Fort Laramie by Les Crutchfield, with sound patterns by Bill James and Ray Kemper. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, Jack Crucian, Tim Graham, and Barney Phillips. Company tension. Dismiss. Next week, another transcribed story of the Northwest Frontier and the troopers who fought under Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry. You're not branded as a careless driver only because you zoom at 60 along a crowded highway or because you fail to heat a stoplight or stop sign. You're a bad driver, a careless driver, when your car is standing stock still at the curb, if it's parked in a no-parking zone, if it's too close to a fire hydrant, or if it's double parked. Are you a reckless driver even when your car is standing still? Remember, it's kid stuff to try to get away with something. 